unsigned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary 
Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. Commencement of our sitting, let us be still. Please take your seats. Members, before we begin, I wish to uh, advise members that I have received the correspondence from the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, advising that for procedural reasons, he will not be in a position to move the motion on the single-use carrier bag charge amendments regulations, which is scheduled for tomorrow. Therefore, there will be no debate on that item of business. I also remind members that in light of the health protection regulation that came into force on the 27th of December, the Business Committee has agreed that the seating arrangement in the Chamber will reflect a social distance of two metres for all items of business until further notice. Ms Michelle O'Neill has been given leave to make a statement on Aisling Murphy, which fulfils the criteria set out in Standing Order 24. If other members wish to be called, they should do so by rising in their places and continuing to do so. All members called shall have up to three minutes to speak on the subject. I would remind members that interventions and so on are not permitted, and there will be no points of order taken either on this matter until the item of business has finished. And I call Michelle O'Neill. Last Monday, I joined executive colleagues in asking people for their views on a new strategy to end violence against women and girls. And by Wednesday, another woman on this island had been brutally murdered. Ashley Murphy was 23. She was attacked and killed whilst out for a run. 
There are simply no words to convey the cruelty and the injustice of what happened to Ashling, and our hearts go out to her family and to all who loved her. Regretfully, the truth is, violence against women and girls, the threat of violence against women and girls, the fear of violence against women and girls is all too common. Domestic, sexual and gender-based violence is an epidemic. If we are to break the cycle of male violence against women, we need to develop an enforceable zero-tolerance approach towards misogyny and sexism. That's to all end all violence against all women in all of its forms. Whilst also exposing and challenging the everyday sexism that women and girls experience, whether that be online, on the street or in the workplace. Since Ashling's murder, countless women and girls across this island, myself included, will have been reflecting on our own safety as we go about our daily lives. And the reason that we do that is because, sadly, we know that Ashling's murder is not an isolated incident. Today, I'm thinking of the family of Kiva Morgan, a mother of four young children, murdered in her home in North Belfast just before Christmas. She died comforted by her children. Just let that sink in. This is heartbreaking beyond words. And these women are not statistics. These women are our mothers, they're our daughters, their sisters, their aunts. How often do we hear that we are lucky we weren't attacked because we dared to walk a particular route, we dared to be out at a certain time, we dared to wear a certain thing? Well, we aren't lucky. We're angry. Because no woman or no girl should ever have to face such disgusting attitudes or the threat of abuse that destroys lives. The anger across this island now must be turned into determined action. Together, we must stop violence against women and girls. Together, we must say enough is enough. Together, we also today remember many of the women with Ashling who were killed on this island in, throughout the pandemic years. Kiva Morgan, Emma Jane McParland, Katrina Rainey, Natasha Melendez, Patricia Werbeck, Katie Simpson, Susan Bird, Karen McLean, Stacey Nail, Ludilma Palova, Katie Branken, Elizabeth Dobbin, Jean Eagers, Sema Banu, Nessa Murray, Anne Butler, Mary O'Keefe, Sharon Bennett, Euron Sepp Seg Sarin Doors, Jenny Poole, Eileen O'Sullivan, Fabio Camara de Campos, Zenit Bashabi Shi. We remember them all. Thank you, Igor Magna called Paul Gibbon. Thank you. Um, I think all of us right across the community have came together in the past number of days to show our revulsion um, for what has happened uh, to Ashleen Murray and to stand in support uh, of Ashleen and her family. And we think especially of her parents, Raymond and Kathleen at this time. And we're struck by those last words that Ashleen said to her mom, "Mom, I love you, before she left. And I think uh, for all of us, we're connecting our own stories and our own families to this tragedy. As a father of three daughters, I know that last night when I was in Lisburn and we held a vigil, I was thinking about them. I was thinking about the type of society that they're growing up in. And when they get to that age, they should feel safe. They should be respected. They should not be objectified. They should not have to suffer uh, the kind of uh, poor, bad behavior that often is directed at women and girls, and we all must take that personal responsibility to change our society and to call out for uh, the behaviour being what it is uh, whenever we witness it. And when you're with, if it's a group of fellas and they're wolf whistling, we need to call that out. Men need to step up and challenge this type of behaviour for what it is, and we need to get to the root causes of the type of issues that go to the heart of the way in which people think. That's why we're taking forward the Deputy First Minister and I as a priority, the strategy around ending violence against women and girls. We have to shape government policies to put an end to this, because too many people have suffered, too many people have lost their lives. And unless we collectively make that change uh, and give that targeted effort, um, we're going to come back to this, and we shouldn't. So I'm committed to doing all that I can to playing my part in addressing these issues and challenging the type of behaviour that needs to change. 
Ashleen gives so much um, for someone who has been killed at 23. She'd already given so much to our community and our society and had so much more to give. And so we show our support. We grieve with their families. And whether it's in Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, we've all came together as one community and we share in that grief and we collectively show our support. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I call Nicola Mullen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And after the, the brutal murder of Kiba Morgan in North Belfast, the brutal murder of all of the women whose names we've just heard, we are gathered here today because another young woman, Aisling Murphy, has been murdered. And in this modern world, the fact that women are not safe is terrifying. We must, as political leaders here across these islands, band together to end this violence. As a mother, my heart is breaking for Ashley Murphy's family. She had her whole life ahead of her, a new graduate with so many talents, a great love of music, and so much to offer her friends, family, and community. And Aisling was robbed of that opportunity. And our society has been robbed of the positive contribution she no doubt would have continued to make. What makes this murder so frightening is the casual violence in broad daylight in an area busy with people out for exercise. This could have been any woman, so it represents an attack on every woman. If a young girl can't go for a jog in the middle of the day in an area surrounded by people, then where can women feel safe? Too many policymakers just don't understand how oppressive this environment is for so many people. They don't understand what it's like to be afraid walking home in the evening or to be worrying about who is around you when you're alone in a public place. And that's not the kind of society that I want for my children. And we must move away from expecting women to carry rape alarms, to take self-defense classes, putting the burden and the responsibility for us being safe on us. We need to take the plague of violence against women seriously and eradicate it. And it is scandalous that at this moment in time, the only female-only homeless hostel here in Belfast is under the threat of closure. Across these islands, we need to get serious about the environment that has been created for women and the kind of society that we have created. I don't want my daughters or my son growing up in this world. Equally, I don't want to stand here again and again mourning the murder of another woman. We have to act now to do all that we can to educate men, to protect our daughters and sisters, and we have to do it now. Thank you. And I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can I also take the opportunity to speak on the safety of women in our society today. Firstly, on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party, I too wish to express condolences with the parents and family of Aisling Murphy, a young school teacher, and express the revulsion of my party at the murder of Aisling and indeed any of the other murders that have taken place over the past number of years of women. Who in the course of taking exercise was murdered on the banks of a, banks of a canal at Tullamore? This dreadful deed has left both the Republic and Northern Ireland stunned, and many women now fear the consequences of walking to and from work, taking a leisurely stroll, particularly in areas of limited lighting, or running for exercise in the evening. No woman or girl should have to feel afraid because they exercise or walk to work by foot alone. Women are entitled to feel safe. Indeed, as a mother of a daughter who often walks to work alone, I too have concerns. Given the increase that there's been in violent attacks on women over the past two years, whether from domestic violence, coercive activity, or even leering or catcalling to women in the street, enough is enough. All this gender-based form of attacks, whether verbal or physical, must become an unacceptable behaviour and a zero-tolerance approach must be adopted. Time is now of the essence. 
serious consideration must be given to an educational framework introduced for our young people in schools from 4 to 18 that will increase the awareness from the school playground to the workplace and beyond on not only general harassment and verbal assault on women, but there, but there, must, be, there must be sexual, sexual and domestic gender-based violence must also be tackled. Respect for the opposite gender must be encouraged with acceptance of responsibility of, for young men examining their attitudes and taking ownership of their behaviour. Thank you. Thank you. And I call uh, Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and thank you, um, Deputy First Minister, for bringing this matter of the day to the House. It is right and proper that we all stand in solidarity today with everyone across the island of Ireland um, who have been so deeply saddened and angered by this senseless murder. I would like, as others have done, to extend my deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Ashleen Murphy. The tributes written about her since her death have afforded us all an insight into her wonderful life um, that was so cruelly taken away from her. Mr Speaker, it is unfortunate um, Lee, that this is another acute reminder of the need to end violence against women and girls, and I share others' concerns expressed here today at the escalation of this violence against um, members of the female population. However, we all know that women, girls, and of course I include members of the trans community in this, have experienced forms of sexism and unwarranted attacks due to their gender from an early age, and for too long it has been accepted as a consequence of being born female. The tragic death, as others have said, is not an isolated incident. Unfortunately, and the Deputy First Minister read out the names of women who have lost their lives, which was just heartbreaking to hear because we all know some of those women personally, or they were constituents of ours, and we know some of the backstories. And before Christmas, Mr. Speaker, I raised concerns in member statements um, about concerns felt amongst the female population of students in the Holy Land area of South Belfast about the rise in sexual assaults and fears for their own safety just walking along the streets. So, Mr Speaker, there are girls right across this island who live in fear every single day. So I welcome the consultation um, launched last week by the Executive Office and Just Justice Department into a strategy to tackle violence against women and girls and would encourage everyone to channel some of their anger to responding to this. May Ashleen rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I join in the revulsion at this shocking murder. And I think the shock is intensified by the fact that it took place literally in broad daylight, which is something of itself which adds to the layers of fear that uh, evolved from this, a murder such as this. Uh, and I do want to express my condolences to the Murphy family, uh, to the parents who have suffered a loss that, frankly, they will never get over. Uh, indeed, yesterday, as I, 30 years on, spoke to victims of the relatives of, from the Taban massacre, it is quite clear that the horror and the deep, deep pain of murder, no matter how long previously it occurred, resonates every day with those affected. And so sadly, it will be with the Murphy family, uh, tragically in the days and months and years ahead. The community response will undoubtedly help if, and I trust it is the case, that the perpetrator is found and is dealt with by law as they ought to be and spends many, many years in prison. That will maybe help with a sense of justice, but it will not remove the pain from the loss, something that this province knows much about. I've heard today about those women who lost their lives in the pandemic. I also think of those who lost their lives 
in the pandemic of terrorism, which some still seek to justify. Thank you, and I call Jerry Carl. Mr. Speaker, the murder of Ashley Murphy was a brutal, horrendous, and deeply disturbing crime, and my thoughts go out to Ashley's friends and family who are grieving and grieving in such a, a public way. Words can often seem meaningless at this time in response to such horror, but what we have seen uh, on this island in the last few days is an upswell of sorrow, but also anger, anger that says no more, anger that says misogyny should be consigned to the bin, anger that says women should not be subject to harassment, abuse or be killed. Too many women, too often, and people have clearly and strongly said no more. People have said that she was just running, and indeed she was, but it doesn't matter where she was and what she was doing. She sh shouldn't have been killed, uh, especially in such a callous way. People uh, have been killed at home, they have been killed on holiday, and women have been killed everywhere. Why is it that I can run at night time without any fear or worry about my safety? Well, it's because women have been marginalised, stigmatised, oppressed and harassed for too long. Aisling made an impact at such a young age, obviously, on the pupils that she tossed, taught. But let's make her legacy one that banishes the snake of sexism from this island. My thoughts go out to her and her family. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker. More women are murdered in Northern Ireland as a result of domestic violence than in any other part of Western Europe per head of capita. This is an incredibly stark figure provided recently by Women's Aid. White Ribbon NI, who have formed recently, an organisation which this Assembly has supported in the past in signing the uh, White Ribbon Charter. This organisation is asking us all to pledge never to commit, condone or remain silent about violence against women and girls. And the White Ribbon NI's uh, reaction to the murder of Ashleen Murphy was to say that violence against women and girls starts with ideas, words and thoughts long before it becomes action. If we are to create a society where women are safe, we must challenge the attitudes and beliefs that lead to violence against women. The need for a preventative and proactive movement forward cannot be overstated. We believe that men and boys have an important role to play as allies and agents of change. We all must stand together and refuse to stay silent on the issue. Mr Speaker, Ashley Murphy was a beautiful, young, vibrant woman and our thoughts and prayers today are with her parents, her family, her friends, her school, the school children who looked up to her. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this. I thank the member for that, Nicole Justin McNulty. I offer my heartfelt sympathies and support to Ashley Murphy's family, her parents Ray and Kathleen, her brother Cahill, sister Amy, her boyfriend Ryan, her national school class and colleagues, her Bally boy cultus friends, her Kilkoma Kilahi GA Kamogi Club, uh, former teammates, mentors and friends. The outpouring of grief across Ireland since Ashley Murphy's murder has united people everywhere in a sense of shock, sadness and in a sense of defiant anger. It also brings back terrible pain to all those families who have lost loved ones as a consequence of violence by men. My thoughts are with those families today. This is a watershed moment in the consciousness of our island that a young woman, a brilliant young woman, a teacher of young children, a talented musician, a former camogie player, a role model in their, in their community, a pillar of her family, that she has been murdered in broad daylight, in the most brutal fashion, the most brutal fashion while out for run in a public place, strikes at the very centre of our equilibrium, filling us all with a profound despair. Ashley's beautiful soul, her joy, her zest for life, her wonderful potential is gone. The shocking pain of this senseless bereavement will be hitting the extended Murphy and and um, Leonard family so hard. I cannot begin to truly empathise with what they are feeling today. Violence against women is far, far too common in our society. We must dismantle the culture which permits violent crimes against women to take place. A key part of this involves a willingness on the part of men 
to take responsibility for the role that everyday misogyny and sexism plays in keeping that destructive and dangerous culture alive. That requires effort for men in all strands and sectors of life, in professional, personal, sporting and social settings, in boardrooms and on building sites. It will involve having uncomfortable conversations with friends and peers, but by speaking up against and challenging any marginalisation, denigration and objectification of women when we hear it or see it will be helping to break the culture which creates an environment that allows violence against women to happen. I'm so worried about the impact of this murder on women and girls who enjoy exercising in public. Women should not have to forward plan a journey or exercise. They should not have to, have to be worried about the chance of being attacked by a man. But they do. Women should, have to, should not have to make fake phone calls across the other side of the street whilst walking home. But they do. Women should not have to share live locations but they do. Women should not have to fish their keys out of the bag 50 metres before they get to the front door or to the car, but they do. Women should not have to constantly guard themselves against the aggressions of men. Men should challenge each other when they see or hear any form of aggression towards women and their peers. Men do not re realise what a privilege it is to not have to do those things that women have to do every day. That constant vigilance and decision making to feel safe. No more. Our time is Last and Eve, Groshe. Groshe. Okay. And I call Steve Egan. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. And I join along with the rest of my colleagues in the Ulster Unionist Party and indeed everybody in this assembly in passing our condolences on to the Murphy family. And indeed, speaking as somebody who is a father of four daughters, soon to be father of a granddaughter, and indeed one of my own children is a school teacher. And the thing that is palpable amongst our women is the fear. It is a fear aspect that is out there in nearly every aspect of life. And we, as men, have to really sit back and ask how have we allowed this situation to occur? How can it be that some of our most vulnerable in society are scared, and as my friend has already pointed out, scared to go running, scared to be seen out at night, constantly worrying about what is happening? And indeed, as a father, spending my entire time looking at WhatsApp and find a friend just to make sure we know where our daughters are and our wives are. How have we allowed ourselves to come to a society across the, these islands where we are in a situation where fear is predominant? That is something we need to change. And that change must come from within us, from within men. We have to calculate across our community and our male community that it is not right under any circumstances to be able to use casual sexism or misogyny. That has to stop. It has to stop on the absolute sewer that is social media. It has to stop on how we act and communicate and the rest of it. We must be in a position where we can make this island and our women feel as if they are safe. They cannot go around feeling fearful of everything, because this fear is now calculating itself in virtually everything that we do. We must get to a point where people can feel as if they can walk about their streets, their communities, do exercise and everything they want to do, but they have to be able to do it without this constant concern and fear. And that is something we must all collectively strive to do, and that's something, Mr Speaker, we should be doing. And our condolences are again with the family and indeed with the friends. Thank you. I thank the member and I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for accepting this necessary matter of the day on which a number of members, I believe, had submitted notice. There has been an outpouring of grief across the country this week following the murder of 23-year-old Ashley Murphy, a teacher who was out for a run on the banks of the Grand Canal in Tullamore. I rise today, Mr Speaker, on behalf of Alliance in solidarity with Ashley's loved ones and with the tens of thousands of people who attended vigils in recent days to remember her. The meaning, meaningless loss of Ashley has sent shock waves of grief and fear across this island. I personally, Mr Speaker, feel deep anger that this has happened again. Ashley's murder must be a catalyst for change. This matter of the day before the Assembly highlights that men are the culprits and women are the victims, and it is as simple as that. And we as an Assembly need to address that fact and tackle that issue 
before we can move forward with this debate. We can't address concerns for women's safety without putting men at the centre of that discussion. The collective socialisation of men has led some men to become predatory, and that's why we are at this tipping point. We need to ask what we can do as men to stop brothers, partners, friends and colleagues from becoming a perpetrator. Garda Commissioner Drew Harris said last week that he wanted to reassure women that we live in a safe society and that crimes like this are rare. The fact is, they are not rare. Last year alone, at least 140 UK women have been killed by men or in circumstances where a man is the principal suspect. Violence against women, sadly, Mr Speaker, is not rare. The tragic murder of Ashley Murphy must be that catalyst for change and end male violence against women. Women should be able to walk the streets free, f- free from harm, fear and threat. Mr Speaker, I welcome the cross-departmental progress to introduce two strategies to tackle domestic, sexual and gender-based violence launched recently. And I hope that this discussion will continue in the Assembly and we have the opportunity to further debate what more men can do to be better allies, including addressing uh, challenging problematic behaviour from fellow men. All of us in public life have a responsibility to speak up and address the issue, even more so for those of us who are men in public life. And I look forward to working with colleagues to further address these issues. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Nicole. Cindy McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Women across um, this island are angry. They're upset at the murder of Ashine Murphy. But more than that, we're actually traumatised by it. A criminal investigation is taking place, so we must be careful about what we do say. But what I can say is that Ashleen Murphy did everything right. She was getting exercise in a public place and in broad daylight. But even talking about doing everything right in itself is wrong. Women have the right to walk safely home at night. They have the right to live uh, with their partner without being hit, kicked or murdered. Yet too often, that is what happens to women. We are in, in this juris- jurisdiction um, have a particular crisis, and it is a crisis. More women are murdered in Northern Ireland as a result of domestic violence than anywhere else in Europe, jointly with Romania, as it happens. And this is something that we have been continually talking about over a period of years. That is why the work of the Executive Office for a strategy addressing violence against women and girls is so very, very important. We need to understand what is wrong and how we can put it right. But let us make it it absolutely clear. The problem is not with women. We are the victims. We deal with the symptoms of society that has at its heart something deeply wrong. Why do women, why do some men hate women so much, so much hatred that it kills them. There's even a new word for it, and I don't mean misogyny, I mean insul. An insul is a man who blames women for his problems, and for some of them that is justification enough for murdering them. But we have particular problems here which relate to the troubles and the continuing role and reality of paramilitaries, the glorification and justification of violence. And the whole world has a problem. It is not just about violent pornography, about violent online sexist games, about sexist language, about the demeaning of women. It is all of these things and more. It is not just a new problem, but there are some men who create problems for all women. Not only women who are murdered or beaten, but all women who have to be wary of where we go and when and how we do it. And we look to men to solve the problem of those men who abuse, who threaten, who murder. Women have had far, far more than enough. Far more than we are willing to put up with. Ashley Murphy, may your beautiful darling soul rest in peace. And to the Murphy family, may you find comfort and love from your family and your global community in this horrendous time of grief. Thank you, Ian members. That concludes matter of the day. Thank you. Point of order, Jim Allister. Um, in the debate just had, we had many references to the strategy 
uh, in respect of violence against women, a strategy which was launched in a photo call last week. Why was that strategy not presented to this House, the proper place for such a strategy to be presented? Well, I can't address that uh, matter that the member has raised, but obviously you'll, you'll be well aware that I have routinely asked the executive to make their statements and announcements on, on policy matters as far as possible in the chamber to the members themselves. But your, your point has been made. Point of order, Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just last week, the Speaker of the House of Commons and indeed more worryingly, uh, MI5 issued an alert to members of Parliament warning them that an agent of the Chinese state named as Christine Lee is engaged in political interference on behalf of the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party. Understandably, this has given rise to considerable concern that perhaps Chinese state political interference is more widespread, including in these institutions. So can I ask the Speaker's office, have they reached out or received any briefings from the PSNI or other national security organisations regarding the activity of Christine Lee or other agents of the Chinese Communist Party in this very institution? The short answer on that is no. I haven't heard anything from anybody other than what I've seen in the media. And, okay, so the member's made his point. Thank you for that. Uh, moving on now to the uh, next item, and first item actually on the order paper is uh, member statements. And the first uh, if members wish to be called to make a statement, they should do so by continuing rising in their places. Those members who are called will have up to three minutes to make their statement. Uh, members are reminded that the statement will not be subject to debate or questioning. Interventions will not be permitted, and they will not take any points of order on this or any other matter until the item of business has been finished. And I now call on Sinead Annis. Um, I want to stand here and say that the epidemic of violence against women and girls is over, and that the outpouring of grief and anger and frustration at the murder of Ashley Murphy will be enough to end all this. But Cancorla, I know, and we all know, that Ashley Murphy won't be the last. And she won't be the last because, in the wake of her murder in Tullamore, the scramble to find solutions to seeing the same old suggestions thrown out to keep women safe. Suggestions like rape alarms and more police and better street lighting, etc., etc. It seems even now some people are de determined to keep the focus on the actions of women and away from the actions of violent men. Victims of rape and other forms of violence need a justice system that works for them. But this isn't simply a, a policing or justice problem, it is also a wider societal problem. The best judicial system in the world won't succeed if you end up with a jury of 12 people who on some level think that she was asking for it. If we are serious about ending the violence against women and girls, then we need to start by asking why a woman's non-consent is seen as some sort of barrier to be overcome. That is why the strategy to protect women and girls from violence is crucial. We could be the generation to end this epidemic of violence against women and girls if we start by changing not women's behaviour, but the culture that still allows a woman's very humanity to be undermined and ensuring that we have a judicial system that is fair, balanced, but most importantly, that is victim-centred. And they call Keith Buchanan. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, today, 17th of January, marks the 30th anniversary of the Taban massacre, where eight Protestant workers were murdered and maimed when the IRA blew up their minibus at Taban Crossroads on the road between Oman and Cookstown on Friday, January the 17th, 1992. Their firm, Carl Construction, had been specifically targeted because they carried out work for the security forces. Honest men doing an honest day's work. Each year, with the exception of last year, due to COVID restrictions, families have gathered and hold a simple service of remembrance. Many within the community that I represent still bear the hurt and carry the pain of that day, and many feel that justice will not be done until those who perpetrated and facilitated these murders are brought to justice. There cannot be a hierarchy of victims. Innocent victims, survivors and their families must not be forgotten. There are those who now sit in public office who may or may not know what happened on this day 30 years ago. I would appeal to those people and others in the community to give any information they have to the PSNI, and this could bring the perpetrators to justice. Seven of the men who were killed, out, were killed outright. The eighth victim died four days later from his injuries. They were Gary Blakes, Cecil Caldwell, Robert and Seath, Oswell Gilchrist, David Harkness, 
Bobby Irons, Richard McConnell, Nigel McKee. What I would say to those that sat on the hill overlooking the scene, those that planted the bomb, those that planned it, those that watched the workers leave Oma, or those that supported any of those, you too have families, have friends. You may have tragedies in your life, and when they happen, or have happened, ask yourself, the actions that I was part of that murdered eight innocent men, did that play a part in my misfortune? To all those involved, think deep and hard of your actions you were involved in. From when you open your eyes in the morning, each morning, to when you close your eyes each night, think hard, think deep and hard of your actions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Pat Catnick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when I was first elected, I spoke about my desire to work for one community in Lagan Valley, all of us together. Since then, I am proud of the work my little office team have done in Lisburn for thousands of people who have contacted the office there in Smithfield. Uh, we have helped people get homes, get the benefits and support they need, and get the medical support they require. We have tried our best to help with every unique case that has come our way. Yet, when I meet people, I don't know I am completely embarrassed to tell them that I am a politician. This is due to the long line of elected individuals who have misused the trust the public have placed on them, even without the litany of boozy parties held at Downing Street. While people were told not to visit dying relatives, I could still see this entire day of examples, manifestants of running public services low with almost complete incompetence and now misleading the public, has now become the default for some. In this context, it is now reported that the restrictions on double jobbing as an MP and MLA is to be removed. They are calling it the Jeffrey Mander, a new word in the English language. We are told that this is apparently to help maintain the stability of these institutions. My simple question is how? How, since being elected to the MLA, have been contacted by constituents in all hours of the day. I have worked to help people on Christmas Day or on family occasions, and I was delighted to do so because that is the role I was elected to do. I am sure many of you can give similar examples. In addition, we have had debates in this chamber that have gone on all night. We have recorded amounts of legislation that need to be considered. We have policy and budget documents that run to hundreds of pages and require detailed scrutiny, particularly in the post or HIR. My work as an MLA is to do all the good I can and required my full attention. Even three years when I was prevented from being in this chamber, how any person or political party in this day and age can feel that they can fulfil their role as both an MP and an MLA at the same time is beyond me. In fact, I would say for definite that they cannot, and that too so would be a complete disservice to those they represent. I urge the British government to reject this party political bung. Our institution should not be used as a dig out for the DUP or anyone else. Reject the gerrymander and let's get on with the important work of doing all the good we can for all the people we can and all the ways we can for as long as we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stand today uh, to speak about the death of five year old Maggie Black, a schoolgirl from Glen Arm. Maggie died after becoming unwell with stomach pains at her home. As her breathing became difficult, her family dialed 999. It took 70 minutes for an ambulance to arrive. Thinking quickly, her parents contacted a family member, a local firefighter, for help. That crew arrived within 10 minutes, but unfortunately her condition deteriorated. So for this family, the outcome was heartbreaking and utterly tragic. But as first responders with life-saving equipment, we know that Maggie was given the best support available. And I want to thank the fire team for providing much needed support and comfort in such demanding circumstances. The current unimaginable pressure on our health service is a terrifying reality for many people living in rural locations. For others, 
It is simply the difference between life and death. Mr Speaker, I'm asking for support for Maggie's call to make fire service dispatched in rural areas in life-threatening situations mandatory. The reality is, without systemic and planned change, emergency services are already stretched thin and are forced into crisis. There are two choices. We can either resist change and slowly deteriorate until the point of collapse, or embrace transformation and create a sustainable service, adequately funded and equipped to provide people with proper care, particularly in rural settings. Crucially, Mr. Speaker, work must be carried out to improve medical care throughout rural communities. The Department must now build on the promising co-responder pilot scheme, whereby fire services are dispatched to suspected cardiac emergencies in local catchment areas of fire stations, in addition to standard emergency ambulance response. More than this, Mr. Speaker, upskilling is fundamental in creating an all-encompassing emergency service, capable of responding not just to today's challenges, but to the difficulties that we will face in the future. Investment in lifelong training for all our emergency staff will and can transform our learning experience for those vital services, ensuring that we continue to have the best people trained to the highest standards um, to be on hand when our rural communities are most in need. The Northern Ireland Ambulance Service and the Northern, Fire, Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service need to be resourced and funded to deliver a joint response model. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Nicole. Jerry Carl. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, over the last number of days, I've been proud to stand with the workers at the Regina Chelly Women's Hostel in West Belfast as they are faced with a very real prospect of losing their jobs. This is a vital women's only hostel that supports women who have addiction issues or may have been the victim of domestic abuse. And unfortunately, over recent days and weeks, we see why women need safe spaces in our communities. Domestic violence and violence against women are all too common in our society, and these hostels provide an important space for women to go and seek safety in an attempt to try and rebuild their lives. What distorted message does it send that one of the only hostels that support women with dual diagnosis and in these critical situations can be allowed to close? Mr. Speaker, it sends a message that women's safety is not prioritised in society, despite what was said in the previous discussion. The workers at Regina Shelley, their union, Unite, and everybody who has stood up to defend the service have done the right thing. And I know they will continue to fight uh, and they will keep the sit-in going uh, until the site is protected and kept open. They have my full support in that fight. I want to say categorically that this is an important and vital service. This is a service and centre that is wanted and needed in our community and it needs to remain open. It is a safe space for women in a safe location, and we cannot put this at risk due to some unexplained or unevidenced reason for those that run the centre. Over the last number of years, Mr. Speaker, my office has worked with countless um, women in Regina Chelly, and they have spoken of the support that they have received in glowing terms. It does not bear thinking about where these women would have ended up if they did not have the care and support provided at Regina Chelly. The workers need to be allowed to continue to do their jobs as they have done for many years, and many former tenants are furious and have turned up to protest to save this site. The role played by the Legion of Mary and their management board needs to be called out as shocking uh, in this saga. There is not much Christianity in telling women who work in a women's support hostel and those who rely on it that are out in their ear, doors are closed. Disgracefully, workers have been suspended on the grounds of serious breaches of safety and security. Charges of safety should be thrown in the faces of those who are ploughing ahead with the closure, with no regard to the safety or security of women and where they will go if this centre closes. Extreme gaslighting of the highest order. Not to mention, of course, closing a women's only hostel and forcing people to transfer into mixed accommodation, who knows where. We need to see emergency intervention from the Minister to save this service. It is not good enough to use excuses to stop intervention to save this hostel. How many emergency powers were passed during COVID to protect people from the virus? Where, then, is the urgency and the emergency intervention to protect women from the epidemic of violence that they face? Excuses won't cut it. The Minister needs to make sure this site is kept running. She needs to take it from the Lees and the Mary and ensure it is ran by the Housing Executive and the jobs of the workers who are currently sitting out are protected. So defend Regina Shelley, defend the service and defend these jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Jim Allister. 
Mr. Speaker, the 17th of January is indeed a day of infamy in regard to the terrorist record in this province. The day of the uh, Taban massacre, when eight innocent, hard-working Protestant men were blown to bits by the IRA 30 years ago today. For those men, no special ombudsman's investigation, no inquiries, no truth, no justice, and no apology from Sinn Féin, the spokesman of the Republican movement. Rather, continuing glorification of acts of such vile, unspeakable terrorism. The second issue I want to address was this. Several years ago, for very good reason, the electorate, at reasons which remain equally valid today, the electorate of Northern Ireland were rid of the selfish, selfish scourge of double jobbing and the insult that it was adequate to be represented in Parliament by a part timer. Now, at the behest and to facilitate one man and his party, it seems double jobbing is to return. The key question for me is what price was paid for that facilitation? Because it only benefits one party. One has observed a softening in regard to the urgency attending the protocol. No longer do I hear the Prime Minister being told he must choose between the protocol and Stormont. Why is that? And will there be further price paid in respect of this facilitation? Because let me be very clear with this House. This protocol is dismantling the Union check by check. The puts posts are the very manifestation of the partitioning of this United Kingdom. Any unionist who can come to terms with the protocol is coming to terms with the end of the union. And if a deal to obtain short-term party time's up. plays any part in that, then so much the greater shame on those. Thank you, and I call Nicola Brogan. On the 27th of December 2021, three young men tragically lost their lives in a road traffic accident on the A5 Oma Road in Gervahi. They were all in their early 20s, as was a fourth man who was seriously injured in the traffic accident. Can I take this opportunity to send my deepest sympathies and condolences to the heartbroken family and friends of those who lost their lives and to those who have been affected by the accident. Um, their family, friends, colleagues in the wider Berra and Gravahi um, communities have been left totally devastated um, by this loss. And I also wish um, a full and speedy recovery to the young man who did receive such um, serious injuries. Unfortunately, though, as we're all aware, this has not been the first tragic or serious accident on the A5. This recent tragedy has brought to 42 the number of lives lost on the A5 since 2006, with many more people having been left with um, life-changing injuries. So it's time for this to stop and it's time for action. The will of the vast majority of people who support the upgrade of the A5 has been repeatedly frustrated by a tiny vested interest. This cannot be allowed to continue. The planned upgrade to the A5 must, must be permitted and the legal challenges overcome to prevent further loss of life. So today I'm asking for three things. The first is immediate action um, on the A5 with more, more, no more delays to road improvements. For the Department of Infrastructure and uh, Minister Mallon to be ready and prepared to act immediately following the A5 inquiry and for temporary safety measures to be implemented in the meantime. Myself and other Sinn Féin colleagues have called for the Department to consider enhancing the safety of the road and today again I'm calling on the Minister to prioritise the safety of road users. 
Um, in relation to that stretch of road near Gravahi, I ask that the department put lighting along the section of the A5 because there is residential housing, a shop and a restaurant all in close proximity and it is really important that motorists are made aware of this here um, to prevent further accidents. And I would also ask for a review um, in, to ensure that there are adequate cat size and reflective arrows and solar lighting along the entire A5. These measures, although temporary, are vital for road safety, especially on such a dangerous stretch of the road. Garmagat. Thank you. And I call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Many of us won't remember 30 years ago where they were. I remember clearly this day 30 years ago getting a phone call to bring my wife to her mother in law, or my mother in law. I remember the visit from the police about 20 past 10, coming with the news that many of us didn't want to say my brother in law, along with eight other, or sorry, seven other colleagues, were brutally murdered and six were seriously injured. We have gathered for 30 years, Mr Speaker, at the same spot, albeit we didn't gather last year because of COVID. We have gathered there with family and friends and wider community who have expressed an interest over those years, strongly supported by the Reverend McRae and the Reverend Ivor Smith, and I have to say supported by the contractor of the time and still to this day supports those families every year, Cedric Blackburn from Carly Construction, with dignity. But, Mr Speaker, yesterday struck me more than most, and I think it's been slightly touched on by Mr Alistair in terms of inquiries. But in the contribution made yesterday by the Reverend William McRae, he did say, and I don't expect this to get covered today either, because there was a particular media interest yesterday, but the media have never been interested in T-Ban, other than a, blunt, a, a passing headline. But as Mr Alistair said today, there's been no ombudsman's inquiries, but there, indeed there's been no fancy reports commissioned by BBC or indeed any other media outlets to what actually happened that day. But I have to say the friendship we have gathered from that and the bond we have, indeed many of us went last night to a religious service later. But before we went to that service, I was glad to have an opportunity to speak to one man who I've never spoken to before, who was telling me he was travelling behind that bomb or the van that day before it was blown up. That man has never been interviewed by the HET so maybe now the police, the security forces, will maybe want to make contact with that man who indeed worked for the same firm, but was never, never, ever spoken to in relation to the HET. I think that's a shame, but I think the, the timing of that was stark following what Reverend McRae said yesterday and the lack of interest by BBC and others and the lack of interest with the HET. Maybe it's time now, after 30 years, they got their act together and bring some form of justice to us and the rest of the families. I thank a member for that, and I call Matthew O'Toole. Mr. Speaker, uh, first of all, I associate with myself with remarks were made earlier on um, relating to the loss, not the loss, the brutal, evil murder of Ashling Murphy, and what it says to all of us about um, violence against women in this society uh, in Ireland, and, and how far we, as men and as a society, have to come. I'd also associate myself, or I'd. Um, acknowledge and uh, mark the very uh, difficult anniversary around uh, the victims of the Taban massacre 30 years ago. Um, Mr Speaker, last week in the Economy Committee uh, we heard something shocking. We heard uh, about one of the practical outworkings of Brexit for Northern Ireland and for the young people here, the, uh, and not just for the young people, for all uh, people um, who need economic policy to be properly funded in Northern Ireland. During, one of the referendum, during the referendum campaign in 2016, one of the frequent arguments made by Leave supporters, including those on the bench opposite and indeed one uh, to my left on the bench here, was that um, leaving the European Union would free up £350 million a week, we were told, for the NHS. What we are seeing now is that leaving the EU is not delivering more money for public services, it is threatening public services and threatening vital funding. Department of Economy officials came to the Economy Committee to tell us that there is a £65 million a year loss of EU funding, primarily the, e, uh, the European Social Fund uh, and the ERDF, which funds vital investment in our economy. It does not fund fancy add-ons. It funds things like essential apprenticeship training. It funds innovation training, stuff that is completely essential for our economy. That is why those officials told us that by 2025 there will be a shortfall in their department. This isn't just funding they have lost, this is funding that they have lost and has not been replaced by the British government of £100 million. That's a shocking indictment of Brexit 
and of the individuals who sold people here Brexit. But they haven't just failed bureaucrats in government departments, they failed young people. Young people who need jobs and they need places at university. What was one of the other things we heard in that committee? We heard that one of the things the department may have to do is look at increasing university fees. Increasing university fees and possibly reducing university places because they don't have the money to fund the higher education system because of Brexit. I hear chuntering from Mr Alistair to my left. He shouldn't be saying a word given the failures for young people. This is a failure of Brexit here, but specifically of the Democratic Unionist Party, who run that department and have done for the last decade and a half. They failed young people. And to hear their leader look for two jobs when young people in this society might not be able to get one thanks to their irresponsibility. Mr Speaker, I want to close with a quote. It's not often I quote uh, Rudyard Kipling. He's a British imperialist and an Ulster loyalist, so I don't quote him very often. But he did say one thing that I want the DUP to reflect on. He said in his poem, I could not dig, I dared not rob, therefore I lied to please the mob. Now all my lies are proved untrue, and I must face the men I slew. What tale shall serve me here among mine angry and defrauded young? The Democratic Unionist Party must understand the the time is up. Our members, time is up. Very soon. Members, time is up. And I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I take this opportunity to speak today in relation to the UK government's plan to reintroduce double jobbing between MPs and MLAs. The Alliance Party firmly uh, opposes these proposals. I joined this place, as do many others, because we want to move politics forward, not about turning back the clock and bringing back a firmly discredited practice. Double jobbing was banned in Northern Ireland many years ago and should remain so. Being an MLA and doing it properly is a full-time job, as is being an MP, and people in Northern Ireland deserve MLAs firmly committed to making devolution work. Not part-time MLAs also keeping their foot in Westminster, shamelessly hedging their bets on the future of Stormont, depending on how their party performs and how they want this place to work. In 2022, we ought to be about enhancing the diverse range of politicians across Northern Ireland representing the people, whether it be in district councils, the Assembly and Westminster, not about a few hogging multiple top jobs. When Stephen Farry was elected as MP, he legally had to give up his MLA seat, and that's what happened. And I replaced him as MLA for North Down. That was the right thing to do. It was also the right thing to do that I gave up my full-time job and was disqualified and gave up my role as a councillor. I am dedicated on a full-time basis to making devolution work, and others should be likewise. The Owen Patterson scandal again shed a light on MPs taking on professional work outside of also being a full-time elected representative, and that also needs to be addressed. People should be here full-time, dedicated to the Assembly. Stormont should not be seen as a plaything for some people. Everyone in this party should be focused upon the people and serving them, not themselves and their party. I would engage or again urge the UK Government to withdraw these proposals. All along, we have been told that nothing in the new decade new approach package could be amended in the legislation in Westminster, despite many worthwhile amendments. But why this? Why now? I think we all know the answers to that. It stinks, and these proposals need to be withdrawn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Nicole. Emma Sheeran. I get Kincorlia. We're now halfway through January, but it is easy to forget that it's 2022, given that a lot of the political discourse that we've seen so far this year belongs to a much earlier time. Kate Hoy's concern that nationalists are dominating professional vocation reeks of insecurity and bitterness, but that she would hark back to talk of headcounts and division is hardly a surprise to anyone who knows her politics. However, suggestion that those from a nationalist background only get educated to promote some sort of an agenda did take a more sinister turn when it was endorsed by the leader of the DUP. The days of no nationalist need a play are over. For much of the 20th century in this state, nationalists were disenfranchised and discriminated against. That was official state policy. In fact, as we seen evidenced last week in the release of yet another report detailing state collusion, this time in the murder of 19 people across the North in the 80s and 90s, nationalists were targets. Inciting hatred and othering people has consequences. We need to bear that in mind during this conversation. Jim Wales, a strange DPMLA, was on the media last week to defend Ms Hoey. 
He stated that Catholics had traditionally rejected industry. I am from and represent the industrial and engineering capital of Ireland, Mid-Ulster. Our local businesses produce 80% of the world's crushing and screening equipment across South Derry and East Tyrone. Many of them are probably nationalists. They're all experts in their trade. Nationalists are not a homogenous group and they never rejected industry, but in many of the organisations of old, the Orange State closed that door for them. It isn't lost on me, as a first generation graduate myself, that two of the victims referred to in Friday's report were Sinn Féin elected reps, including one who was a councillor in the area that I am now very proud to represent, murdered whilst on his way to work in the year that I was born. Working class nationalists in years gone by were unable to access things like education, a decent job, the means to put a roof over their children's heads. So they rose up. They fought for their civil rights and they attained them. They put lunchboxes under their arms and they reared their families and they gave them the means to get educated if they so wished, to walk into courtrooms and lecture halls with confidence, as well as onto building sites or into business or to work as nurses and doctors and all the other roles in between. I think it would be much more appropriate for political unionism to raise awareness of and work towards removing the barriers that still exist for many of our marginalised groups who are still underrepresented within our higher education settings, our political spheres, the media, the law, women, people living with a disability, those from our black and minority ethnic communities, our LGBT community, those living in poverty. Nationalists may now apply. Let's work together to build a society where everyone members can. Members, time is up. Thank you. And that concludes members' the members' statements. Can members please take a raise for a moment or two to be change the top table? Thank you. Thank you, uh, members. Mr. Paul Frew has sought leave to present a public petition in accordance with Standing Order 22. The member will have up to three minutes to speak on this issue. I call Mr. Paul Frew. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I believe this may be, in my 12 years as an Assembly member, my first uh, time presenting a petition. A petition made up and formed and organised by a group called Liberty NI. It has 10,000 signatures. I cannot think, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, of a more honourable cause for a petition than to record or disgust an abhorrence that an executive and indeed this assembly can pass such a discriminatory measure as vaccine certification. Brought into reality by a health minister using emergency legislation that is both undemocratic and not accountable to the vigorous and rigorous regime of stages of primary legislation. This measure, vaccine certification, is one of a number of cruel measures brought in by this Health Minister, but this one treats people differently, and only by whether you have received a medical intervention, namely a COVID vaccine. This measure is designed to discriminate this measure is designed to isolate. This measure is designed to coerce. And it is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. 
When you prevent someone or ban them from entering a pub or restaurant, unless they prove their health by testing for a virus every other day, but allow someone into the same setting who has a certificate on their phone or person simply because they were vaccinated months ago and who could well be suffering from the virus. That is discrimination. And it's discrimination of the harshest order because it violates one of the most instinctive and principled norms of the medical world, that of informed consent. It has also had a terrible impact on business and has created suffering, dramatic suffering, of downturns in those businesses, not only because people are being prevented from entering their premises, but because many are refusing to play any part in this practice of certification and discrimination. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, this needs to end, and it needs to end now. Thank you. Certainly. I wonder, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, if you could advise on a point of order when, whether, uh, on a matter of such important public health, on, on such an important public health matter, given some of the assertions and statements that have been made by the uh, previous speaker, it's in order for the record to be corrected in relation to some of the statements that have been made by the health minister, who actually has responsibility for public health, not fairly extreme marginal campaign groups who are opposed to vaccines. Members put his remarks on the record of the House, but he would be aware that that is not a point of order. Uh, normally, I would invite uh, the member uh, to bring his petition to the table and to present it to me, but in light of social distancing, I'd ask the member to remain in his place and make arrangements to submit the petition uh, to Mr Speaker's office electronically. Thank the member for bringing his petition to the attention of the Assembly. And once received by Mr Speaker, I'm sure it will be forwarded to the Minister for Health and a copy will be sent to the relevant committee. We move on now to the next item on the order paper, which is a motion to suspend standing orders 10.2 and 10.4. Can I ask the clerk to please read the motion? That standing orders 10 brackets 2 to 10 brackets 4 be suspended for the 17th of January 2022. Call Mr Andrew Muir to move the motion. Please. Before we proceed to this question, I would remind members that this is a motion that requires cross-community support. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And as there are ayes from all sides of the House, and I did not hear any dissenting voices, I am satisfied that the cross-community consent threshold has been passed. The next item of business is the further consideration stage of the Financial Reporting Departments and Public Bodies Bill. I call the Minister of Finance, Mr Conor Murphy, to move the bill. Moved. Last concordo. Thank you, Minister. No amendments have been tabled. As no amendments have been tabled, there is no opportunity to discuss the Financial Reporting Departments and Public Bodies Bill today. Members will, of course, be able to have a full debate at the final stage. The further consideration stage of the Financial Reporting Departments and Public Bodies Bill is therefore concluded, and the bill stands referred to Mr Speaker. If members would just take their ease for a moment before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you. We now move on to further consideration stage of the Animal Welfare Services Animals Bill. I call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Mr Edwin Poots, to move the bill. I move that further consideration stage of the Animal Welfare Service Animals Bill be now taken. Thank you, Minister. As no amendments have been tabled, there is no opportunity to debate the Animal Welfare Service Animals Bill today. Members shall, as in the previous item, be able to have a full debate at the final stage. Further consideration stage of the Animal Welfare Service Animals Bill is therefore concluded, and the bill stands referred to Mr. Speaker. Members, just take their ease for a second.
Thank you, members. Uh, consideration stage of the Charities Bill. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargy, to move the bill. I beg to move. Members will have a copy of the Marshall List of Amendments detailing the order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the Provisional Grouping of Amendments selected list. There are two groups of amendments, and we will debate the amendments in each group in turn. The first debate will be on Amendments 1 and 2, which deal with the lawfulness of decisions taken by the Charity Commission and the time frame for appeals. The second debate will be on Amendments 3 and 4, which deal with functions to be delegated to staff and the scheme of delegation. I remind members intending to speak during the debates on the two groups of amendments that they should address all the amendments in each group on which they wish to comment. Once the debate on each group is completed, any further amendments in the group will be moved formally as we go through this bill, and the question on each will be put without further debate. The questions on stand part will be taken at the appropriate points in the bill. I hope that that is clear, and we will then proceed. We now come to the first group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 1, it will be convenient to also debate Amendment 2. I call the Minister for Communities to move Amendment 1 and to address the other amendment in the group. Minister. Thank you. I beg to move Amendment 1. And I just want to firstly place on record my thanks to the Committee uh, for Communities, the Chair and Deputy Chair, for their assistance in progressing this short um, but important bill to consideration stage. Their scrutiny has been robust and diligent, and the amendments that I have proposed are as a direct result of their considerations. As a consequence, I believe the bill um, is now better. As you will know, uh, my purpose in bringing this bill to the Assembly is to address the impacts of the McBride Court judgment, subsequently confirmed by the Court of Appeal. The bill will make uh, past decisions taken by staff of the Charity Commission lawful, but only in circumstances where to do so will not impinge on the rights of individuals under the European Convention of Human Rights. The bill also allows for future arrangements to be put in place in respect of how the Charity Commission functions effectively going forward to increase efficiency, public trust and confidence. In addition to and in direct response to the views of community sector representations, I determined that the bill should also include a power to introduce a registration threshold through subordinate legislation, subject to the draft affirmative procedure at some point in the future, if the evidence supported it. Clause 1 of the bill relates to past decisions taken by the Commission staff, which were found to be unlawful due to the deficiencies in the legislative framework. This group of amendments seeks to provide further safeguards in addition to the proposed um, in the first draft which I introduced in the Assembly in June of last year. Amendment 1 is in response to evidence presented to the Committee that there could be potential breach of an individual's convention rights if the Bill made lawful decisions relating to the collection and storing of data under sections 22.3 and 23.1 of the Charities Act NI 2008, which could include personal information. From the outset, I have been clear that nothing in this bill should impinge in any way on the rights of individuals under the Convention. That um, was the rationale for the provisions for exemptions of clauses 1, 3 and 1, 5 of the bill, which mean that decisions will remain unlawful where a court or tribunal have found them to be unlawful. They are the subject of ongoing proceedings, where unlawful delegation is one of the issues of those proceedings and where there are specifically excluded by Clause 1.5, for example, the publication by Commission staff of a statutory inquiry report on the, sus the suspension or removal of a trustee. In addition, and to provide further protections, I am determined that there should be refreshed appeal rights where a decision is to be made lawful by the Bill, and this is afforded by Clause 1, 7 and 8. There are no rights of appeal under Section 22.3 of the original Act, and the rights of appeal in respect to Section 23.1 are limited to those who uh, were served with the order to provide the information, but do not extend to those whose information may have been disclosed as a result of the order. 
Taking on board the concerns raised at committee, I have determined that sections 22.3 and 23.1 should be added to the clause 1.5 of the Bill, so that decisions taken by the Commission staff would remain unlawful. In addition, I have determined that the administering of oaths or the requirement for the making of subscribing or the declaration of truth under section 22.4 should also be added to clause 15 and remain unlawful. During the course of the committee deliberations, it was queried whether the bill might make these decisions lawful but create new appeal rights in respect of sections 22.3 and 23.1. I do not believe this to be prudent or necessary. The Information Commissioner is the appropriate mechanism for challenging decisions about data processing rather than the Charity Tribunal. The validation of decisions taken under section 22.3 and section 23.1 could hinder a third party's potential recourse to the Information Commissioner, as it would remove a legality argument for such third parties, which they could have utilised to argue that any processing of the data was unlawful, as it did not have a statutory footing. In addition, if I uh, determined that such appeal rights should be afforded were none previously existed, those rights would need to be extended in relation to all decisions taken under the provisions, and not simply to those being retrospectively validated by this Bill. However, if the Commission was conducting an inquiry which required gathering large amounts of information, this would have the potential to contain personal data of tens of thousands of people. Such new appeal rights could greatly hinder the Commission's ability to conduct its regulatory functions effectively and could generally impact the number of cases in the Charity Tribunal. Therefore, I propose Amendment No. 1, which will amend Clause 1 of the Bill, so that decisions taken under Sections 22.3, 22.4 and 23.1 of the Act are now included in Clause 1.5 of the Bill, therefore remaining unlawful and thus being free to be challenged by way of Information Commissioner, the Ombudsman or the Courts. On Amendment 2, members will know that Clause 1 8 of the Bill, as currently drafted, stipulates that the fresh appeal rights for appeals arising from the decision which are being made lawful retrospectively by this Bill would be subject to the standard appeal timeframe. In setting this timeframe, I recognise that it would be crucial that a fresh appeal rights were communicated as widely as possible and that the Department would work with the Commission, sectoral interest and representative bodies to ensure that this was the case. I also recognise that the Charity Tribunal rules allow for appeals that are submitted outside the required timescale to be considered if the Tribunal deems this appropriate. However, during the committee stage evidence sessions, many witnesses stated that the 42 days was not enough. The Commission, during its briefing to the committee on 16 September, advised that while it has the facility to contact individual charities, to advise them of the implications of passing of this bill, it would not have the details of all parties that could be affected, for example, trustees or members of those charities. I therefore believe that there is justification in allowing extra time for appeals arising from this bill, and that this could be best done by extending the time frame from 42 days, i.e. six weeks, to 91 days, which is 13 weeks. Therefore, I propose amendment number two, which will amend clause 18 of the bill so that the time frame for appeals arising from decisions made lawful by this bill is extended from 42 days to 91 days. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call the chairperson of the Communities Committee, Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I speak in support of amendments 1 and 2 on behalf of the Committee for Communities. As I said at second stage, we all know that charities legislation has a somewhat checkered history here. Although the Charity Commission was established in 2008, it did not actually take on its regulatory powers until 2013. Although the bill before us is a short one, the background leading to the need for the bill is complex and involves decisions taken over a number of years. It impacts on over 7,000 decisions taken by the Charity Commission staff which, when at the end of a series of legal proceedings, were finally deemed not lawful in February 2020 by the Court of Appeal, leaving many charities, their trustees, their staff, 
their financial supporters in confusion. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your indulgence, I will say a few words about the committee's scrutiny of the bill before I speak on the amendments. We aim to scrutinise this bill to ensure, as far as possible, it protects charities, protects rights, and restores the pillars of the regulatory framework for charities. Throughout, the committee focused on potential unintended consequences, as retrospective legislation is an unusual course of action. The committee received 19 written submissions from interested organisations and individuals, and we held 12 oral evidence sessions. The committee then considered and deliberated on the provisions of the bill and, and the proposed amendments at three meetings, concluding with its formal clause-by-clause -clause consideration on the 25th of November 2021. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I should also say the committee had to bear in mind the wider work ongoing at the time by the independent review of charity regulation. The committee had sincerely hoped that the report of the independent review panel would have been published while it was considering this bill, as it works, its work does overlap in places with several actions permitted by the Charities Bill. This was not to be the case, and the committee wished to put on the record that its full consideration of the issue was hampered by the fact as it was only able to hear from the panel in closed session. Based on the evidence it took and its deliberations, the committee agreed to request the Department make a number of amendments to the Bill in Clauses 1 and 2 and agreed Clauses 3 and 4 as drafted. The committee was pleased that these were taken forward as ministerial amendments to existing clauses with one matter dealt with through ministerial assurance. I will take this opportunity to thank departmental officials, the Bill Office and the Committee Secretariat for their help throughout committee stage and would highlight the good working relationship between the Committee Secretariat and the officials. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, turning now to Amendment 1. With regard to Clause 1, the Committee sought the addition of Sections 22.3 and 23.1 to Clause 1.5 of the Bill, and I thank the Minister for taking this forward in this amendment. Based on evidence it received, the Committee queried with officials the impact of the retrospective action on Section 22.3 and Section 23.1 of the 2008 Act. The Committee noted that there are no rights of appeal under Section 22.3 and that the rights of repeal in respect of Section 23.1 of the Act are limited to those who were served with the order to provide the information, but do not extend to those whose information may have been disclosed. The Minister took on board that retrospective validation of these actions by the Commission and has the potential to engage a person's convention rights in terms of Article 8, right to a private and family life, and potentially remove a legality argument for third parties, which they could have used to argue that processing of the data was unlawful as it did not have a statutory footing. The Minister therefore determined that Section 22.3 and 23.1 should be added to Clause 1.5, in keeping with her stated policy that the Bill should do nothing that could impinge on the rights of indi individuals under ECHR. In addition, the Minister advised the Committee that she also was determined that the administrating of an oath or the requirement to make and subscribe a Declaration of Truth under Section 22.4 should also be included in Clause 1.5. The Committee are pleased to support Amendment 1. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, turning now to Amendment 2. Also with regard to Clause 1, the Committee sought to extend the time frame for appeals arising from this Bill to the Charity Tribunal from 42 to 91 days. Regarding the fresh appeal rights in the Bill, the Committee were concerned that 42 days is not long enough for charities impacted by the Bill, as it became clear that the Charity Commission would not have contact details for all charities affected. The Minister determined that there was indeed ju ju justification for extending the time frame for appeals arising from this Bill and has put Amendment 2 before us. The Committee therefore supports Amendment 2. The Committee also requested consideration of extending the time frame for all appeals to the Charity Tribunal from 42 days to 91 days, either in Clause 1 or through a consequential amendment to the Bill. 
DFC officials worked with the Committee of Justice officials to look at this matter, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the officials from the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service who patiently briefed the Committee on these legal matters. The outcome was that this could not happen through this bill. However, the Committee accepted a ministerial assurance that the officials would continue to work with DOJ officials with a view to a possible future amendment to the Tribunal rules. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> I call Ms. Anya Murphy. And I welcome this opportunity today to speak on behalf of Sinn Féin on this bill today. We welcome the fact that the Communities Minister has brought about this piece of legislation, which has been long called for by the charity sector. The Charities Bill has come about off the back of the McBride judgment in 2019 and the Court of Appeal in 2020, addressing the impacts that arose from these judgments. The purpose of this bill is to make past decisions taken by staff of the Charity Commission lawful, but only to do so, so as it will not impinge on the rights of individuals under the European Convention of Human Rights. It will also put in place mechanisms that will ensure greater public trust and confidence moving forward. As we can see from the speakers here today and throughout the different stages of this bill, along with various different organisations, it is clear that many in the Chamber today understand the importance of this bill. Also, as a member of the Communities Committee where this bill has passed through over previous months, it has been extremely insightful and important to hear the evidence given by various groups and organisations. Over the course of the committee stage, there was 12 oral sessions held with 19 written submissions also received by the, com the, by the committee from a diverse range of organisations. Many of the issues that came up during the committee stage have been touched on by the minister and by the chair of the committee, so I won't go into them all now. The committee worked closely with the department and the minister over the course of the committee stage to ensure that there was fluid and transparent process. There were some recommendations that ourselves and the committee suggested, and the minister has agreed to take these forward. I would like to also put on record the amount of hard work that was carried out by the committee during the committee stage. Amendment 1 in the first grouping from the Minister in relation to a potential breach of an individual's convention rights is an important amendment that was picked up at committee stage. The Minister has outlined from the start that the bill and all within it should not impinge on the rights of any individual. This amendment will therefore add additional protections to individuals in respect to ECHR and Sinn Féin will be supporting this amendment. In terms of Amendment 2 in this grouping, as stated previously, we will be supporting the amendment. This amendment looks at appeal rights and, in particular, the time frame given to appeal increasing from 42 days to 91. It is also positive to know or note that the Minister is already working together with the Minister for Justice to explore this matter further and to introduce potential future amendments to the Tribunal rules. Mr. Mark Durkin. Mr. Principal, or Deputy Speaker, I uh, very much uh, welcome this piece of work which will bring certainty and stability to the charity sector. It had been my intention to keep my comments brief, but so comprehensive has the overview of these amendments and the rationale behind them uh, been, uh, been given by the Minister, the Committee Chair and my colleagues. Uh, on the committee that I'm going to be even briefer. I would, however, just like to take this opportunity to reiterate our appreciation of the charity sector uh, and the invaluable role that that sector and the charities have played and do play in our communities, never more so than the past uh, couple of years. Therefore, it's important that we do take every step that we can to ensure that their good work isn't hampered by an overly onerous bureaucratic process which is the intention uh, behind this bill, which we support. I would echo the Chair's commendation and gratitude to officials, both departmental and committee, uh, as well as our helpers in the bill office, or much more than that, they're like part of the furniture uh, with the Communities Committee today. While this piece of legislation, I think it's fair to say, is fairly non-controversial to some of the other issues that we have been and will be grappling with. I think it is a good example of how uh, departments and committees can and should work together. So uh, we support these amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paul Frew. 
Deputy Speaker, and I rise and take this opportunity to speak on this bill. Uh, and I thank the Minister for bringing it forward at this time. And can I take this opportunity also to thank the Minister's officials who came to the committee and worked hard with us uh, to bring forward these amendments. And I acknowledge the fact that the Department listened to the committee. And if there is an example of how a committee and a department should work together, it's certainly in this case. So I thank the Minister and I thank the officials who came. Uh, because it's, it's, it's what we need, and it is very welcome. Uh, and I get much more joy out of a committee when the department is responsive. Uh, and we have other examples of that in the bills that we're also scrutinising now uh, in, in these days. So I thank the minister for that. Uh, let me be negative for one wee minute, uh, or one small minute, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in that, like the chairperson of the committee, I too regret the fact that the independent panel's uh, report has not yet been made public. And I think it's, it's, an, it's, it's an example of, of how we can't, we haven't the sequencing right when it comes to a bill like this. And that's a regret uh, because we could have done, we could have got so much more out of it. We could have got more insight into what could have been done. And I think that is a miss, and I think that is a regret. Uh, on the actual clauses itself, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and the amendments, uh, and as I say, these are amendments that the committee pushed for. So we, are, we gratefully receive them, because I do think it helps the bill. The context of this, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, is the fact that even though the previous bill went through all of the ramifications, all of the scrutiny, all of the various stages. We didn't get it right. And if you like, if there's such a term in democratic uh, terms, this, if you like, is a bit of a rescue bill. Um, and I'm not sure we've rescued the situation completely but at least it's progress. Uh, clause 1 deals with uh, thousands of decisions that had been taken by the Commission. I think it was 12, sorry, 8,000 decisions taken over that time. 6,800 of those were from registrations of charities. What should be a quite mundane progress process thing, action. We've now had to rescue or repair, maybe repair, Bill, is, is a better terminology to use. But clause one basically fixes that. And so, of course, we are always going to be in a position where we would support that. But what we've added into that is 223, 224 and 231. And when you look at the previous bill and the legislation and then look at this, I think it was clear as the committee worked through with the department that th these needed to be added. Uh, and so that is a, a good thing. Um, and also, I think what is crucially important is the second amendment where we leave out 42 days and we insert 91. And I think that's just good practice to allow good time for these organisations to consider exactly where they are and what they need to do. And I believe 42 days was just so tight, considering that a lot of these organisations do not meet regularly. They certainly don't meet on a daily basis in some cases, and they certainly don't meet on a weekly basis, some week meet monthly. And even if they do meet sooner than that, it's not to talk about these technical issues. So, so I do think that is a, a, a positive, a very good positive, uh, and, and, and one that we support and pushed for. And I, I know the Minister had to go through all the checks and balances to make sure that when they ch she changes this, the Minister changes this, that it doesn't affect or have an unintended consequence. 
And of course, we need that due diligence because we're in the place where we're having to put forward a repair bill in the first place. So that due diligence is welcome. Uh, that's all I think I want to, to say uh, at this stage, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, other than the fact that I do welcome the movement on this bill today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stephen Dunn. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too welcome the opportunity to speak at the consideration stage of this important bill today. The bill, although largely retrospective in rationale, has presented an important opportunity to strengthen the regulatory framework for our charities and protect them, or protect our people and protect our communities. Whilst this bill was formally introduced before my time as a member, there has indeed been a considerable body of work done over the last six months considering this bill, and I too would like to thank the committee staff, the officials and the various stakeholders who made valuable representations on this bill to, the, to our committee. We are very fortunate to have such a vast range of charities right across Northern Ireland. In every town, city and village, many charities make a very valuable contribution, from health-based charities, welfare, education, animals, veterans, to name but a few. Many of these charities could not function without the dedicated work of volunteers, and we have seen the incredible value of them over the last two years particularly. Given the court judgments in 2019 and 20, it was important that this legislation could be progressed to amend the 2008 Charities Act to validate the thousands of charities on the Charity Register with the Charity Commission. And I think the provisions contained within both Clause 1 and Clause 2 will end some of the confusion that many charities have experienced over the last number of years. Clause 1 will also ensure that these charities won't have to go through the charity registration process yet again should this bill receive royal assent. And Clause 2 will ensure that charities receive decisions in a timely way through delegation, which is crucial to allow for forward planning and much needed clarity. I believe there must be confidence and certainty both for charities themselves and for the general public, and that is why this bill has presented a timely opportunity to improve the regulations for all stakeholders. In my view, there must be a balance sought for charities and small charities, and the small charities must not be crippled or stifled from progress and growth by complex red tape and requirements. However, there must indeed be accountability to ensure good governance and transparency and encourage good practice, including the importance of appeal rights. And I believe the thresholds included in this legislation will support many of these smaller charities who do not have the resources that other large, larger and better funded charities would have to meet all of these various requirements. As has been mentioned, the ongoing work of the review panel, whilst it is disappointing, it is appreciated the work is still ongoing and that there is a job of work to do to proceed with that. I look forward to the next steps on this important piece of work. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. No other member has indicated to me that they wish to speak in this section of the debate, and therefore I call the Minister for Communities to wind on the Group 1 amendments. Minister. Thanks very much, and thank you to everybody um, who spoke just in terms of uh, these amendments. And I suppose just to set out and recognise, obviously, to thank all of the staff from the department, from the committee, from the bills office, and obviously DOJ as well. And again, just to reiterate here that that work with DOJ, with the minister and officials around tribunal rules, will continue, um, and that is continuing at the moment as well. And obviously, I mean, I suppose the key part of this was about recognising the convention rights in terms of these and also extending the appeals time frame. I mean, I completely recognise that when the legislation was initially brought in, um, this is a bit of a fix on the back of the McBride uh, court judgment and obviously the appeal judgment after that as well. When I came into post in January of 2020, it was one of the first areas that I had met officials with because that judgment came the year before. And we knew that we needed to do a fix on the existing legislation before beginning to review. Obviously, the pandemic hit and there was a delay, but I am glad that we were able to progress this part. Um, as was rightly said, obviously, Dr um, Una Breen and others who were part of the independent review in terms of looking at charity regulation, they have concluded 
Um, I am hopeful that we will go to publish very soon in terms of their recommendations going forward. And indeed, the committee will get a copy of that in advance of the publication uh, going out as well. And that will start to look at the, the other changes that we need to make in terms of when the initial intent back in 2008 of the legislation came through. So, of course, there is much more work to be done, but it was important in this shortened mandate that we did tidy it up um, in terms of those protections, and particularly on the back um, of those judgments um, that went through the legal process. So again, just at this point, um, I suppose I, I now move then with those amendments. Thank, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Minister. Amendment proposed to clause one, page two, line five, insert the words as printed on the Marshal list. The question is that amendment one be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 2 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities to formally move Amendment 2. Beg to move. Amendment proposed to Clause 1, page 2, line 31, leave out 42, and insert 91, as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 2 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is the clause one, as amended, now stand part of this bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come on to the second group of amendments for debate, with Amendment 3. It will be convenient, I think, to debate Amendment 4, and I call the Minister for Communities to move Amendment 3 and to address the other groups in the amendment. Minister. Thank you. I beg to move Amendment number 3. Clause 2 of the Bill deals with how the Commission discharges its functions going forward and makes provision for limited delegation to the Commission staff, where this is clearly stipulated in the scheme of de delegation, on which a full policy consultation would take place. On Amendment 3, members will be aware that Clause 2 9, sorry, Clause 2 9A 2 stipulates that some decisions of the Commission should never be delegated to staff. This is the main um, area, the types of decision that are taken during the course of a statutory inquiry and that could potentially have a significant detrimental impact on individuals and their ability to serve within the charity sector. Section 37 of the Charities Act NI uh, 2008 allows the Commission by order to direct a person to apply uh, property in a specified manner, manner. Whilst no such orders have ever been made by the Commission or its staff to date, the Committee queried why, uh, when sections 33 to 36 have been included in Clause 2, 9A2 of the Bill as powers that can never be delegated uh, to staff why Section 37 has not. My view in bringing forward this bill was that Section 33 to 36 can have a potentially significant adverse impact on individuals in terms of their reputation and their ability to continue to act within the charity sector. Although such orders can be made by staff in other jurisdictions throughout uh, Britain and Ireland, and indeed here, I took the view that in order to restore confidence in the process here, such decisions are better taken by the Commission or a committee established by the Commission under Schedule 1 of the Act. My initial assessment um, that the Section 37 power does not appear to have uh, the property to have same potential detrimental impacts on individuals and the fact that Section 37 is not included in Clause 2, 9A2 did not make it inevitable that it would be delegated to staff. However, on reflection, I have determined that there is justification in including Section 37 and Clause 2, 9A2, as these decisions could have significant implications for a charity and its trustees. This is reflected in the fact that Section 38 of the Act treats Section 37 orders in the same way as those in Sections 33 to 36 in terms of the notification requirements placed on the Commission in respect of the decision and a statement of the Commission's reasons for making it. Therefore, I propose Amendment 3, 
which will amend Clause 2 of the Bill to include orders made under Section 37 of the Act in Clause uh, 2, 9A2, as powers that can never be delegated to staff. Such decisions account for a small percentage of decisions undertaken by the Commission, and having them made by a committee will not hinder the Commission's ability to make such orders to any meaningful extent. On Amendment 4, it had always been my intention to consult on any scheme of delegation, which I brought forward to ensure openness and transparency, and that any proposed scheme would be co-designed by those potentially impacted. However, during the evidence session on 14 October last year, despite assurances provided by officials, the committee asked if such a consultation could be stipulated on the face of the bill. I have listened and determined that such a stipulation should be included for the first scheme, allowing future ministers the uh, flexibility to determine whether consultation on amendments of the scheme would be in the public interest at that time. Therefore, I propose amendment uh, number four, which will amend clause 25 of the bill, stipulating that there will be a public consultation on the first scheme of delegation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister. I call the chairperson of the Committee for Communities, Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I speak in support of amendments three and four on behalf of the Committee for Communities. Turning firstly to amendment three. From early in its deliberations on Clause 2, the Committee was concerned why the Bill was limited to Sections 33 to 36 in 9A2, and felt that decisions taken under Section 37, the power to direct application of charity property, should also be included. The Committee felt that if Clause 2 is about ensuring public confidence, then the Bill should not be limited to Sections 33 to 36. During our evidence sessions, we were concerned to learn that one member of staff in a charity could potentially take the decision to remove property from a person if Section 37 was not included in the Bill. We strongly highlighted our concerns that we would prefer that Section 37 decisions were not made by one person. The Committee understood the Department's explanation that as the scheme of delegation will be subject to public consultation, it is by no means a given that anything that is not in the Bill will be delegated to staff. However, we still felt the inclusion of Section 37 was the safest way to proceed. The Minister agreed to take forward the amendment that we have before us today, and the Committee thank her for doing so, as it means that the making of orders under Section 37 is included in Clause 2. This amendment will increase public confidence in the actions made by our charitable bodies. The Committee is also pleased to support Amendment 3. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Principal Deputy Speaker, turning now to Amendment 4. This amendment also relates to Clause 2 and was also requested by the Committee and refers to the making of the first scheme of delegation. This amendment stipulates that the Department must complete a public consultation before making the first scheme of delegation. The Committee felt that this was clearly an omission from the Bill as drafted if one of the aims of the Bill was to restore confidence in the sector. The Committee thanks the Minister for taking this amendment for forward. The Committee is pleased to support Amendment 4. The Committee are now content that the public and stakeholders will have sufficient opportunity to share their concerns and opinions with the Department regarding the first scheme of delegation. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call on you, Murphy. Um, in terms of Amendment 3, which is in relation to Clause 2 and the delegation of powers to Commission staff, I will keep my comments brief on both of these amendments. Sinn Féin believes that including orders made under Section 37 of the Act in Clause 2, which will ensure certain powers can never be delegated to staff, will ensure confidence and trust is restored. Amendment 4, if passed, will ensure greater public voice through a potential public consultation on the first scheme, if agreed on by the future Minister when required. We believe that by passing Amendment 4 and including a public consultation on the first scheme will put safeguards in place. It is also our opinion that the public should have a say in how the Commission makes decisions going forward. We believe that the amendments, if introduced, will provide more clarity for those charities moving forward. Sinn Féin will support these amendments. Thank you. No other members indicated to me that they wish to speak, so I, I ask the Minister for Communities to wind. Minister. 
Yeah, just to allow it to be done quick, just again, thanks very much, everybody, for um, your contributions. And again, to reiterate my thanks to the committee. Um, and I think it does show in terms of ourselves working together to make a bill better. And this is obviously evidence of that. So again, I commend and propose the two amendments. Thank you, uh, Minister. I now put the second grouping of amendments. Amendment proposed to clause 2, page 3, line 31, leave out 36 and insert 37 as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 3 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 4 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities to formally move Amendment 4. I beg to move. Amendment proposed to clause 2, page 4, line 8, insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 4 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clause 2, as amended, stand part of this bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause 3. The question is that clause 3 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause 4. The question is that clause 4 stand part of this bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the long title be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. That concludes the consideration stage of the Charities Bill. And the bill now stands referred to Mr Speaker. Members, as it's four minutes to two and question time starts at two o'clock, I propose that members take their ease for a few moments and question time will start then. Thank you.
Okay, members, it's time for questions to the Minister of Justice. Question 14 has been withdrawn, and I call Mark Durgan to ask the first question. Kish Deverhain, that's question number one. Minister. I have been clear that online abuse and harassment is completely unacceptable. Everyone should be able to enjoy the positive benefits of online engagement without being subjected to vile, abusive and harmful content. Those who seek to harass, bully, intimidate or otherwise cause harm should be aware that such activity, whether perpetrated directly or online, may constitute a criminal offence. I would strongly encourage victims of such abuse to report all instances to the police. As the member will be aware, telecommunications, including internet services, are reserved matters. As such, the policy and legislation developed and led by the UK Government Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport, which is taking forward the Online Safety Bill. In that context, my department has not had or plans to have any direct engagement with social media organisations. I am nonetheless committed to doing whatever I can to enhance online safety, and my department is engaging with DCMS actively on the proposed bill. Mr. Speaker, the Joint Committee tasked with scrutinising the bill published its report in December. While I may not agree with everything recommended by the Joint Committee, and I want to take time to consider that in more detail, I agree with the Committee Chair, Damian Collins MP, who in presenting the report stated, that we need to call time on the Wild West online. My department is currently reviewing the recommendations in the committee's report and also with the UK government's response. I will then write to DCMS to set out my analysis of where the bill could be further strengthened. I have reflected my view to the UK government now on a number of occasions that the proposed legislation does not go far enough, particularly in terms of online anonymity. I call on the UK government to grasp this opportunity to ensure that social media firms and the big tech companies are appropriately held to account through regulation and enforcement. Supplementary, Mark Durgan. and I thank the Minister for her answer. Many in this chamber, including the, the, the Minister herself, will have been subjected to abuse far beyond your, what might be acceptable as political rough and tumble uh, from cowardly, faceless bullies. And while it's never acceptable, I think it's fair to say that we reached an, a new or an all-time uh, low with the recent targeting of Diane Dodds, and we offer her support. While acknowledging, uh, Minister, that the, the telecommunications is a reserved matter, can the Minister outline what measures her department is specifically undertaking to support measures to enhance online safety? Well, the member is, of course, I think, right to reflect the absolutely heinous abuse um, that uh, Diane Dodds faced over the Christmas period. Having seen her original post, a rather pleasant post, uh, with her dogs um, uh, and wishing people a happy new year, descend into some of the most callous and calculated abuse of an individual that I have seen in some time, I think felt most people uh, with a degree of nausea um, and anger. Um, I have been in touch with Diane since, um, just to extend my sympathies and my solidarity to her, and I also reported the incident to the PSNI, which is what I believe needs to happen in such cases. I have engaged with social media platforms where I have had the opportunity. For example, I engaged with Facebook as part of the uh, online hate crime event, which was held in 2020, aimed at exploring hate crime in a digital context and reflected my concerns directly to them about how social media platforms deal with online abuse. However, this is a much bigger issue than any department alone can address. And it does require, I believe, not just a UK-wide um, effort, but I believe a much wider effort, including our European partners, in terms of trying to challenge um, the abuse online and how social media platforms are managed. Um, and I think that if we don't do that cooperation, um, it will be very difficult to move forward. I think it's fairly clear uh, Mr. Speaker, and any of us who have had the misfortune to report abusive behaviour, whether directed at ourselves or others, um, will often be told by social media companies that it doesn't contravene their community standards. I think what's obvious from that is that self-regulation of online services has failed, and companies now, I think, must be held liable for the systems they have created. I believe fundamentally that people have a right to free speech. But that right to free speech comes with the responsibility to exercise it um, in an appropriate way. 
and no one has the right to a platform. And I think that needs to be taken into consideration by the companies. Nicole Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, in light of the recent cruel murder of Ashleen Murphy and the highlighting of um, misogynistic abuse that women um, particularly uh, experience online and the incident of the sick incident of cyber flashing that um, that was uh, happened during the vig or the online vigil last night, will the minister um, join with me in condoning all this abuse, condemning this abuse? Sorry, I, I absolutely will condemn the abuse, and I have to say that every time we see these things take place on social media, we assume that we have hit um, the rock bottom, and then along comes someone who can plumb new depths. I think. The cyber flashing incident last night at an online vigil um, for Ashleen um, was just the lowest of the low. That is an individual who I think the authorities need to take um, particular interest in um, and deal with robustly. There were children at that vigil who will have witnessed that incident. There were vulnerable women who have been previously abused who were at that vigil and will have been traumatised by that incident. And there will be many others who were absolutely horrified um, and also traumatised um, by what happened last night. It calls into question, Mr Speaker, uh, what goes through some people's minds um, in terms of how they actually operate. But it is interesting that so often, whatever is going through their minds, what we end up experiencing is misogyny, sexism and hate directed towards women. Are you going to call John Blair? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I start with associating myself with comments made by the original questioner, Mark Durkin, and the Minister herself in relation to the uh, vile online abuse towards Diane Dodds and those mourning Ashleen Murphy? Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister if she agrees that an interagency approach on this matter of online abuse is vital and that uh, people right across public service, but in particular those involved in education, youth service, Local councils and PCSPs have a very important role to play in engagement with the department and the police, and of course, online service providers also. I think it is the only way forward, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> there are a number of elements to this. I think, first of all, there is the issue um, as to how we help people to protect themselves from online abuse and to deal with that. Um, and too often, we focus solely on that element. But there is also how we deal with online abuse perpetrators. And I think that unless people are made amenable to the courts and before the law, we will not see a change in direction. And I think thirdly, it is about those who platform that abuse. If this abuse was being published in a newspaper, if it was being published in a magazine, the publisher would be held accountable. I see no difference between that and Facebook and Twitter, particularly given the sophistication of their algorithm, algorithms. The fact that they know the age, of the, the age profile of the people they're dealing with and target ads at them based on things that they've shown previous interest in, for example, shows the complexity of the algorithms they have. The idea that they haven't the capability to, to actually sift out much of this abuse before it ever appears on their platform, to me, is just inconceivable and I think more needs to be done across the board in order to protect everyone from online abuse. Moving on, I call Steve Egan. Uh, question number two, please. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions two and four together. In doing so, I want to begin by paying tribute to the staff of the Northern Ireland Prison Service. They have shown determination, courage and resilience as key workers during the pandemic. Like every other frontline organisation, the Prison Service has seen the impact of COVID-19 and the Omicron variant upon staff availability. In December 2021, 90 Prison Service members tested positive for, uh, positive for and at one stage, 14.6% of operational staff were absent due to COVID-19. However, that position has significantly improved during January and last week, less than 5% of staff were absent for COVID-19 related reasons. Since the beginning of the pandemic, prison service have had thorough and comprehensive arrangements in place to monitor the impact of COVID-19 and respond appropriately. Northern Ireland Prison Service headquarters and the governor of each prison establishment has been reviewing daily the availability of staff um, and governors and their teams have been required to dynamically adjust the regime that can be delivered for people in our care, focusing on safe, decent and secure custody. This has resulted in the imposition of some restrictions on the prison population, particularly in evenings and at weekends. These have been kept to an absolute minimum. 
Prison services continue to focus on ensuring that healthy regimes can be offered on landings and the prisoners do not spend lengthy periods locked in their cells. The provision of virtual visits has also been a priority. To deliver those priorities means redeploying staff on a daily basis. And I'm grateful to staff for the flexibility they've demonstrated in what are very challenging circumstances. Northern Ireland Prison Services Executive Forum, the meeting where NIP senior uh, management team, including governors, discussed COVID-19 uh, contingency arrangements, has met most recently on Friday the 7th of January to discuss the challenges presented by and the response to the Omicron variant. Throughout the pandemic, the prison service has been guided in its approach by advice from the Public Health Agency and the decisions taken by executive for the community. Northern Ireland Prison Service stand ready to begin relaxing the measures introduced in response to Omicron as soon as it is safe to do so. Since the beginning of December the 9th, individuals have, on committal to prison, tested, sorry, since the beginning of December, nine individuals have, on committal to prison, tested positive for COVID-19. No prisoners in the general population have tested positive. Supplementary, Steve Egan. May I thank, indeed, may I thank the Minister for a very comprehensive answer. Uh, in comparison with the Northern Ireland Prison Service, has the Minister been able to do a comparison with the impact of Omicron and indeed other forms of COVID along with the PSNI? And has there been any lessons identified about how, bearing in mind we're probably going to have to deal with future pandemics, how we can uh, support these key staff? And are there any other further lessons we could also pass on maybe to the probation service as well? I think there have been pressures right across the justice system. Obviously, I'm not responsible um, for policing um, and in terms of the deployment of staff, but I'm aware that at the beginning of December, the Chief Constable um, moved to 12-hour shifts in order to ensure that any impact on policing would be minimal um, and that there would be full cover where required. And we discussed all of those um, issues at our regular meetings. Again, similarly with probation, probation has been affected, of course, not just in terms of staffing, but also um, in terms of the logistics of being able to follow up with the people um, who are their clients in terms of their support. Um, and they have had to find new ways of working, innovative and creative ways of doing so. Flexibility that staff across the justice system um, have shown in responding to this, I, I think has been incredible. However, there are always lessons that can be learned. I think the key one is that we need to make sure um, that we keep Omicron and any variant of COVID out of our prisons in as far as is possible, because that will keep both our prison officers safe, but also those in the prison population. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, uh, can I call you on with the indulgence of the speaker on, on the subject of prisons? Can I pay tribute to Father Michael Bingham from Portadown, who passed away over the weekend and whose funeral is occurring around now, who's not only pastored to the people of Drum Creek Parish in Portadown, but also to many prisoners in jails and to their families. Uh, and it would be a huge loss to the wider community and, and those prisoners as well. But I thank the Minister for her, her answer thus far. Minister, what, what measures have been put in place to mitigate against the inability during the, the, the COVID crisis for face-to-face -face visits for prisoners? What support has been put in place for the prisoners and their families? Well, there are a number of issues that we have dealt with in terms of, first of all, the, the ability to have virtual visits. Also, initially, prisoners were given additional time and access to phones so that they were able to phone um, more rapidly. And of course, um, in terms of our partner organisations, there has been intensive work done by those who support families outside of prison um, to ensure that the family's um, needs are, are addressed. We, didn't, we did reintroduce, as you know, face-to-face -face visiting. The uptake was relatively low in comparison um, to, to virtual visits, but we did introduce that for a period and unfortunately had to suspend it um, just before Christmas. But we hope to reintroduce face-to-face -face visiting again as soon as possible because we recognise uh, that good quality connections uh, with families is part of the rehabilitation process for prisoners, but it's also crucially important um, to families as well, and it's something that we don't want to suspend for any longer than is absolutely necessary. Can you call Mr. Story? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for the answers thus far, and also the information that she has provided to the Committee in relation to the measures that have to be taken in these circumstances and commend the prison service for the way in which they have uh, sought to deal with very challenging uh, situation. But can the Minister give an assurance to, to the House that the budgetary pressure that is faced by the prison service 
will be addressed in a way that ensures that they have all the resources, not only in terms of this uh, crisis, but dealing with the prison service in general will be seriously looked at because we all have concerns about the budget as it currently stands, particularly in relation to the Northern Ireland Prison Service. Well, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Speaker, I cannot give an assurance that there will be no impact on the prison service or indeed on the PSNI from the current budget settlement that is out for consultation. It would be foolhardy of me to do so because unless there is a significant step change in the draft budget, um, that will not be possible to secure. Um, it is not just about a 2% cut, which many people may, would be able, may well say, well, any department should be able um, to absorb that. But it is about a 2% cut coming on top of a 9% cut since devolution and on top of the additional responsibilities which have been placed um, on the department over the last two years through legislation which has gone through the committee and through the demands of the justice system in terms of more proactive um, engagement um, and more work to try to prevent offending. And so it would be impossible to say at this stage because I have been very clear in saying that I believe that the budget as it stands will do direct harm um, to the justice system. So it is impossible um, for me to give the member that reassurance, but I can give him the reassurance that we will, of course, take our legal duty um, to ensure that prisons are safe, both for those who work in them and those who are residing in them, um, very seriously as we look at the budget. However, it is undoubtedly the case that in ensuring that the prisons are safe, it may nevertheless lead to a reduction in the rehabilitative work that up until now our prison officers have been engaged in. I think that would be a real shame. Call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. <clears throat> can I ask the Minister to clarify that prisoners can and do have access to books and magazines sent into them by family or friends, and that no change to this practice has been made in the last year to deal with the pandemic? Prisoners do have access um, to books and to magazines that have been sent in. There have been restrictions in terms um, of <clears throat> the, the need to ensure that any packages that are sent into prisoners um, are, are properly um, appraised to ensure that they are not um, a source of transmission. Um, but there has been no change to the overall policy in terms of what books and materials um, prisoners are able to access within the prison system. And there is an established route for people who wish um, to access books, whether that be through the library service um, within the prison or whether it be through books, that, um, magazines and materials that are sent from home as part of their care packages um, to be able to do that. And that system has not changed, though there may have been some delays in delivery. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Justice Minister for an update on access to the Rehabilitation and Retraining Trust for former prison officers? Um, I thank the member for his question and for his general interest in this. I think in particular because of the challenging work environment, past and present, I commissioned and published two reports in 2021 regarding support services for operational prison staff, including those who have left the service. It was recommended that the PRRT should provide a range of services to retired staff. This is open to former prison staff, irrespective of why they left the service. PRRT and NIPS have also met um, with relevant stakeholders in January to publicise the available services ahead of the launch on the 1st of February. And we continue to work towards the additional measures within that report to deal with those who are currently serving within the prison service. Nicole Amishiran. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Question for three, Lida Hull. Question three, please. Jury trials deal with some of the most serious and sensitive cases in the justice system, and it is vitally important that justice is dealt with in a timely way, as this has an impact on the victims and witnesses of crime, as well as defendants. Jury service is a civic duty placed on members of society and is an essential part of the justice process. Some workers are excused or exempted from jury service because of the nature of their jobs. However, it is vitally important that juries continue to reflect the wider population. Even if it were appropriate, a change to the current exemption criteria would require an amendment to primary legislation, and clearly this is not a practical consideration at this stage. Jury officers and courts can be expected to sympathetically consider requests for excusal or deferral from key workers and others during the current pandemic. The number of people called for jury service this year was increased from approximately 34,700 to approximately 40,300 to deal with the anticipated greater number of applications for excusal or deferral. For those members of the public who must attend court, the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service in consultation with the Public Health Agency 
has implemented a range of measures designed to protect all court users and mitigate against the risk of COVID-19. The details of relevant COVID risk assessments and court user guides are made available to jurors in advance of attendance. Um, and thank to the Minister for her answer and I take on board what the Minister is saying in terms of the, 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 the importance of justice being delivered and the fact that primary legislation is required but I would ask that and notwithstanding that there is a backlog of court cases that need to be dealt with we have got severe labour shortages both due to the Omicron uh, variant and also to complications with Brexit that have seen several industries struggling and would the Minister consider some sort of a workaround to see if there could be a balance to be struck to allow uh, people to be exempt when they need to be for their work? Well, excusal as of right for key workers would require an amendment to primary legislation, so it isn't a practicable consideration. However, as I have said, jury officers and courts can be expected to sympathetically consider requests for excusal or deferral from key workers during the current pandemic. If people are able to provide them with evidence um, of particular pressures in their workplace, um, that is something on which I think they would look favourably. Call Justin McNulty. Gurmai Yogic, Ciarán Corla, thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Can the Minister confirm if the potential deficit in jury numbers um, due to co the Omicron variant has the potential to further delay cases being heard? At this point in time, <clears throat> as I indicated, um, what we're actually doing is calling additional jurors um, to come for jury service in the expectation that more will seek um, to have their jury service deferred. And so we have not had a problem in terms of being able to fill jury places in order for trials to commence. The member may be aware, of course, um, that the Office of the Lord Chief, uh, Lady Chief Justice um, indicated that it would be unwise um, over the last couple of weeks while the pandemic was at its peak um, for people to start trials which were likely to run to multiple defendants or indeed over multiple weeks or into months, as it may be difficult to be certain that none of the jurors and indeed none of the participants in the case more widely um, would be subject to COVID-19, which could disrupt the trial. So for that reason, shorter jury trials have been scheduled um, over the last number of weeks. And it is a matter always for the Office of the Lord Chief Justice to make those scheduling decisions. Um, but it's clear from what she has said that that will be kept under review in order that there is no increased delay in terms of the court system. The biggest threat at the moment in terms of recovery of the court system is lack of investment um, in terms of next year's budget, because obviously recovery will not be completed in this year, and yet there is nothing in next year's draft budget um, that will allow for further uh, recovery in courts. Nicole Liz Kimmins. Question number five, please. I previously advised ministers during justice questions on the 2nd of December that I had written to the Education Minister Michelle McElveen in early July 2021 seeking a meeting to discuss what steps were being taken by her department to improve relationship and sexuality education or RSE provision. I issued two further reminders on the 11th of October and 11th of November but still await a response. My request to meet with Minister McElveen followed commitments made in March last year by her predecessor Peter Weir MLA that his department would lead cross-sectoral work to review RSE provision, including reviewing the minimum content order in relation to RSE. Following this commitment, my department organised a series of workshops to allow stakeholders to put their views directly to the Department of Education officials on how they believe RSE provision can be improved. Participants in those workshops also identified gaps in the current minimum content order and made suggestions about elements of RSE they felt should be made a mandatory part of the curriculum for all schools. While I wait the opportunity to meet with Minister McElveen to discuss the progress made by her department since those workshops, my own department continues to work in other ways to increase awareness of serious sexual offences and to challenge rape myths. In the autumn, my department ran a public survey aimed at identifying the rape myths most prevalent in society. The survey closed on the 15th of November, with over 2,400 responses received. These results, along with ongoing workshops to gather the views of children and of people with learning disabilities, will inform the development of phased strategic communications to challenge the most commonly held rape myths. As part of this, my department has also supported the PSNI with their campaign entitled You Will Be Supported, which launched on the 16th of December. This campaign is particularly relevant to marginalised communities, but inform includes information for the whole community on subjects such as consent, 
the importance of reporting sexual crime and where help and support can be found. Supplementary Liz Kimmins. Very well. I thank the Minister for answering. It is very disappointing to hear that there has been no response to date, particularly something so important. Uh, we all know the importance of fully implementing the recommendations of the Gillen Review, and therefore would ask the Minister, would you agree that the recommendations on relationships and sexuality education carry particular significance in terms of preventing sexual abuse? And would you agree that it's important that engagement happens between yourself and the, the Education Minister in terms of how these will be implemented at the, the earliest uh, possible time? Thank you. I absolutely concur. I mean, this, <clears throat> this is a complex and a sensitive subject, and there are a wide range of strongly held political, religious and cultural views that need to be heard as part of this discussion. But it is a discussion that has to take place if we are to educate our young people in a way um, that is fact-based, that is non-judgmental, um, and that provides them and equips them um, for later life in terms of issues around consent, around rape, um, and around what a healthy relationship looks like. We would all wish that this is something we could simply leave to parents. Perhaps that's how people see this in many cases. But we know that not every child has an ideal role model to follow in terms of what a healthy relationship looks like. They may not get the right messages um, either from their peer group um, or from those around them. And young people themselves have made it clear that they want better quality RSE education because they feel it is needed. We want to ensure that we raise young people who are respectful of each other, who respect the understanding of consent, um, and who are able to form healthy relationships and ones that do not cause them harm and trauma. And the only way we can do that the only way we can keep our young people safe is to make sure that every young person has access to that information through school. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is indeed profoundly concerning and extremely frustrating to hear that the Education Minister has not even responded to correspondence from the Justice Minister on RSE. Um, I last raised this matter with the Education Minister further to the murder of Sarah Everard. And we stand here today further to another heinous act of violence against a woman in our community. Is there anything more the Department of Justice can do to activate the Minister for Education on the RSE reform that is needed to ensure a contribution to the safety of women and girls in our community? Um, I thank the member for his question. Um, and of course, um, we will continue um, to do what we can in terms of speaking to the wider community. But we cannot um, impose duties on the Department of Education. However, I would point out that the Gillen Review is not just a matter for the Department of Justice. The Gillen Review is a policy direction that has been set by the executive as a whole, and therefore it would be expected that all ministers um, are, are participating fully in the delivery of the outcomes of the Gillen Review. And it was very clear. Um, in terms of that review, that the development of quality and consistent RSE was a key component of tackling many of the issues that our society faces. Well, Paul Frew, you probably won't get a supplementary. As Justice Minister, along with my executive colleagues, I continue to fully participate in discussions on the public health situation. It is not my job as Justice Minister to assess the decision-making of the Executive and report on it to this Assembly. I supported the Executive's autumn and winter contingency plan, including the most recent measures agreed by the Executive on the 22nd of December. I hope these additional measures will curtail the current rate of transmission of the Omicron variant. I want to acknowledge the dreadful impact that crimes such as rape or assault can have on victims. And I remain committed to doing all I can to support victims and to protect them from being re-traumatised. This includes legislative change as well as additional support services. In relation to the changes regarding face coverings and proof of exemption, at the time of introduction I raised the potential impact of this change on those with hidden disabilities or sensory anxiety or trauma related issues with executive colleagues to ensure their needs are considered in implementation and that any proof protects their privacy including the reason for that exemption. The grace period for proving an exemption on medical grounds has been extended from the intended introduction on January 7 to allow further work on logistical issues involving, involved in obtaining suitable proof of exemption, including engagement with relevant groups. This policy is still under active consideration by the Executive. 
the legal requirement to wear a face covering in public indoor spaces remains unchanged. Retail premises must also take reasonable measures to ensure that those in shops comply with the duty to wear a face covering. Wearing a face covering, wearing a face covering by everyone who can do so is a vital measure in preventing the spread of COVID. And that ends the period for a list of questions, members. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Paul Frew. A twist of fate, I get my supplementary. So thank you very much. <laughs> can, can I ask the minister? I thank the minister for her the, her answers, uh, and also to put on record my appreciation of her, because she raised issues. I know she raised issues at the executive, along with my colleagues, around the the matter about face masks and rape victims and domestic abuse and, and trauma victims. But can I ask the Minister, how can we stop and prevent mistakes like this happening in the future when it comes to these emergency regulations? And how does it sit compatible with the Executive's uh, principles, given we've had the Gillen Review recommendations, which states that people should be believed? Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I am not here to deliver a verdict on the decision-making processes in the executive, and actually it would be inappropriate, I think, for me as Justice Minister to place myself as judge and jury over that process. There are a range of measures in place, um, and the issue at this point was the number of people who were abusing the self-certification option in terms of wearing face coverings, those who could but would not wear face coverings. Um, the result of that was, for example, people going online, ordering sunflower lanyards, which have been hugely helpful to those who have hidden disabilities or trauma, um, and abusing that system for their own purposes. It was a recommendation of the Department of Health that we would make this compulsory in order that it could be enforced. Because while self-certification is in place, it is incredibly difficult to foresee how such a measure can be enforced. And I have been very open about that in saying that I don't believe that racking up large numbers of FPNs should be the intention of the policy or the direction of travel. It should be to encourage and facilitate those who will wear a mask to do so and encourage those who are reluctant um, to reconsider. I still believe that that is the best way forward. Um, we were, of course, advised that it would be possible for people um, to receive notification of an exemption uh, that would allow them to do so uh, without any difficulty. Therefore, the policy was not to be enforced until the 7th of January, and that was to allow that, that policy to come into effect. When it became transparently clear that that was not going to be the case, I think the executive did the right thing in terms of suspending um, that particular part of the policy. But I would encourage everyone who can wear a mask to wear a mask. When you do so, you are protecting yourself and, crucially, you are protecting others, particularly those who, for whatever reason, cannot wear a mask. Supplementary, Paul Frew. I thank the Minister for that, uh, and I think that that will provide reassurance to many people who simply cannot wear a mask. There are many people who do not wear masks for other reasons, and they should. It is the law. Uh, but there are so many who cannot because of uh, trauma that they have suffered. Uh, again, I repeat the question, what can be done, Minister, to ensure that emergency legislation like this doesn't make mistakes like this in the future, an executive of which she's part of? Well, again, I point out that I don't think it was a mistake, uh, Mr Speaker. We proceeded on the basis of the information that we had, and it is right, I think, for any government when that information changes to be willing to reconsider its position. And that is exactly what happened uh, with respect to the introduction on the 7th of January. This remains under active consideration by the executive. In the meantime, it remains the law that in certain places people are expected to wear a mask. That is the law. Um, and people ought to do so. And the executive will work through the detail of those who are currently able um, to self-exempt. Um, in order to see if there is a more streamlined way in which we can provide them with the protection they need without exposing um, the details of their, person, of their personal issues um, to members of the public, um, but also in a way that does not allow others who would seek to abuse the system that was already in place any further. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, the UK's uh, Home Secretary recently announced that the UK government's pardons and disregards scheme will be expanded to include any repealed or abolished civilian or military offence that was opposed, uh, imposed on someone 
purely due to consensual uh, same-sex sexual activity. Could the Minister give her assessment of this change? Well, I think the first thing to say is that I welcome the change that has been announced, and I think it is something um, that is definitely an important step forward. The UK Government tabled the amendment in uh, the Policing, Crime and Sentencing and Courts Bill to extend the scope of its pardons and disregard scheme to historical offences that regulated same-sex activity. That would enable individuals to apply to the Secretary of State and to have convictions or cautions disregarded for any repealed or abolished sexual offence that either expressly regulated same-sex sexual activity or was used to regulate same-sex sexual activity. This includes any physical or affectionate activity characteristic of people involved in an intimate personal relationship. A disregarded conviction or caution will mean an automatic pardon. Those who have died prior to the amendment coming into force and within six months of its commencement will have a posthumous pardon. I am fully supportive of the policy intent behind that amendment, and I also considered whether we would be able to use that bill to introduce similar change here by means of a legislative consent motion, having been advised of the UK Government's intention in late November. However, given the need to identify what offences might potentially fall within the scope of an extended scheme and to make necessary adjustments to take account of Northern Ireland law, I concluded it would not have been feasible to secure legislative consent from the Executive and Justice Committee in the time available. I have instead asked my officials to undertake preparatory work on a review of our current scheme. This work will best determine what legislative changes are required to deliver the same outcome in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. I think it sends a very clear signal that the Minister and her Department are committed to ending the persecution and intolerance which occurred in the past. The LGBT community in Northern Ireland has travelled a long distance, not due to this Assembly, but despite this Assembly, and many advances have been achieved. Does the Minister agree with me that yet more uh, achievements need to be uh, uh, set out and also uh, delivered in the time ahead so we have a truly accepting and an equal society for LGBT people? I do, absolutely, Mr Speaker, and I think at times it is to the shame of this Assembly that we have been unable to deliver things that were within our gift and instead relied on the courts or Westminster to do so. But I am absolutely committed to doing all I can to create a welcoming and diverse society, including protections for LGBTQ plus people who sadly are still the victims of hate crime today. I am determined to make progress on the hate crime review, which Judge Marinan undertook, and will be consulting on proposals in that regard very soon. Nicole Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can't comprehend the evil that would take the life of such a life-giving young woman like Ashlyn Murphy. I can't fathom the grief that her loved ones will be experiencing at this time, and I extend the most heartfelt condolences I can to all of them. Can I ask the Justice Minister what actions are being taken and what actions can we take to eradicate such violence against women and girls in our community? Well, Mr Speaker, I think like everyone in this chamber, I was both sickened and horrified um, by the murder of Ashley Murphy. And I am thinking of those who loved her at this awful time. I'm also thinking of the shockingly high number of women who have been murdered over the last 12 months in Northern Ireland the latest being just before Christmas. It should be clear to us that urgent and radical action is required. I am determined to do everything I can as Justice Minister, but it cannot only be for justice. We must move upstream and do the preventative work that is required to stop women becoming victims of this abuse. On Monday of last week, I was pleased to jointly launch a call for views on two new strategies aimed at tackling domestic and sexual abuse and violence against women and girls. My department has already taken forward an ambitious agenda of activity and new laws to protect those most at risk of violence, including a new domestic abuse offence, a stalking bill, a justice, sexual offences and trafficking victims bill, and changes to implement recommendations from the Gillen Review on serious sexual offences. While this will ensure protection for all victims, it will disproportionately benefit women and girls due to the gendered nature of many of these offences and ensure that we are in a better place at the end of this mandate than we were at the beginning. However, Mr Speaker, it will require a whole executive, indeed a whole society effort, to ensure that we are in the position we would wish to be. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the response uh, we have received from the Justice Minister. Would the Justice Minister agree that 
education to eradicate misogyny and unhealthy attitudes towards women and girls is another key action to eradicate this abuse and ultimately violence to which they continue to be subjected? I do, Mr Speaker. I think that changing attitudes is a whole society response, and I think education has a huge part to play in terms of shaping attitudes, in terms of educating young people, in terms of giving young women the confidence to exercise um, their right to not consent to sexual activity or to report non-consensual sexual activity. Um, and I think it is hugely important um, as a society that we start with our young people, that we challenge our older people, and that we continue to change the law to protect victims. But most of all, we need to stop women becoming victims. Women are vulnerable in our society, not because women are vulnerable, but because there are predatory men um, who are out there making their lives a misery. We need to tackle the perpetrator behaviour, the culture, um, and the, the whole society change that is needed. And I believe that starting with our young people, educating them is one of the most important things we can do. I call Daglan McAleer. Gurmagat, and I too share the shock and revulsion at the murder of Aisling Murphy uh, last week and stood in, in solidarity at a vigil at the Donalu Centre in Oma last week, where I seen actually played as part of the Hultus Tour of Ireland in 2017. She was a very talented musician who played across Ireland and Britain. Uh, we know that the roots of these crimes is sexism and misogyny, and this is uh, crucial to tackling violence against women. Has the Ministry given any consideration or any work been carried out in making misogyn misogyny a new category of hate crime? I thank the member for his question, and it is very timely because, as I said earlier in response to another question, I intend um, shortly to go to consultation, um, the first stage consultation on the hate crime bill, which uh, we hope will be able to be um, proceeded with in the next mandate. And one of the questions on which we're seeking views in that consultation is specifically whether gender should be a protected characteristic or whether misogyny itself should be recognised as a hate crime. And so there will be an opportunity, I think, for all members of this House, but more importantly, for victims and for the wider community to have their say on that matter and feedback their views. It is a complex area of law, which is why we believe that it is important that we consult on that, along with other issues, um, at this early stage before we go into a more detailed consultation in the next mandate in the preparation for a bill to be brought forward um, to change the hate crime laws. Supplementary, Dagla Magalier. Uh, I thank the Minister for her response. And the Minister will appreciate that there has been a good progress made in terms of the Domestic Abuse Act, the Stalking Bill, and indeed the Gillen Review. The Minister will also appreciate that um, confidence amongst uh, young women in the justice system is an all time low, and that obviously impacts on reporting of, uh, you know, re reporting of crimes and indeed con conviction rates. What more does she think can be done to improve confidence in the justice system and drive these uh, reporting and conviction numbers up? Well, I think first and foremost, I don't accept that reporting um, and confidence in the justice system is at an all-time low with women and girls, because I think we have been in worse situations before, and actually the numbers of reports um, of crimes like this, whilst I suspect much lower than the actual prevalence of the crime, has risen and particularly will rise in response to the work that we do in terms of communication with the public and promoting um, the new offences. I think it is hugely important, however, that we never rest on our laurels because we recognise that even of those reported offences, the number that will make it to court and the number that will end in a conviction um, for those offences tends to be very low. There is also a high attrition rate, which is one of the reasons why in the Committal Reform Bill, which I brought through this House, I acted to abolish um, I acted to abolish the, the need for victims to give evidence and to face cross-examination more than once in any trial, because we know that that has an impact on victims of sexual, um, sexual offences in particular. Um, and also the work that we have done, for example, by providing senior uh, or, uh, sexual offences um, legal advisers um, additional support through victim support. Um, and also um, the work that we have done with remote evidence centres. But I agree with the member, there has been a lot of progress made. We continue to need to make more progress. And I think one of the things we can do as a society is make clear to young women who are subjected, whether to low-level sexual harassment or to serious sexual offending, that they should come forward, they should speak out, they will be believed, and more importantly, that the law is fit for purpose in terms of addressing it. The member's time is up. Members, please take your ease for a moment or two. We switch the table.
Okay, members. What are now, please? Okay, members. We now move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and I call Daglan McAleer. Question one. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I published the Future Agricultural Policy Framework Portfolio for Northern Ireland on the 21st of August 2021. It sets out a framework for future policy around four key outcomes develop following engagement with stakeholders, increasing productivity, environmental sustainability, improved resilience, and an effective functioning supply chain. I launched a consultation on the future agricultural policy proposals um, for Northern Ireland in December 2021 emerging from the already published Future Agriculture Framework portfolio. This consultation includes policy proposals in 14 work streams, eight primary work streams and six underpinning measures. And I encourage everyone to respond to this consultation and hope that with your support and input, we can take full advantage of this opportunity to develop a future sustainable agricultural industry. Supplementary Dagan Magalier. Um, I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, Minister, in your, um, the policy which you published there just before Christmas, you did made, you, the policy does recognise the underrepresentation of females, particularly at farm leadership level and farming in general, but the policy does not outline any schemes, proposals to how to redress this. Uh, will we be seeing any concrete proposals coming forward from the Department to help uh, redress this uh, historical imbalance? Well, first of all, the scheme is open to everyone, um, regardless of gender, and I recognise that women contribute greatly to the operation of family farms in Northern Ireland. And in recent years, there has been a significant shift uh, towards more females studying and working in agriculture across Northern Ireland. For example, over half of the higher education students now enrolled in CAFRI are female, which represents a significant and indeed a very welcome shift. And I'm cognizant of the need to encourage females in farming and to eliminate any of the perceived barriers to accessing the industry as a viable career path. And I note that the ERA Committee has undertaken a report on barriers for women in the agriculture sector. I look forward to the views of the Committee as to appropriate actions for government of industry itself to encourage female participation in the industry. There is a lot of opportunities. Uh, and in particular with the development of the chicken industry and other industries where um, a lot of it relies on, on great attention to detail, um, we are finding that, that women are excelling in agriculture and want to encourage more of it. I call Stephen Dunn. Two, Mr. Speaker. The bovine TB eradication strategy for Northern Ireland aims to reduce and eventually eradicate bovine TB by comprehensively addressing all of the recognised key factors contributing to the maintenance and spread of the disease. In consultation on the Department's proposed implementation and next steps of the Bovine Tuberculosis Eradication Strategy for Northern Ireland, closed on 10 September 2021. This sought views in the increased use of gamma testing, the testing of non-bovines, a preferred option for badger intervention and possible changes to compensation arrangements. Over 3,300 responses were received, highlighting the significant level of interest in the proposals. I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to respond. Since the consultation closed, responses have been analysed by my officials, and a summary has been published on my department's website. In addition to considering the consultation responses, my department is also currently progressing the necessary environmental assessments of the proposed new strategy. I expect this work to be completed shortly. I will be in a position to take final decisions on the way forward once the work is concluded, and I have had the opportunity to consider it in detail along with the responses to the consultation. Advice provided by my veterinary and policy officials, field evidence from other jurisdictions, and the comprehensive business case I expect to announce these decisions in February. Stephen Dunn, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer on this very important subject impacting many farmers right across Northern Ireland. Given the consultation responses, what is the Department planning to do in relation to the compensation for farmers? Well, there was a fairly um, hostile response to, to the proposals in terms of cutting compensation, and uh, we did seek views on, on, on specific questions and proposed compensation cap of £5,000 per bovine. Uh, removed for the purpose of disease control. 
and the proposed face reduction in compensation payments to 70% of, 75 per cent of each bovine's market value. Um, I suppose the, the, the response that has came back is, well, that would all be very good if, if we actually had a very low in, incidence um, of uh, bovine tuberculosis, and then we could ensure um, our, our, our livestock against that. But in the absence of actually achieving that, um, we, 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 we don't really want to go there. That, 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 that's a, a very quick summary of, of, of what the majority of responses were saying. Um, so <clears throat> the, the real focus that we have to have is on the eradication of bovine tuberculosis. And if people don't think that it's a serious issue, it is. It's costing this uh, assembly uh, 40 odd million pounds each year to deal with bovine tuberculosis. Uh, we have a reservoir of, of, of bovine tuberculosis, uh, both in uh, the bovine population and indeed in the wildlife population. And we need to eliminate both at the one time if we are to ensure that we can move forward and actually um, bring this disease down uh, to a much more acceptable level and, and, and lead to ultimately to the eradication of it here in Northern Ireland, as has happened in other places. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Minister, and I noted your reply to Mr Dunn in this supplementary question. Can I just ret return to that for a moment? Um, do you not think it's very unfair to the business that has already lost its greatest means of income and still has bills to pay and maybe repayments to the bank to actually annually cut the compensation that they're due? Well, obviously, this is a, a consultation, and, and I have outlined the response from industry on, on, on that consultation. And uh, you know, we're, we're in the business of, of putting out consultation um, because, on the one hand, uh, we have a public purse issue to, to address. Uh, on the other hand, we have an expectation of the industry. I suppose, <coughs> in the last um, year. We are looking at a, a herd incidence for the 12 months to uh, November 2021 of 8.93% incidence of bovine tuberculosis. So I am acutely aware that every bovine TB breakdown has an awful impact on those hard-working families. And, you know, the financial pressures thereafter um, can be considerable, um, can, can, can be life-changing in, in many respects. So all of these things will be taken into account in, in arriving at our final decision. I call Emma Sheeran. Yeah, and Minister, thanks for your answers thus far. Um, I wonder if you would consider, in, in order to help prevent the spread of, of TB, uh, establishing a capital grant uh, for farmers that would allow them to um, implement some enhanced biosecurity measures to prevent the spread of TB. Well, certainly we're looking at, at uh, grant aid and in fact my, my last meeting was with officials uh, in terms of the capital that has been offered from the department of finance and um, really how um, there is no real prospect of us doing what we need to do in reducing um, the, the, the carbon uh, that is actually in the agricultural sector uh, with what has been offered to us by finance uh, but uh, if the member has good contacts or um, we'd appreciate her support and actually getting uh, more finance to, to introduce such schemes for biosecurity and, and also uh, to make the impact upon uh, carbon reduction uh, that her party would really like to see but aren't, aren't, aren't uh, divvying up with the money uh, that they're holding in the Department of Finance to do. Call John Blair. Mr. Mr. Speaker, 481 respondents to the Department's consultation on this strategy disagreed with the DERA's preferred option for what, what they call wildlife intervention. What engagement has the Minister undertaken with these stakeholders since the consultation closed, um, and what consultation is planned if it has not uh, taken place already? Well, there was um, environmental and conservation bodies submitted 10 responses. There were three responses from veterinary bodies, 16 from individual vets. Um, of the remaining responses, one came from political parties, six from individual politicians. 15 from representatives of non bovine interests. And uh, then there were other individuals. Um, uh, so it, it was a huge response in that there were 3,300 responses. And uh, obviously, I can't meet every single respondent, but uh, we, we are receiving correspondence from people, uh, which we're dealing with. 
Um, and my door is always open uh, where I can to, to, to meet groups or, or, or bodies that act, act on behalf of people. Uh, so I've engaged quite extensively, for example, with one of the bodies, Ulster Wildlife Trust, um, over the course of the last year, and we've discussed badger, uh, the, the, the badger issue quite extensively um, <coughs> with them. And you know, I, I'm very happy to continue meeting groups uh, which have a, a relevant case to make that, that that isn't an issue. And I call Robbie Butler. Number three. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I wish to group questions 3, 9, 11 and 14 together. The avian influenza outbreak across the United Kingdom has been going on for 83 days now since the first confirmation in Worcestershire on the 26th of October 2021. In total now, there have been 81 cases of avian influenza confirmed across the UK. The breakdown is as follows. 68 cases in England, 5 in Scotland, 3 in Wales and 5 in Northern Ireland. The five confirmed cases in Northern Ireland were located at Ock and Cloy, Brookshane, Armagh, Coke and Ballanderry. Culling, disposal and preliminary cleansing and disinfection has been completed at all sites. As of today, there is one 10 km surveillance zone still in place around the Ballandary premises. This is due to be lifted on the 22nd of January. All other disease control zones enacted around the other uh, four affected premises have been lifted. In the Republic of Ireland, uh, avian influenza has been confirmed at six premises. The disease control zones for four of these cases extended into Northern Ireland and corresponding disease control zones were established here to limit the onward spread of disease. As of today, only one of these uh, disease control zones, which extended into parts of County Tyrone and County Armagh, are still in place. The confirmation of H5NI in Northern Ireland has a notable impact on our poultry industry, international trade and the wider economy. Poultry meat from the three kilometre restriction zone around an infected premises is excluded from the EU trade, and this poultry meat must be used in the domestic market only. And international trade is a reserved matter. My officials are working closely on a daily basis with DEFRA, market access colleagues to ensure trade with third countries is maintained where possible and to minimise the impact uh, on Great Britain and Northern Ireland. An avian influenza protection zone has been in place across Northern Ireland since November 17, 2021. The measures in the avian influenza protection zone include stringent man mandatory biosecurity measures to help prevent the spread of disease from wild birds or another source to poultry. In addition to the introduction of mandatory housing orders, effective on the 29th of November 2021, legally requires all birds to be housed or otherwise kept separate from wild birds, and similar measures, including housing orders, are also in place across Great Britain. My officials will continue to meet frequently with industry stakeholders to engage closely in regards to this outbreak. Robbie Butler, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer. I understand that there have been no outbreaks of avian influenza uh, since late December. Can you confirm that? And when uh, would you expect to make an announcement on the release of free range flocks to the outdoors again, conditional uh, that there would be no more outbreaks of avian flu? Um, I can confirm that uh, there have not been any outbreaks uh, since December, and that is something which is very welcome. And what we want to do is ensure that whatever steps that we take are, are appropriate and will ensure uh, that we do nothing to contribute to the further spread um, of this awful um, disease. Uh, the housing order will be kept under constant review. The decision to ease any restrictions will be determined uh, by the level of risk in conjunction with the industry and in collaboration with our counterparts in Great Britain uh, and the Republic of Ireland. Well, Paul Kedney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, I was wondering what strategies uh, do you have, or your department have, uh, to put in place to prevent high risks uh, of, of infection of avian flu uh, among commercial bird populations over the next 10 years? Well, we have um, a, a superb set of veterinary officials looking after this, um, who carry out. Uh, incredible work in, in terms of, of keeping this under control. And we're also look, working with, with people in the industry, the poultry industry, who are at the leading edge uh, in terms of anywhere um, in these islands. And therefore, we are, are quite well placed. We do have a high um, volume of, of poultry um, per, per square mile of population, and therefore it's more challenging for us. Um, but it also uh, it needs to, us to ensure uh, that we meet that challenge. And the best means of meeting that challenge is by the best uh, biosecurity measures possible, because we can never stop uh, wild birds um, bringing a disease in, because the birds are migratory and, and, and they will travel to here, and they're very welcome. Um, but unfortunately, some of them will carry disease. And therefore, 
Um, the only way of actually ensuring that that disease doesn't become a problem is that you keep uh, the disease outside of your premises, and therefore taking the, the appropriate biosecurity measures, uh, which are extremely stringent, um, but that our people have advised on, or our veterinary officials have advised on, is critically important. And that also applies to um, small flocks uh, where people are keeping birds for a hobby. They also need to um, apply those uh, biosecurity measures. I welcome the fact that there are around 600 people who uh, come on to a webinar uh, to hear what they needed to do. We did lose a flock, uh, which was a hobby flock, uh, to it, um, but it is a demonstration that this is not just about commercial poultry. It is about all poultry across Northern Ireland, and everyone should be registered uh, for the poultry they keep. I call John Stewart. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. It actually follows on from that point you just made. I am a proud owner of a rooster called Mr. Onions and Five Hens, and we will not go into their names at this stage. But I am just wondering um, what more precautions and measures people like myself and the many thousands of other backyard poultry owners should take in terms of preventing the spread of avian flu. And we have commented on one. Um, apart from getting registered, is there more that we can be doing? Well, absolutely. Uh, avoiding contact with <coughs> other birds. Um, ensuring that, that there is no contact with the, the faeces from other birds, uh, ensuring that vermin, uh, for example, um, cannot easily access your property, which is always attractive to them because there is always food there for the vermin, and uh, you know, ensuring that, that, that you are wearing clothing which um, can be properly washed uh, whenever you, 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 you go in and out of your, your, your birdhouse and so forth. Um, so there is um, <coughs> advice on the department's website, and I encourage the member, or indeed any other member of the public, uh, to look at that. If they are keepers of birds, uh, to help ensure that they can keep this uh, disease at bay. Oh, William Irwin. Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the minister for his response? After speaking to the owner of the AMA outbreak, uh, the former is very appreciative of the department's response and help. And advice. Uh, in relation to the outbreaks of some distance apart, has your department been able to identify the source of the, the spread? Yes, there's been a, a considerable amount of work done on that, and uh, there, there has been um, factors which would, would link uh, a number of the, the outbreaks, and you know, ongoing discussions are, are being had with the owners uh, in that respect. And, uh, that that's something which uh, we're not in a position to, to publish at this moment in time, but but will be at, at, at some point. Uh, but <clears throat> in respect of this, it's not just particularly for the commercial holders. It's not just what you do, um, because you can take all of the biosecurity measures, but someone else can cause a problem. Um, so it's the mealman uh, who's delivering the meal. It's the electrician. It's the plumber who are coming in to do uh, maintenance on the house. Um, and indeed, as I mentioned, the, the issue about rodents, ensuring that your house is, is, is um, rodent-proof uh, and, and you have taken all of the steps, Th these are all key measures uh, that need to happen. And, you know, you, you, for a lot of people, this is their bread and butter, this is their livelihood, so they need to protect that livelihood and ensure that nobody else jeopardises it on their behalf. Well, Colin Gillernew. I and thank the Minister for his answers. The Minister knows that there is a large and a very valuable uh, poultry industry in, in my constituency, and it is a worrying time. Minister, and you have mentioned some of the mitigations that are, that are being taken there. Are there any further mitigations that you can uh, advise the House and also in, uh, to deal with the impact of avian flu? And do these include trade restrictions or controls? Well, I did mention that those areas where um, we had to put the zones. Um, cause trade restrictions, and that causes harm to, to the industry. And uh, therefore, keeping this disease out is, is of critical importance. Um, good dis disinfect disinfection um, is also important. Um, so, ensuring that, that vehicles go through disinfectant uh, pools that, that have been created uh, is another ben benefit. And uh, for individuals, just ensuring that as they enter and leave houses, that they don't take the boots outside and um, inside. Uh, they have different boots for inside the house. Um, that the outside of the house is always kept, the, the, the concrete area is always kept um, well washed and so forth. 
and that there is no grain lice around the, the meal bins. Uh, these are all practical measures um, which <coughs> the industry knows very well, um, and they need to ensure that they implement it 100 per cent of the time. Um, because the only way that this infection is going to get into your house is if you uh, allow it to come into your house, uh, and therefore uh, a lot of it is in the hands of the people um, who are actually uh, looking after the, the, the flocks. And they call Mervyn's story. To number four, Mr. Speaker. The private members' climate change bill will have a very significant and detrimental impact on farmers across Northern Ireland, including in North Antrim. The UK Climate Change Committee have indicated that even a 50 per cent reduction in meat and dairy production in Northern Ireland would, get Northern Ar- would not get Northern Ireland to net zero by 2050, never mind by 2045. The Climate Change Committee have further highlighted in the strongest possible terms that a net zero target by 2050 or earlier for Northern Ireland is not credible, is morally wrong and could actually undermine the efforts to reduce emissions. It could also result in a shift of food production from Northern Ireland to other countries with a carbon footprint. Such production is much higher and therefore actually increase global emissions. KPMG also recently published a report on the economic impact assessment of the private members' climate change bill, which reaffirms the evidence presented by the Climate Change Committee and predicts that sector-level herd numbers would significantly fall with the greatest impact being felt in farms operating in less favoured areas. Overall, the report concludes the impact being beef, dairy and sheep herd numbers falling by 86 per cent and pig and poultry herd numbers falling by 11 per cent, which would represent a 54 per cent decrease in farm employment, with around 13,000 jobs lost in the primary area alone. Instead of imposing a target that is not credible, we need to ensure that we work collaboratively with the agri-food sector to achieve reductions in emissions through a balanced approach. The private members' bill could disengage the very people who are part of the solution to this issue, our farmers, and we must get full buy-in and face this challenge collectively. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I place on record my appreciation to the farmers in, in North Antrim and across Northern Ireland for the work that they do, and particularly also condemn the attack in a rural constituency and really did have an impact on our farming community yesterday in Loch Gael. But can the Minister give some light in terms of the, the comments of the TD and the Irish Republic, the spokesperson for Sinn Féin, who quite clearly uh, speaks with a different tongue uh, than his colleagues in this House, because he has clearly made it very, very plain that there is a serious lack of trust in the Green Party to deliver for either the environment or the rural communities in terms of the bill in that House. Will the Minister uh, recognise that to ensure the future of farming, that the climate change bill cannot proceed on the basis that it is currently framed? Well, this is something which has been debated considerably for uh, quite a period of time. And we have asked over and over and over again for the evidence of how this can be achieved without having the damaging impact upon uh, the agricultural sector uh, that the KPMG report has, has pointed out. Indeed, that the Climate Change Committee, um, who are world renowned expertise, uh, experts on the issue, um, have indicated it's going to have. But people just make bland um, statements without any factual, scientific uh, backing for those statements. And I suppose in truth, and, and the, the member serves a constituency where there is a large less favoured area. And the figure that I, I, I just quoted um, to, 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 to the Assembly on the impact that it would have on the less favoured area farms is incredible. We're looking at um, the, the beef, dairy and sheep herd numbers falling by 86 per cent and the biggest impact actually happening in the less favoured areas. So essentially, we have a party like I, I, I understand where the Green Party has come from. But it's, it's largely a Belfast-based party. It doesn't get that many votes from the agricultural sector. But we have a party which is in behind the Green Party on this particular issue, Sinn Féin, who are saying one thing in the south of Ireland and a different thing here in Northern Ireland. And they are abandoning the, le- the farmers who are living in the hills and the uplands of Northern Ireland, they are abandoning those farmers 
And I would call on Sinn Féin to reflect on what they're doing, on the damage that they're potentially doing to the agricultural industry by their backing of something which is no scientific grounds to back. I call Philip McGuigan. Uh, Ken Collier, and uh, I have no doubt the Minister knows fine well that the private members' bill has the support of all the parties in here, with the exception of, of the DUP, and that across this island, Sinn Féin uh, speak in one voice. Uh, the, minister will no, the Minister will no doubt remember uh, the extreme snowfall in the spring of 2013 that resulted uh, in the north, but particularly in my own constituency of North Antrim, being covered in snow with uh, drifts as high as 10 feet. This snowfall resulted in the death of 17,098 sheep and goats, as well as 535 cattle, as well as much structural damage to many farms, and cost the executive five million in compensation. Would the Minister agree that robust and ambitious legislation to, ad to address climate change and extreme weather events that may happen here in the north in the future is essential to protect uh, the future of agriculture and all the other sections of society in the north? Um, I recall that particular snow, snow experience. Um, I do not recall the one that took place, I think it was in 1961, that my mother and father talked about. Uh, but where they were locked in for three weeks in their own homes. So major snow events have taken place uh, for very many uh, decades uh, occasionally, uh, and thankfully um, this year we have avoided it thus far. Um, we've also, uh, he, he talks about the death of the 17,000 sheep. What, what Sinn Féin are actually standing over here is the death of 13,000 farms, and, and the, the people who actually work on those farms not being able to get a living in those farms. And the fact of life is that my constituents, my constituent farmers will feel it considerably less than the constituent farms for the member who has just spoken in North Antrim, because there are many more farms in the less favoured area, and those are the people who he is hurting most. And Sinn Féin are in a different place from the other parties, because the other parties backed my proposals uh, at, the, at the committee last week. Sinn Féin stood alone with the Green Party on this issue, and they are standing alone against the farming community with the Green Party on this issue now. Call Jim Osler. Is the Minister aware that shortly before Christmas, local farmers in North Antrim in the Loch Gale area invited MLAs to meet with them to discuss this issue, and that Mr McGuigan, who styles himself as a co-sponsor of the Green Bill, did not trouble himself to attend. If he had, he would have been asked this question by one of the farmers. Would you rather that your constituents buy high-quality North Antrim meat or meat produced from the cleared Amazon basin? What is the Minister's view about that? I think, first of all, whenever um, politicians run away from their constituents, is never a good sign. And um, the fact that I would probably be more welcome um, in the, amongst the farmers in Loch Gale uh, than Mr. McGuigan. In fact, possibly Mr. Allister might even be more welcome than, 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 than Mr. McGuigan. <laughs> amongst the farming community in Loch Gale, um, speaks volumes. Uh, but I did visit a farm uh, uh, in North Antrim with Mr. Story just last week, and that farm has been engaged in doing work on carbon. And that farm is able to demonstrate that the, the carbon that is involved in the production of the beef in that farm is one quarter of the carbon that is produced in both North America and South America on the big farms that are over there. But we have a policy. We, we, we're driving ahead with this policy because we think it's populist. Or some people think it's populist. And they're driving ahead with this policy, which will actually lead to more environmental damage. More environmental damage. But the issue of actually thinking this is popular and trendy with a particular voter base will go after it, irrespective of the consequences, is, a, is, is a, the approach being adopt, by, adopted by both the Green Party and the Sinn Féin? Pastor McLone, a very brief question and response from the Minister, McCoy, please. Yeah. Um, will, will the Minister accept that um, whichever climate change bill uh, is enacted in law, that will involve significant change and significant impact, not only just on agriculture, but on agri-food, on the economy widely, on, indeed on communities. So, as part of that, can the Minister give us some sort of insight as to what sort of just transition measures are being talked about that will be put in place, and if those will be done on a cross-departmental basis? 
And in terms of a just transition, um, our green growth policy is about taking actions, meaningful actions. And we had requested um, a substantial amount of money. I have to say the Department of Finance has fallen pitifully short of what is actually needed. So we can remove carbon, um, whether it be through anaerobic digestion, in terms of the, the food intake of animals, um, whether it be through the, the, the genetics and, 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 and breeding, which will ensure uh, that we can actually uh, produce less carbon. And what we have identified very, very clearly is the more efficient farming is, uh, the lower its carbon footprint. So we, we, we have proposals that are there, uh, and we have proposals that have been put to the Department of Finance uh, to financially support this. The Department of Finance needs to put its money where Sinn Féin's mouth is. They aren't supporting us to deliver 82 per cent, never mind 100 per cent, with the pitiful offer that has been made uh, to us to tackle climate change. And that ends the period for list of questions. Members, we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Question one has been withdrawn, and I now call Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Minister, and I thank you for your answers thus far. Could I ask the Minister to highlight your thoughts on how nutrient management on farms could be used to create energy, including biomethane? Thank you. It is a tremendous opportunity, and, and we already have quite a number of farms um, who are producing biomethane. Uh, that is currently being uh, translated into electricity. Um, we can go a step further, and that will involve significant investments. So I know of one company that invested $1.4 million in cleaning that up, uh, so it can be used as a fuel. Um, and that's, that's the, the nature of the costs that are involved. Uh, so turning this gas, um, which was once slurry, um, you remove the methane from the atmosphere, and then you replace a fossil fuel with the biomethane um, to run your vehicles, uh, to run your refrigeration, uh, to run your tractors, um, and to heat people's homes. So there's a win-win in this. It requires investment. There will be a lot of investment will come from the private, private sector but we need to back that up and be able to help the private sector to deliver this quickly, because it will happen much more slowly than by 2050 if we don't give them that support and therefore the necessity to get um, good uh, capital support for, for, from the Department of Finance to deliver on this is critical. Harry Harvey, supplementary. Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister, given the impact of COVID, on our supply chains, and in particular food production and the energy crisis it faces Northern Ireland citizens. Does this once again not highlight the important role farmers play in our society? Well, I think going forward, um, <coughs> food for, for, from Northern Ireland has demonstrated over and over and over again its quality, its provenance, its traceability. And we can demonstrate and we can actually, with investment, ensure that we have the highest environmental standards anywhere in the world as well. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to ensure that investment can take place and that we can say to people, um, if you wish to buy food um, from South America, from North America, from Australia, wherever it happens to be, you are not buying the best quality food in terms of all of those issues, in terms of provenance, uh, food quality, animal welfare, animal health, traceability, and importantly, the environment and air miles and, and, and food miles. And we can meet all of those requirements and supply to a local market, um, which is largely uh, within a few hours uh, from Northern Ireland. We can do that extremely well. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, could you provide the House and myself an update on the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, please? Yeah, I uh, thank the member for the question. And the Farm Business Improvement Scheme um, has been a huge success story thus far. I welcome the commitment um, of substantial investment uh, in our lar largest uh, manufacturing sector and the confidence it gives uh, in the sector. But what, what we want to ensure uh, in terms of it is that the investments that are made are meaningful investments that will deliver uh, for everything that is needed. So, for example, the investment in the uh, low emission spreading equipment uh, and covering of tanks, etc. That will achieve somewhere in the region of a 25 per cent reduction in the amount of ammonia. Now, for a number of years, we have been sitting with um, SES, for example, saying you can't build anything, but they haven't reduced uh, the amount of ammonia in the atmosphere by 1 per cent, because 
just just stopping and, and going into paralysis doesn't achieve anything. So, <coughs> investing in measures such as uh, as the one that we have um, with the low emission spreading equipment has made a real transformational difference. And importantly, in, in the year that is, with the price of fertilizer associated with the high oil prices, um, has helped ensure that farms will actually need to acquire uh, less fertilizer. Uh, because they will get extract more from their slurry, uh, and therefore there is a significant benefit uh, both to the environment and indeed to the farmer in such an investment. Supplementary, Keith Buchanan. Okay, uh, response so far, Minister. Um, obviously, this financial input is very welcome and welcome to you know where I live and my, part of my constituency. And most of it is actually rural. The question I have for you at a recent UFU event um, several weeks ago, I think most of the, most of the uh, parties here were represented at that, and it took a fair time to go to that and, and explain to farmers. But many farmers are, are lacking confidence and concerned that, on one hand, you know, you're given financial support out to buy equipment, which is, which is good and needed, but there's a, a sense of we don't know where we're going, and this climate change, this private member's climate bill is affecting their business, their mental health, and they don't know where their business is going. What would you say to those farmers, Minister? Well, I tend to agree because it doesn't matter what sector it is, um, you, need, you need some certainty going forward. And if you want to make investments, and particularly if that investment involves borrowed money, you absolutely want some certainty that uh, somebody's not going to pull the rug from under you uh, two or three years uh, into the scheme. So we need to ensure uh, that we can move forward in this House um, in a way which actually tackles the environmental issues and the environmental problems. That is absolutely critical that we do that, that we take those environmental issues head on. But so often there are lots of opportunities out there to actually turn those problems into an advantage. And that's what we need to be doing here in Northern Ireland. Instead of just closing down an industry, we should be looking at how do we deal with the problems that are emanating from that industry and turn those problems into an advantage. And that's why I talk about issues um, like the anaerobic digestion. Uh, we can in, in, engage in, in restoring peatlands, and, and we can engage in tree planting, and we can engage in, in hedgerow enhancement uh, and different grass management, which will use multi sward species and so forth. All of these things will help us to reduce our carbon footprint, but still allow us to produce high quality food here in Northern Ireland. And that's what's critical going forward. I don't really want to buy buying food from the Southern Hemisphere in years to come, and I don't really want to be eating plant-based food uh, which has been produced from insects. I'd much rather a steak. I call Deborah Erskine. The Minister will be aware of the importance of protecting wildlife in a beautiful constituency such as Vermana and South Throne. Therefore, what engagement has the Minister had with councils to promote and enhance better biodiversity across Northern Ireland? Well, biodiversity is absolutely critical. Um, and you know, people talk an awful lot about carbon but, but miss the issue about biodiversity. And there has been a lot of species loss um, over the course of, of the last number of decades. <clears throat> and that's something that we need to arrest and reverse. And certainly some of the work that we're doing um, on biodiversity with RSPB has ensured uh, that we um, have uh, more ground nesting birds. And I, I visited uh, Fermanagh, County Fermanagh, and was out on the locks uh, on the islands where, where that work has been done. And it has been uh, good quality work. It actually involved removing trees in some instances uh, so that predatory birds wouldn't be coming and taking the eggs of the ground nesting birds. And some people were objecting, but they didn't understand. Uh, the importance of the project uh, and the ability uh, to contribute to biodiversity uh, that was taking place uh, in, in your county. Uh, but there are so many opportunities that exist there. And in some respects, the, our future agricultural policy, um, enhancing uh, what we're doing with, with our hedgerows, um, creating more wildlife zones, uh, planting more trees, um, restoring more peatlands, all of these things will help with biodiversity. And it's important that we do work in, you know, in conjunction with our, our local councils and authorities uh, to ensure that that support comes from as wide an area as possible. I should say that um, some of the councils have put forward really uh, powerful proposals on tree planting. And I would hope that 
uh, maybe some others would maybe um, step up to the plate a bit more and ensure that they are taking the steps uh, to ensure that we have uh, much greater afforestation uh, across this little country than we currently have. Deborah Erskine, supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, could the Minister also detail what engagement he may have had with the Department for Communities to promote biodiversity in some of their green spaces, for example, uh, don't grow, let it mow, and wildflower meadows and housing estates, for example? Yes, um, very importantly, uh, we launched a pollinator scheme, and that pollinator scheme was taken up largely by community organisations. Uh, so it could have been sports clubs, for example, the GAA, it could have been local community associations. Uh, but there's a wide range of, of community organisations which embraced uh, the pollinator schemes. And as a consequence of that, uh, we actually, I think, doubled the amount of money that, that we had initially uh, set aside. So, so we're spending uh, well over a million pounds on the pollinator scheme because of the success of its uptake. I just want to say that um, the, the, the pollinators are incredibly important to us going forward, and therefore having schemes which will help ensure that, that there is um, great areas for the pollinators to actually thrive, um, dotted right across Northern Ireland, uh, will be something which will translate into real significant meaningful benefits, uh, which will be evidenced in the years to come. Call John Stewart. Mr. Speaker, um, Minister, the proposed increase in the plastic bag levy from five pence to twenty pence. Can you confirm if this will apply to meat packaging, and if so, what impact that will have potentially on food hygiene and on the end consumer? Um, previously, it hasn't applied to meat packaging because of the potential for um, perhaps blood, blood to, to, to run from the meat into other foods and, and, and um, cause, cause harm to the other foods, and, and that it hasn't been kept right. So. Um, all of these things uh, will, 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 will be, be looked at in terms of ensuring uh, that the public health um, issue uh, is not ignored. Uh, so the levy is there, and, and you know, I, I, I wish that people don't spend very much uh, per household on the levy. I, I wish that, that this levy leads to a massive reduction um, in the use of bags. We've already seen a massive reduction that has taken place thus far. That is stalled. I hope that this will give it the, the kickstart to see another significant uh, reduction in the use of these bags and consequently having a better environment to live in. Supplementary, John Stewart. Thanks for that, Mr. Yeah, I do agree. You know, it's undoubtedly had an impact, and some suggest potentially up to 90 per cent of plastic bags have been reduced as a result of that. I'm just wondering if you have a, a grasp of how much more of an impact the increase from five pence to 20 pence will make on plastic bag usage. Um, going forward, and also if you believe that we could use that money then to educate our young people through um, environmental schemes and such like, and what other aspects you see that additional funding going towards to educate people? As far as the, the plastic bag levy contributes and has been contributing uh, roughly you know, up to an, an over £5 million a year, it, it has reduced over the years because the number of bags has reduced, which is a positive thing. Uh, I would anticipate that there will be an uplift because I don't think that the reduction immediately um, will, 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 will be reflecting uh, the, the, the uplift in, in, in the levy, and therefore we will have more to offer. But that will go to organisations uh, which are dedicated uh, to making environmental improvements. And you know, every year we, we give out significant amounts of money um, to organisations who do real good, and these are for practical steps, not for lobbying work, but for practical steps. Uh, to ensure that they can make the environment a better place. And I appreciate uh, the work and support of all of the environmental NGOs in assisting us uh, to improve the environment that we live in. Kelly Armstrong, brief question and brief response from the Minister, please also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, in discussions with DARE officials over the environment strategy, what consideration did you give, if any, to the introduction of a bespoke agriculture bill for Northern Ireland? Um, obviously, we didn't have time to introduce a bespoke agricultural bill in, in this uh, mandate, um, but it is, will be for a future uh, mandate and a future minister uh, to make that decision going forward. But obviously, the future agricultural policies uh, that we are proposing uh, for support measures um, are very much bespoke, 
and leaving the European Union has give us, given us the opportunity to have a much more flexible, nimble um, approach to this. And uh, the time is up. Members, please take your raise for a moment or two. Thank you. Okay, members. Members, the next item on the order paper is the first stage Fair Employment School Teachers Bill. The next item of business is the introduction of the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill, and I call on Mr. Chris Little to move the first stage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Moved. Clerk, please read the long title. A bill to remove the exception for school teachers from the Fair Employment and Treatment, Northern Ireland Order 1998, and for connected purposes. And that constitutes the bill's first stage, and it shall now be printed. Thank you. Just take your ease for a moment, please. Okay, members, resume, resume the sitting. Consideration stage of the Integrated Education Bill, and I call Ms. Kelly Armstrong to move the bill. I move that the consideration stage of the Integrated Education Bill be now taken. The members will have a copy of the Marshall list of amendments detailing the order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping of amendments scheduled list or selected list. There are four groups of amendments, and we will debate the amendments in each turn in each group. Members will note that the Marshall list was reissued and holds the serial number ML2 in the bottom right corner, and it is marked in red print on the front page that is reissued. Members will have received both printed and electronic copies of the document, but additional printed copies are available in the rotunda if needed for the debate. <clears throat> in addition, the grouping list identifies Amendment 7 as an amendment to Amendment 6. Please note that it is, in fact, Amendment 6, which is an amendment to Amendment 5. This will be clearly identified at the point of decision-making in this bill. 
<coughs> the first debate will be on amendments 1 to 9, 15, 17, 24 to 26, 57, 61 to 71. An opposition to clause 12 stand part, which deal with definitions <coughs> and purpose. Within this group, amendment 6 is an amendment to amendment 5. The second debate will be on amendments 10 to 14, 16, 18 to 22, 31, 36, 39, 48, 58 to 60, and opposition to clauses 4 and 5 stand part, which deal with advice, guidance and support. The third debate will be on amendments 23, 27 to 30, 32 to 35, 37 and 38, 40 to 45, an opposition to clauses 6, 7, 8 and 9 stand part, which deal with strategy, implementation and reporting. In this group, Amendment 28 is an amendment to 27. The fourth debate will be on Amendments 46 and 47, 49 to 56, an opposition to clause 10 stand part, which deals with regulations. I would remind members intending to speak that during the debates on the fourth group of amendments, they should address all of the amendments in each group on which they wish to comment. Once the debate on each group is completed, any further amendments in the group will be moved formally as we go through the bill, and the question on each will be put without further debate. The questions on stand part will be taken at the appropriate points in the bill. If that's clear, we shall proceed. Okay, members, clear enough. And if you're not, it will become more clear as we move along. Okay, so we now come to the first group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 1, it will be convenient to debate Amendments 2 to 9, 15, 17, 24 to 26, 57, 61 to 71, and opposition to Clause 12 stand part. Within this group, Amendment 2 is mutually exclusive to Amendment 1. Amendments 3 and 4 are mutually exclusive to Amendments 1 and 2. Amendment 5 is mutually exclusive to Amendments 1 and 7. Amendment 6 is consequential to Amendment 5. Amendment 7 is mutually exclusive to Amendments 1 and 5. Amendment 8 is mutually exclusive to Amendment 1. Amendment 15 is mutually exclusive to Amendment 12. Amendment 25 is mutually exclusive to Amendment 24. And amendments 61 to 68 are consequential to amendment 2. And I call on Jim Allister to move amendment 1 and to address the other amendments in the group. Not move, Mr. Speaker, because I'm content with amendments 2 and 7 from the Minister. I call the Minister of Education, Ms. Michelle McElveen, to move Amendment 2 and to address the other amendments in Group 1. Minister. M moved. I support the education of our children together. I have stated this throughout the debate and discussion on this integrated education um, private members bill. What I do not support is poor legislation. What I do not support is legislating for one sector at the expense of others, whether intentionally or unintentionally. What I absolutely do not support is playing party politics with the law that will govern our education system. I'm not standing here today grandstanding or seeking headlines. I'm standing here on behalf of every child and parent in our education system today and for those who will come through our education system in the future. I've never said that the current system is perfect, but it does allow children to be educated in accordance with the wishes of their parents. The quality of education in our schools is of paramount importance in giving our children and young people the best start in life, and it's this, in this quality that drives parental preference rather than sectoral preference. I stand for all parents, regardless of background, and wish, and wish to reserve their right to express preferences for their children's education rather than force one sectoral solution, and that's my role as Minister of Education. At a time when... A, Thank, thank the Minister for giving way, and, and hopefully the, the questions can be good-natured throughout the debate today. Um, the, the, the Minister raised an important point that is often raised in this debate about um, education on the basis of the wishes of, of parents. Um, how does the Department 
uh, identify the wishes of parents and indeed the wishes of children and young people as well. And I do th I thank the, the member for his question, and, and certainly that will become clear as we go through the various aspects of this debate, particularly whenever we look to discuss um, the issue of parental preference. But really at a time when a full and independent review of education backed by the executive is underway and which will examine in a fulsome, objective manner how a single education system might be delivered here, the Integrated Education Bill is not required. Mr Dowd rightly asked at second stage debate why is there a necessity for the bill and I concur with those sentiments. The independent review remains, in my, review, my view, the appropriate means to effect meaningful change which can be agreeable across sectoral boundaries. We know the review will be challenging for everyone and this should give members of this House pause for thought in voting on this bill. The review will engage with and consult fully with the whole education system in a way no one can suggest the integrated education private members bill has. As members of this House will appreciate during the committee deliberations and in the preparation for consideration stage, particularly with the tabling of multiple amendments and set against the context of wide ranging education legislation, what we are considering today is complex and I would appreciate members' indulgence as I speak through the various groupings. Moves into any detail. I'm struck by the point she's just made to us about the fact that, as I understand it, New Decade New Approach, embraced by all the parties of the executive, endorsed an independent review. Therefore, surely what we have in this bill is an attempt to gazump that. Is that what it comes to? That was the, the, the point that I was making at second stage, and I felt that this was perhaps a little presumptuous, that we should actually be waiting for the, the review to conclude. Um, there's an investment of approximately £1.5 million in the review. Um, I understand that that is, is progressing well, and there has been wide-ranging consultation across all the sectors, and certainly there's a hope that that report will be made within 18 months. And at that point, there will be a number of recommendations which should then be acted upon as a consequence of that. And I do feel that that is the best place where we should be with regards to, um, to this piece of legislation. But alas, we are where we are. Um, and we're now at consideration stage of this bill. Um, and certainly, I'll take through, if members are content, um, my amendments at this point. Um, and obviously, I'll reflect on other comments as we move through each of the groupings. But our debate and the subsequent vote on Group 1 clauses and amendments will focus on definition and purpose. This group covers what will be included in clauses 1 and 2, the definition of integrated education and an integrated school, as well as the purpose of integrated education as described by the Bill. It covers amendments that range across clauses 3, 4, 6, 11, 12 and 13, with some amendments at this point more substantial than others. These clauses, as introduced, cover various issues and raise serious concerns in terms of how they were drafted. As introduced, the clauses lack legal clarity. These definitions, if not amended, will be open to misinterpretation and therefore result in legal challenge. Indeed, how the bill as a whole would work in practice and the gaps it contains in terms of operating alongside existing education law is a major concern. The bill is introduced to not create a level playing field, as has been claimed. To promote or support one sector, as defined in the bill, above the others is not acceptable to me as Minister of Education because I value all sectors equally. The bill as introduced will put education bodies in an impossible position by placing additional duties on them that will create conflict with their, their existing duties. There's a finite education budget which is already stretched. No one voting on this bill today should be under any illusion that if the bill is not amended appropriately, it will put further pressure on that budget. I will say that we have had the benefit of OLC expertise in relation to drafting throughout the bill. It was regretful that executive approval was only given on the 21st of December, and this presented a significant challenge to the professional drafters over the Christmas period. None of us here will have the same level of competence as OLC, and we should draw and take seriously the opportunity OLC drafting presents to emerge 
from the stage with a more workable piece of legislation than we start with. Whilst the bill sponsor may have stated at second stage debate that almost six years ago her bill had undergone a 12-week consultation during the 2016-17 mandate in the form of online surveys for adults and children. However, where was the specific consultation with schools? No one can legitimately argue that this bill does not have the potential to impact on schools from every sector, whether it intends to or not. Where is the awareness that the educational landscape might legitimately have changed, that new parents and children are now involved in the education system, that views may have changed in the intervening years until the bill was introduced in June 2021? Certainly planning structures, relationships and opportunities exist now that were not there in 2016-17. Were I, as an executive minister, to present a piece of legislation to this assembly based on an outdated and, in my view, limited in scope consultation exercise, I would, as I referred to at second stage debate, rightly expect to be laughed out of the chamber. Thank you, um, Minister. Um, I appreciate um, that, that you're trying to say that my consultation. However, um, we did have a committee stage, and the committee completed substantial consultation on this bill so there is up-to-date consultation available and you can read that in the the committee pack so it's not just myself who's consulted on this there is a committee that contained your own members of your party with you, Thank you. the office of the legislative council or olc as you will have heard referenced thank you, the minister for giving way. Thank you to the minister for giving way um, i sat through the consultation process um, in the committee. I think I probably attended every very long session of that consultation process. Many of those who um, came to present to the consultation process said that they were both on this side, I can speak for uh, many of the sectoral bodies, the controlled, the maintained. Um, they were surprised that the bill had been presented without um, further consultation than the original 2016-17 uh, uh, consultation exercise. Indeed, they were taken aback by that particular process. Um, and I suppose uh, the other uh, point I want to make, that actually uh, the committee process was in itself deeply flawed. And I um, put my concerns on the record there, where we received the legal advice on the bill on a Wednesday and were asked to make a formal consultation response on a Thursday. I do not consider that appropriate consultation. And I, and I thank the member for her, her intervention in relation to that. The Office of the Legislative Council, or OSC, as you will have heard referenced, are the professional drafters of legislation for departments in Northern Ireland. They are fully objective and separate from any party or specific department. The professional expertise in drafting law for the entire executive rests with OLC. They have no vested interest in policy, in this case in educational sector or school management type. They act as guardians of the statute book here, and when they draft legislation it is accurate to the highest degree. It is legislatively clear, it takes account of existing legislation, it removes the risk of unintended consequences. Every word is painstakingly poured over to ensure absolute accuracy. And I should like, as Minister of Education, to thank OLC for the hours of scrutiny, the days of analysis and the weeks of drafting since I was given the necessary executive approval to instruct them on the 21st of December 2021, which they have invested in the amendments table by me and my role as Minister. I can only urge you to seriously look upon these amendments drafted for me by OLC they represent this chamber's best chance to make an integrated education bill that is workable in its entirety and will not drive a coach and horses through the entire education system and the education budget. It would not have been my intention to propose any new legislation relating to one sector of education in advance of the outcome of the independent review. However, I have been left with no alternative to, but to bring forward amendments to mitigate the significant risks presented by the bill as it currently sits. As Education Minister and member of this Legislative Assembly, I could not stand back and allow a law to pass that held the potential to have much far-reaching consequences, not only for the here and now, but for future education budgets. 
I do believe that we have the opportunity today for all of us to demonstrate our support for integrated education in line with existing statutory duties that does not operate to the detriment of other sectors or with unfettered pressure on the public purse. The amendments that OLC has produced and which I and my role as Minister of Education for all children have tabled represent a legally accurate means of delivering the key elements described by stakeholders and the bill sponsor that they have stated need to be addressed. So turning to the definition of integrated education, I have heard the concerns about how the current definition of integrated education set out in Article 64 of the 1989 order, the Education Reform NI Order 1989, does not allow people other than those from a Protestant or Catholic back, Roman Catholic background to see themselves reflected or to sufficiently support how they designate in applying to an integrated school according to their fundamental beliefs. OLC has drafted an amendment to address this. The amendments I've tabled for Clause 1 provide for those of other religious beliefs and those of no religious belief to be able to designate as such when they apply to integrated schools. This definition is reflected through the associated amendments at Clause 12, which incorporate this amendment into the range of existing provisions in the 1989 Education Order and provides greater clarity in legal terms. It also addresses concerns expressed by a range of stakeholders throughout the process and which I share about any school deeming itself to meet the definition of an integrated school. It results in a, a more straightforward provision that meets the stated needs of the integrated education sector and avoids the current risk with the clause as introduced for challenges from other sectors. And while I appreciate the bill sponsor has also tabled an amendment that in effect seeks to clarify that existing schools must go through the transformation process. This relates to integrated status via the procedures which are set out in the 89 order. OLC relate the definition of an integrated school to the existing legislation clarifying what a grant maintained or controlled integrated school is under the 86 order. And I consider that the amendment that I've tabled is the best guarantee this assembly has of achieving absolute legal accuracy. The bill is introduced and the bill sponsors amendments to clause one retaining words and provisions that are simply not needed. What school from any sector does not provide education for a range of children? What school from any sector does not provide education for children from all socio and economic backgrounds? And what exactly is meant by those experiencing socio-economic deprivation and those not? What school from any sector does not teach children with different abilities? The problem with placing this wording in legislation is that it is open to interpretation and challenge. Legal advice has, for example, confirmed that retaining wording about different abilities opens up challenge to how an integrated post-primary school might operate, even in terms of streaming its classes. This cannot logically be the intention behind the bill, yet it is the reality of retaining the clause as introduced or amended by the bill sponsor. Turning to ethos, the bill sponsors amendments to clause one, subsection two, retain wording and provisions that are simply, again, not needed. In defining the ethos of an integrated school, wording is inconsistent and incongruent with existing legislation. Wording, again, is unnecessary, legislatively unclear, and again, open to challenge. The Education and Training Inspectorate has advised me that in its view, ethos changes, develops, is modified in line with the unique context of each school and the mix of people who make up the school community at any given time. A definition on the face of the bill could become restrictive as the definition cannot be readily changed to accommodate changes in society. Not placing this on the face of the bill keeps that work on ethos within the sector's control, for example, through NICE's work. And, I would be more, and it would be more appropriate and, in fact, educationally sound and I concur with the inspectorate's analysis on this. Other amendments have been offered to this clause, but again, I would urge, in order to achieve legal accuracy, to support the OLC drafted amendment, which put on the face of legislation that others are an explicit part of an integrated school, and vote for amendments 2, 7 and 8 to clause 1. Amendments 61 to 68 relating to Clause 12 bring the definitions set out at Amendment 2 into the relevant provisions of the 1989 order as advised by OLC. This means that subsections 3, B to E of Clause 1 as introduced and which you will see Amendment 8 takes out are not needed because specific articles are amended 
within Clause 12. Turning to General Duty, Clause 6, in relation to, the, to Clause 6, the concerns about unintended consequences for bodies such as CCMS, SIA, parts of the Education Authority, the Youth Council, which is not currently even operational, has been well expressed since second stage debate. Placing a statutory duty in relation to integrated education on top of the statutory duties these bodies were established and are funded to deliver is not good legislation. OLC has drafted an amendment, number 24, that clarifies the duties in Clause 6, which relate to the Department of Education. And again, I recognise that Amendments 25 and 26 have been tabled to Clause 6, which seek to mitigate the conflict of duty concern. But the clearest way to ensure this is to look to the drafting provided by OLC. And again, I urge you to support the amendment I've tabled, which provides clarity and which works alongside existing legislation. There is an associated amendment, number 70, to clause 13, which ensures that any references to education bodies only relates to the Department of Education or the Education Authority. No conflict of duties will therefore be placed on CCMS, SIA, or indeed the Youth Council if it were to become operational, if you support this amendment also. In relation to amendment 69, tabled by the Chair of the Education Committee, which takes out the amendment to the Shared Education Act in Clause 12 is introduced. I would support this. There is no legal impact or benefit to including that. I can only reiterate that Shared Education is a funded programme open to all schools in all sectors. Integrated education is a sector which forms part of the school's estate. Both, my, both, both may, of course, support the breaking down of community uh, barriers and the building of good relationships, but um, so to do many other schools um, from across every sector. Amendment 71 um, to Clause um, 13 has been drafted to ensure that the legal definitions in the 1986 order apply to the provisions of this bill. This includes parents and children who else should an education um, bill of any description be about. And again, I urge you to support this amendment. In conclusion, our job today is to piece together a legislative jigsaw that slots together to make workable legislation. Let us rely on the drafting expertise of OLC to ensure we deliver that. Thank you. The Minister. I just want to take the Minister back. She made a passing reference to where this uh, bill, if approved, would fit juxtaposition wise with existing arrangements. Tomorrow, as I recall, we are about to see the publication of strategic documents. How would this bill fit with that strategy in terms of future area planning, etc.? Um, I think it's probably at this point, um, if the members are content, I can come back to him on that specific point as to how that might relate specifically, depending, of course, how this, this bill is amended and the subsequent clause, clauses um, associated with that. I have concluded my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the chairperson of the Committee for Education, Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will speak initially as chairperson of the Education Committee and then as an Alliance MLA, in which capacity I am glad to support the passage of this integrated education bill proposed by Kelly Armstrong, MLA. During the committee stage of the integrated education bill, MLAs considered written evidence from 1,118 organisations and individuals. 523 of these responses were received via the Assembly Citizen Space online survey platform, 95% of which agreed with the policy objectives of the bill, 85% of which think the provision of the bill will be effective in achieving these policy objectives. The Education Committee also undertook 14 oral evidence sessions and held 17 formal meetings as part of a comprehensive and inclusive scrutiny process that engaged closely with a wide range of stakeholders, the bill proposer and the Department of Education. The Education Committee therefore allocated significant time and attention to the scrutiny of the Integrated Education Bill as MLAs will no doubt have learned from the Education Committee report on the bill. 
The range of stakeholders consulted and involved in both written and oral submissions was considerable. The Education Committee extended its call for evidence and the committee stage, which took place over approximately a five-month period to bring as much advice and perspective as possible to bear on this important scrutiny task. The subject of this group of amendments is the definition and purpose of the Bill. Given the range of views on the Education Committee, the Committee did not agree a position on these amendments. I will, however, speak to Education Committee Amendment 69. It was evident that the Bill sponsor aimed to retain and extend the existing definition of integrated education in a manner that reflects a changing society in Northern Ireland. Many stakeholders supported this change, but also sought assurance that any change would be consistent with the existing definition of integrated education, as per Section 64 of the Education Reform Northern Ireland Order 1989. The bill sponsor committed to clarifying this and has accordingly done so by way of amendment. The bill sponsor engaged with committee members on an alternative wording to Clause 7. When the Education Committee considered the bill clause by clause, it was aware that the sponsor intended to amend Clause 7, but that drafting had not yet been finalised. Accordingly, Amendment 69 is an Education Committee amendment consequential to the removal of Clause 7's presumption that every new school should be an integrated one, and I present that to the Assembly. Speaking in my capacity as Alliance Education Spokesperson, it is a privilege to support the passage of this Integrated Education Bill as proposed and amended in Group 1 by Alliance Integrated Education Spokesperson Kelly Armstrong, MLA. The Alliance vision for education is an integrated and sustainable system that delivers equal opportunity for all children to develop their unique personality, talent and ability together. The International Peace Accord, the Good Friday Belfast Agreement of 1998, stated clearly that integrated education is essential to reconciliation. The Fresh Start Panel Report on the disbandment of paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland recommended that the executive set and I quote, ambitious targets to measurably reduce segregation in education as quickly as possible. That was in 2016. A poll on education in 2018 found that good educational standards are the most important factor to many people when choosing a school, followed closely by a desire for children to be educated together. Two thirds of respondents supported their school officially becoming an integrated school, and the overall view, and again I quote, was that political leaders had done little or nothing to facilitate and encourage integrated education. Some 60% of respondents felt that politicians actually held up the accessibility of integrated education. The Ulster University Economic Policy Centre has also established that there is significant financial cost of separation and duplication in our education system which could be upwards of £90 million per year. Yet the Department of Education states that our education system is in financial crisis. In my own constituency of East Belfast, poll results have found that a majority of parents, approximately 76%, support their school becoming integrated. So in relation to Group 1 amendments, I support Kelly Armstrong's proposed definition of integrated education and will not be supporting the Education Minister's proposed narrowing of this definition. I am content to support Amendment 6 as it adds to the definition. I will also support the Education Minister's Amendment 24 as this will strengthen the requirement of the Education Department to take account of its duty on integrated education. I would really like and I hope that the Education Minister does return to how the Department of Education is currently encouraging and facilitating integrated education, how it is identifying, assessing and meeting the demand of parents and pupils for integrated education, uh, and perhaps it could also speak to what action it has taken to implement the independent review of educa integrated education, um, that which reported uh, as far ago as 2017. I think that the lack of information and the lack of action on all of those matters is in no small part the motive that has led Kelly Armstrong to propose specific legislation and action to meet 
the demand, the parental demand and the, the demand of children and young people that was heard quite clearly by the Education Committee throughout its committee stage for access to integrated education in Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Pat Sheehan. I've got to ask John Corla, uh, and I welcome the opportunity to speak at this consideration stage today. Um, I suppose everyone wants a change of one degree or another, uh, and much has changed uh, over the last hundred years here, uh, and that process of, of change has accelerated uh, since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. But there's still much to do. Sectarianism still exists here, uh, and it's a cancer within our society. Uh, and the, co the uh, continued segregation of our society is an obstacle, I believe, to ending and eradicating that sectarianism uh, that exists. And in the light of that, it's good to see positive approaches to uh, reducing se uh, uh, segregation. So if we take the new decade, new approach, it commits the executive to carrying out an external independent review of education provision with a focus on moving towards a single education system, uh, educating children and young people of different backgrounds together uh, in the classroom. And another example of that is the Struhl shared education model in OMA which will bring together pupils from six local schools with representation from the controlled, the maintained and the voluntary school sectors. Each school will retain their individuality and ethos while maximising the opportunities provided through collaboration and sharing. And this bill, I believe, if enacted, will further enhance the efforts to break down barriers and build a new society rooted in peace and inequality. Uh, of course, the segregation in our education system is not responsible for the divisions in our society. Consequently, a more integrated education system will not be a panacea for all of society's ills. However, it can be another building block in helping to heal the divisions that exist. And it's important to state here today that integrated education is not going to be forced on anyone. Parents and young people will still have a choice of what sector they wish to attend, uh, be it integrated, controlled, maintained, or Irish medium. Uh, all of those sectors are, are going to exist in the short to medium term. Uh, they're not going to disappear. And it's important, therefore, that other sectors are not disadvantaged uh, by this integrated education bill, but it is important to acknowledge the challenges that exist for the integrated uh, sector. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank the bill sponsor for her work in bringing this draft bill forward, uh, and, and thank her and her um, uh, uh, researcher and policy person, Fiona, uh, on the positive and constructive conversations that we have had throughout this process. Uh, Any time we have sought information uh, about the process of this bill, uh, the sponsor has been absolutely more than willing uh, to facilitate meetings and conversations around it. So um, I want to speak uh, in support of the bill sponsor's uh, amendment, amendment number five, and also in support of amendment number six and amendment 24, which I believe is the, uh, the minister's uh, amendment. Yes, uh, so we, we, one of the things about this process is that we have been faced with choices of a number of amendments uh, in regard to certain clauses. And uh, what we did was that we went through them all uh, and came down on the, on the one that we thought was most suitable. And in this case, the minister's uh, amendment uh, 24 to clause six is, is the best, I think. If that, 
If that uh, clause hadn't been amended, it was going to place a contradictory or a conflicting duty on CCMS, who have a statutory responsibility for their own sector. Uh, and, and another statutory responsibility would have been placed on them, and an onerous uh, responsibility placed on them uh, to also uh, uh, deal with the integrated sector. And, and that, was, uh, that was a mistake, I think, in the original drafting. And consequently to supporting uh, Amendment 24, we then also support uh, Amendments 70 and, and 71, um, which removes CCMS, SIA, and the NI Youth Council from the definition in uh, the education bodies. So, uh, while in our context here, integrated education has a particular definition, in, in terms of educating Catholics and Protestants together. Society is very different now from what it was previously, and I welcome the proposal to expand on the existing de definition with that increased level of diversity to reference and include those of different abilities and those of different uh, socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. Uh, encouraging greater diversity in our schools can only be a good thing as we move forward as a society. Uh, and uh, while, while I uh, welcome this bill, I'm not uncritical of the integrated sector. Uh, and, and the sponsor knows uh, that I have made criticisms both in this chamber uh, and my colleague, John O'Dowd, has always been critical. Um, and one of the fears uh, is that in the past, while the integrated sector certainly preached about cultural diversity within their schools. They haven't always practiced it. And I hope, you know, in our debate and discussion around this bill, that that will uh, have an impact uh, on, on those integrated schools uh, to ensure that there is proper cultural diversity, that the Irish identity is catered for uh, in schools. And I acknowledge, uh, willingly acknowledge, that many integrated schools already teach the Irish language, promote Gaelic games, uh, teach a different perspective from Irish history than would previously have been taught. Uh, and, and that's good progress, but more uh, still needs to be done. Um, and I'm particularly supportive of the part of Amendment 5, which talks about progressing an ethos of diversity, respect and understanding between those different groups of people. The, the key concern that comes through our constituency office doors in relation to integrated education is currently a frustration that that level of respect and understanding for the Irish identity isn't there. But we have the opportunity through this bill to address those concerns. And of course, one of the other uh, criticisms I have had of the integrated sector, and I hope that this bill is going to deal with that as well, uh, is the issue of some uh, integrated schools practicing academic selection, which I believe is contrary to the ethos of, of, of inclusiveness and diversity and creates another artificial barrier within our society. Uh, so I, I note the, the sponsor's uh, amendment to the definition of an integrated school, uh, and uh, I welcome the fact that have been able to take part in this debate. Uh, I don't in intend to speak at any length throughout it, uh, and I'll just finish on that point. Carmelga. I call Diane Dawes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, at this stage of the debate, as others have said, we are to focus on the purpose um, and the definitions to employ to define that purpose of uh, this integrated education bill. The bill is about the promotion of integrated education, and that's where it stops. The proposer of the bill, to be fair, has stated this quite clearly, and made no apology for that, and 
that is fine as well. That is completely her right and intent and purpose in the bill. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland will of course agree that the concept of our children growing up together, playing together, and being educated together is something that we can all support. Indeed, I am thankful that even I, back in the day, yes, and my children experienced education through attending a school within the voluntary grammar sector where everyone was welcomed, regardless of faith or background. I am also thankful that this can be experienced in other parts of the education system in Northern Ireland, including the special education sector. I also want to state, Mr Deputy Speaker, my support and appreciation for the many schools who cooperate with each other through their area learning community and with the shared experience uh, part of the curriculum. In Banbridge, for example, pitches at St Patrick's High School are regularly used by the whole community and subjects taught on a shared basis between them and the local controlled high school. Moving our society to a more inclusive basis through education is simply not the preserve of one sector alone. Indeed, I would like to see more sharing and learning by making use of the enormous resource that is indeed further education. But Mr Deputy Speaker, there have been many claims about this bill and its purpose. In the last few days, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party has declared that this bill will start the end of education apartheid in Northern Ireland. This bill will do no such thing. This bill and its purpose is to support the integrated sector and will, in its practical effect, add a further layer to education legislation in Northern Ireland. Legislation which will take precedence over already existing legislation. Already the Department of Education has a duty to encourage and facilitate the development of integrated education. It has of course the same duty towards the Irish medium sector. It does not have a similar duty towards the controlled or maintained sector. This bill would lift that duty further, creating a hierarchy within education where the controlled and maintained sectors would be at the bottom of the pile. Clearly, this bill will have a radical outworking on the education system in Northern Ireland. And such a change, as the Minister has already said, should be considered in a more holistic way and should be part of the independent review of education. I also want to put on record my real concern, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this bill has been allowed to proceed without an up-to-date consultation process. At the proposer's own admission, the forerunner to the current bill was consulted on in 2016-17. It is now 2022. No department would proceed with legislation of this import without at least, at the very least, updating their original consultation. Clause uh, 1 of the bill looks at the definition of integrated education and amendments 1 to 9 deal specifically with these. The original clause moves away from the current legal definition. Um, the original clause, as in the bill um, proposed, moves away from the uh, current legal definition of integrated education and widens it out with different social and economic criteria. However, this criteria could be applied to many schools. Figures provided to the Education Committee by the Control Sector Schools Council show that 61% of pupils in control schools are Protestant, 10% are Catholic, and 39.5% of all newcomer pupils in Northern Ireland, that is those people who come to settle in Northern Ireland, attend controlled schools. This sector will not benefit from any of the provisions in the bill that will be afforded to the integrated sector, yet it is perhaps more diverse and inclusive than many integrated schools. 
Yes, of course. Um, in, in the interest of good nature debate as well, would, would the member ag acknowledge that uh, a percentage of the controlled schools to which uh, are referred include controlled integrated schools? I do, of course, um, and I have something to say at that at a later stage, um, as the chair of the Education Committee will also know. Interestingly, and I think that the House should reflect on this as well, the figures given to us by the Control Sector Schools Council show that 28% of all controlled school pupils are entitled to free school meals. This is an area that this House should have real focus on. And this is the area where the real inequalities in education arise. How you access education um, and uh, how well you do in education uh, for those um, who rely on free school meals. Amendment 5, Clause 2A, is also quite problematic, I think. It states that an integrated school is one which intentionally supports, protects and improves uh, the ethos of diversity, respect and understanding between those of different cultures and religious beliefs and of none between those of different socio-economic backgrounds and between those of different abilities. While this bill deals with the integrated sector, how are these not also features of the controlled, maintained and voluntary grammar sector? I think to suggest otherwise is um, really a slight on those people who have taught for many years um, in all of these sectors. Amendments 24, 25 and 26 deal with Clause 6 of the Bill. In its original form, the Bill proposer advances the requirement that education bodies, even CCMS, would have to include the provision for integrated education when developing, adopting, implementing or revising policies, strategies and plans, or designing and delivering public services. Amendment 24 by the Minister clarifies this and would leave a general duty on the Department. But we do uh, in this House need uh, to take this amendment alongside Amendment 7, 70, which gives us a support of the definition of education bodies. And Mr Speaker, this is part of the core of my argument, that complex radical change as proposed in this bill is not and should not be taken forward by a private member's bill, but should be given the proper considered debate that it actually deserves. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I've said before, we all want to see a society that is more equitable, more inclusive, more respectful of diversity, one which values everyone no matter what their background, a truly settled and prosperous Northern Ireland <clears throat> will elevate these values. Will this be achieved by this bill? Is this a panacea to educational underachievement? Will this tackle the inequalities in how education is accessed for certain members of our society? Sadly, no. This bill will create a hierarchy of sectors within the education system in Northern Ireland. Over the period that this bill has been discussed, I have met with many of the different sectors within education, and there is profound disquiet that the definitions and purpose of the bill will lead to further inequality and unfairness. The ethos of the bill, inclusivity in education, um, can only, that, that inclusivity in education can only be delivered in an integrated sector, setting, is strongly contested by other sectors. In its evidence to the committee, CCMS noted that Catholic schools are rooted in their local communities and they are successful in building relationships and in interacting with other schools and sectors, and, 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 when I make the point, certainly, and businesses. I have already given the House figures around the diversity of the controlled sector. And indeed, as the chair of the Education Committee said, the control sector has the fastest growing number of integrated schools in Northern Ireland. 
and I will, of course, give way. If I could just ask the minister if she could point out where in the bill that it says that any other sector doesn't deliver diversity, because this is the bill about integrated education and is silent on other sectors. I think the implication um, in many cases, and when I talk to other sectoral bodies, that implication is clearly there, that the most meaningful way um, of delivering this is through um, only an integrated education. So this, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, in finishing, leads me to ask why are parties in this House not looking at these aspects of the bill? Why are the SDLP, Sinn Féin and the Ulster Unionists rushing to support, when I, when I make a point, um, to bill which will treat around 90% of our school population in a different and unequal way? Surely our young people deserve better. Um, I will give way, um, but I do want to make one final point. Um, I cannot help but smile at the irony of Sinn Féin through Pat Sheehan talking about people coming together um, and tackling segregation. He nearly needs to have a conversation with his party colleague from West Belfast who wants a segregated Irish language community at Queen's University with separate accommodation um, and separate um, facilities. That's not the way to encourage an inclusive Northern Ireland. And that's not the way to tackle sectarianism and division within our society. Sorry, I will of course give way. I thank the member for giving way. I just wanted to give the member an opportunity maybe to clarify and correct her uh, comments with regard to my leader with regards to the comments he made in the video. He did not talk about this integrated education bill, nor did he talk about integrated education. If you want to reflect on the, the video that you speak about. I think that the import of this, and, and I, I, I have listened to it very carefully, and I know the member um, will have uh, had a, maybe had a hand in, in providing some of the information for said uh, video. Um, but, <laughs> well, maybe it would have been more appropriate <laughs> if you had. Um, but I want very, very clearly to state that this bill, and to be fair to the proposer of the bill, and I accept it entirely, and those who support it, is only about one sector. And I worry intensely that this will set one sector up against another. And as we go through the amendments, I will, of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, make points where I think the bill um, sets very dangerous precedents and lays behind other sectors um, that are very important to parents and pupils and for the future of education in Northern Ireland. I leave it there, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, too, uh, as the uh, SDLP's education spokesperson, welcome the opportunity to speak uh, on uh, this bill today. And I, too, would like to add my appreciation to the sponsor and to uh, uh, her researchers who have obviously put a long uh, and a lot of work into this over the course of the last number of years, and also have been extremely patient in engaging with uh, parties on uh, this bill. I would share uh, the sentiments by Mr Sheehan there, uh, at all junctures where we needed clarification or where we sought reassurance or to express concern, the sponsor was more than willing to engage and consider uh, the concerns we have raised. Uh, I rise today to affirm the SDLP's long-held uh, support for integrated education. Uh, as a party from our foundation, uh, we have been committed to addressing all the inequalities and injustices faced by our very divided society. It must be said that one of the, those inequalities uh, is that in 2022, uh, in the first month of 2022, we find ourselves uh, in the position of educating our children according to their religion. Most people uh, that you would speak to in our society have said that they would love to see uh, children educated together uh, and that those barriers uh, are eroded. It is simply not acceptable that I, I will give way, yes. Thank you very much. Um, but the member not also agree that there is a right of parents to choose. And while many parents um, do say that they want 
um, children to be educated together. They make an active choice because of academic record or what for a Catholic maintained, a voluntary grammar or for some other part of education and that parental choice is an important part of our system. Absolutely, and, and I don't believe the bill does much in terms of uh, d disturbing that. After considerable uh, uh, time spent on this, uh, we are satisfied that it does not undo parental choice. And you know, like my, my parents at a very young age made a decision that I would attend the local school. It wasn't that I would attend the local school because I'm a Catholic or, or otherwise. I attended the local controlled school. Uh, and I'm a product of the controlled sector. I've grown up my entire life uh, knowing uh, John or Sarah as John or Sarah. It didn't matter what religion they came from. And I was lucky to attend a school that had naturally integrated children together uh, and, and, and who have grown together. And I've, I've seen the benefits of that. Uh, in the controlled sector uh, over many years. So I, I don't think this undoes uh, uh, the option of parental choice. At the end of the day, ch uh, parents will make uh, the best uh, decision in the interest of their uh, children, and that will not be in any way uh, de devalued by this uh, bill. But I do understand where the concern has been raised around it. Uh, I think that in 2022, it is simply not acceptable that our young people are still segregated according to their religion. And regardless of the debates and different views on this, uh, it is happening in uh, our society. Research has shown uh, that 70% of young people attend schools where there is less than one in 20, uh, one in 20 chance of meeting a peer from uh, the other main religious tradition. Um, how, how can we uh, say that we are properly preparing our young people to contribute to society as individuals and as a collective when this is indeed the case. And, you know, when I first joined the Assembly, uh, I uh, uh, attended a number of, of meetings through a peace and reconciliation uh, uh, events. And, and there was people uh, as, uh, at the age of my grandparents, my own parents, that uh, uh, up until more recent years had never engaged with someone from the opposite side of the community. And that was said for, uh, for, for both. So there, there is a, a real division in our society that does need to be uh, dealt with in a very positive way and more, in a very inclusive way. Um, it, you know, it's, it's especially absurd when, when, when we consider the deep groundswell of support that exists for inter integrated education that we haven't moved further much more quickly. It has been mentioned already that this was a key vision of the Good Friday Agreement that we would see our people live side by side, grow side by side, be educated side by side, and indeed create a truly shared future in a shared society. And, you know, uh, th this is not uh, 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 the silver uh, bullet to do that, but it certainly is a very solid starting point where we could truly move this place to affirming the, the solid view that integrating our, children, integrating our children together in education uh, will have ma massively positive effects uh, for the future of this place. We have seen remarkable progress over the last number of years. I have mentioned that since the year 2000, the number of pupils in integrated education has risen from 14,000 to 24,000. Uh, 65 schools are now integrated with more uh, on the way, and those conversations are happening. More schools are participating in shared schooling initiatives than ever before, uh, and it is clear that the social and cultural role of integrated education as a force for common good has never been more recognised uh, than it is today. And we should pay tribute to the sterling work of organisations advocating for change here, positive change, as well as the parents who have led the way in relation to this particular issue. The truth is that we have much, much more to do, and indeed this conversation is helpful. I know over the course of the last number of months with my work on the Education Committee that all parties have actively participated uh, in the scrutiny process. There have been times where I have uh, expressed concern. Uh, the sponsor has responded to that. I think I have drove the chair of the committee to early retirement in relation to it, uh, but certainly uh, there has been very healthy debate in relation to it. Mr Deputy Speaker, to truly build a new Ireland, we must build a shared future a shared home place for all of our people. We can no longer be focused or shackled by the visions of the past. And that is not to be said for our schools, because the work within our schools in the maintained and controlled sectors has been fantastic over the course of uh, the last number of decades. There has been huge divisions eroded by the positive engagement of schools uh, and the shared, uh, 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 the shared uh, plans that they, they, they have rolled out over recent times. I would absolutely uh, like to pay tribute to the excellent work of all the other sectors, and I have already stated 
that I am a product of the controlled sector. I am very proud of that. I have friends from all walks of life. Um, the, the, there will never be a person that will ever uh, put me under the sectarian banner because I do not look at life in that way. Uh, I appreciate people who they are, what they have to offer our society, and for the opportunities that are available in society for everybody. And th this, our job is about lifting everybody up together and uh, uh, providing those necessary equalities in our society. Of course, the work of advocating integrated education is by no means new to the SDLP. It was the SDLP that ensured that integrated education was enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement with the work of others as well. Uh, more uh, than 20 years ago, Mark Durkin Sr. Uh, served as the Finance Minister and backed our commitment to integrated education with financial support at that time. So th this is not new uh, for the SDLP. We have long uh, uh, sought uh, a greater integration uh, of our children in education and indeed of our society in terms of housing and in terms of uh, uh, life generally. It is also worth noting that, the integrated education, that integrated education alone is not the only method that we must uh, 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 employ to bring our communities together. I have touched on uh, uh, the others, for instance, a meaningful action on shared housing, which uh, would massively erode uh, those barriers of the past, uh, shared sporting events and shared social pursuits, for instance. And just to touch on the process, I have said that, it, uh, th there, there is uh, 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 questions to be raised over the process in this House of Scrutiny, because I found it very, very frustrating in going through the committee stages and not having sufficient time to properly scrutinise or evaluate uh, the, the legislation in itself. That is not the fault of the bill sponsor. It is actually the, the process that we are left to deal with and, and we have had to endure. Uh, and education, particularly in the times that we are in, particularly in the times that we are in, uh, uh, has many, many challenges with COVID and the, the issues in schools as well. Yes, I will give way to the Chair. Yeah. Thank the member uh, for giving way. He couldn't possibly consider subjecting me to him and the committee for more than a five-month stage of a committee stage, surely. It was worth a try. It was worth a try. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the, the committee has been extremely patient with the process, but we've also had uh, considerable hurdles and challenges to overcome and to look at as well uh, over the course of the last few months. So uh, uh, in terms of the process, that, that's, that's really where my frustrations have lay. Uh, in terms of the amendments and the clauses themselves, the, 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 the sponsor, uh, Ms Armstrong, uh, declared intention with Clause 1 uh, is to define integrated education and uh, integrated schools. Uh, in doing so, uh, Ms Armstrong uh, includes uh, the reasonable numbers of children of different cultures and religious beliefs and known. And indeed, she also includes references to different social economic circumstances and different abilities. Uh, she also goes on to determine the ethos of integrated schools by alluding to the terms diversity, respect and understanding. Without a doubt, it is desirable that we have definitions set out for us, uh, and, and I welcome the general approach uh, of the sponsor in relation to Clause 1. The references to social economic uh, deprivation, uh, and, and as you will see in my second amendment, uh, uh, different, ab different abilities have uh, been taken directly from the Shared Education Act 2016. And, and my first two amendments to the bill are more probing amendments to seek some clarification, and indeed the bill sponsor has had conversations with me and party colleagues uh, in relation uh, to that. Uh, in the the amendment, amendment 3, uh, as outlined, is a, is a probing amendment to remove Clause 11B because I really did not understand the rationale for, for having it. Uh, and that is not in any way uh, may be critical. It, it literally was seeking that certainty. Every school across every sector, even grammar schools, will claim they have pupils who come from various or different social economic backgrounds, albeit to differing degrees. So I really was seeking uh, clarification as to what the purpose of B was. And if the sponsor can uh, kindly provide that clarification, uh, then we, uh, if, if sufficient, we'd be happy to withdraw that amendment. Um, my, my amendment is by no means an attack on, on, on the notion, rather there is the intention of seeking uh, that necessary clarification. And again, the same can be said for amendment four. Um, uh, you know, to, to remove Clause 11C, because I didn't really understand the rationale for having that either. So those clarifications would be hugely helpful. And my fear really was that it had the potential to lead to some confusion in future without that clarification. For example, it is possible that uh, uh, the reference to different abilities could lead to confusion over whether children can be streamed or banded in classes in post-primary schools. 
you know, legal advice may, may suggest that such a challenge is possible, uh, and will it, for instance, give rise uh, to a fresh call for an end to academic selection within the bilateral integrated schools, or will it actually work the other way? So again, that's just a probing amendment to seek some clarification um, uh, from the member, and uh, I would appreciate that very much. Um, uh, amendment 5, uh, where, where, uh, the, the sponsor has uh, drafted, we, we are happier with the drafting of uh, that amendment, and indeed the Minister's amendment, we are actually happy with it. So we, we're going to spend a bit of time looking uh, and shortly between the two, uh, and, uh, and it's something probably that could be developed of a combination of them both into the uh, next stage of the bill. Um, you know, the proposed amendment, uh, 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 clause 1, page 1, line 12, so amendment 6, to replace the word improves with advances is also a better choice of word for the context. And again, the sponsor uh, and I have engaged on this. For example, a new school would have nothing to improve, but it could still advance. So that's the reason for that amendment. And what's more is the idea of improves could be seen in some contexts as a negative thing. Um, for example, in, in need of improvement because it is lacking in some way, or maybe whereas the word advance has no such nuances, rather it denotes taking the position forward in a positive way. So this is a positive, positive uh, uh, amendment in my uh, uh, view, uh, and I believe better reflects the position of very many integrated schools at this particular moment uh, in time. Um, clause uh, Amendment 7, we, we, we uh, have considered we, we cannot support uh, and uh, again, uh, Amendment 8. But Clause 2 uh, sets out the purposes of uh, integrated schools, and there are five purposes. The, the concern we've had here is that the purpose does not sit well alongside uh, the other purposes listed. Uh, and again, I suppose this is seeking some clarification. The other four are about the delivery of elements of the curriculum of the school. So teaching would be aiming to promote certain outcomes in pupils in keeping with these four purposes, academic, social, moral, etc., the efficient and effective use of resources, on the other hand, is a matter to be addressed at the uh, education system level. Uh, in, in terms of uh, our amendment to Clause 2, Amendment 9, uh, we are also proposing to remove this wording and substitute a phrase that will seek to promote human rights instead. And the sponsor, sponsor of the Bill, Ms Armstrong, sought clarification for this today uh, as well, and, and I do appreciate the conversation. This is perfectly in keeping with the other four purposes and will impact positively on the curriculum and pupil outcomes in a similar way to others. So it will therefore bring consistency to the entire clause uh, and the promotion of human rights is a highly desirable and noble thing and sits well beside all other purposes where listed especially equality and diversity. Diversity, It will also further enhance our desire to promote respect for identity and community cohesion and is perfectly in keeping with the ethos of integrated education. The, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is a, a, a very quick outline of our positioning and our rationale for some of the amendments. Some of them I have been open about that they are probing amendments, uh, and hopefully the sponsor will kindly uh, give us that necessary clarification. Uh, and uh, I, I, again, I, I thank you for uh, 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 the time to speak on this today. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and uh, I rise to support the. Uh, within Group 1 definitions and purpose, the amendments uh, of the Minister. Mm -hmm. Amendment 5, 24, 61, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, and indeed to oppose uh, the other uh, amendments. I think, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, you know, this, this, the subject of integrated education is. Uh, can be uh, an, an emotive uh, subject in Northern Ireland. And when you're concerned about the issue, and when you stand in the Assembly here and express those concerns, you will be, I was going to use the word rightly judged, but sometimes it's not rightly judged, but you will be judged by the opposition parties and indeed uh, the public. And no more so in whatever subject you're speaking uh, than it is to do with the education of our children and our young people. And especially when that education, uh, when you're talking about educating all our children together, an integrated education uh, system. And it is 
perhaps thought in the wider context and could be used in the wider context that if you are uh, speaking in op opposition to this bill, uh, indeed you are uh, intent on promoting educational apartheid, when indeed nothing could be further, nothing could be further uh, fr from the truth. And I speak uh, uh, as a parent, uh, my, my wife and I, who ensured that, 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 that our children actually did attend uh, a school that was truly integrated with a very long history of, of, of integration to ensure that they had the opportunity uh, to enrich their understanding of, of life in general, cultures in general, religions in general, uh, that, that is, and has, I believed, enriched uh, their quality of life overall. So I have firmly believed, and I know, uh, and my, my party colleague, Mrs. Dodds, has indicated that uh, her history uh, from attending a school uh, which was naturally um, integrated, and indeed that her children uh, followed suit with her. But I believe it is something that all of us want to see. I think all of us want to see um, uh, that we do indeed achieve uh, a, a education that all our children can be integrated and sit beside people from different cultures and different backgrounds, and I believe that enriches them. However, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is a private member's bill. It will not deliver, not deliver integrated education. It will not deliver a level playing field for all sectors of education. Now, I suppose uh, if we were to invent uh, an educational system, we certainly wouldn't invent the educational system that we have now. But we are where we are in the different sectors and the different bodies representing the sectors of education, and for them to do their job. And to some extent, to some extent, those who have been playing a role within either the controlled or the maintained sector could indeed rightly look at this and say, is no one taking account of the valuable work that we have been doing on the ground? Has no one been looking at the diversity uh, within our schools and measuring perhaps only one area of integrated ed education? I'll be happy to give way, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I thank the member for giving way. Um, we're in danger at, at, at the DUP being the only people that are perpetuating that narrative, to be honest. Um, and we have delivered a shared education act, which legally promotes shared education. So it, it's a myth to say that this assembly is not promoting, encouraging, and facilitating shared education cooperation between all sectors in Northern Ireland. And I, I don't. I'll be honest, I don't understand why that particular point kept, keeps being raised whenever it's not um, a, a point of the legislation. Uh, I thank the member for his intervention. and I do suggest to the member that he goes and speaks to the primary, uh, the principals of, of our schools uh, and has a chat with them about uh, how they feel about the work that they're doing. But I do, I do make, you make a point, and I wasn't going to say this, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but I spent some time, short time, in OFM, DFM, as it was then. And I was pleased with the work that we did around shared education. And I was an advocate of shared education and, 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 and how it was rolled out. And I'm pleased to say that coming to fruition now, and particularly around the Struhl campus, where we are, I think it was Mr. Sheehan who mentioned that indeed there are a number of schools coming together now in a very positive way to enjoy the one campus and indeed to enter into and enhance the shared education, where we are spending millions of pounds to enhance that campus for shared education. So I'm proud of the work that I did back then in, in, in OFM, DFM. Um, 
I've now lost my place. Uh, this is, I've made the point that this is a private member's bill and it will not deliver, as I perceive it, integrated ed education. Um, and this is not, and I'm not making any points about the integrated education sector per se. They do uh, a, a good job uh, and they do a job that uh, it has been allocated to them and they promote their sector uh, as, they, 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 as, as they feel uh, it appropriate to do. Um, uh, I made the point about... I, I think, Mr Speaker, I, I don't see that accepting or amending uh, Clause 1 would do anything other than give credibility to the other clauses. And as confirmed by those who gave evidence, um, lead to. And we are in danger of having an integrated act as it is proposed that will lead to a judicial review. And the PMB, this PMB, is not a suitable way of achieving the objectives of the bill's proposal. Rather, this type of legislation is more in the remit of the educational body. With all its drafting resources, knowledge and experience, its legal advice, and it is uncommon, it is uncommon to see, uh, to deal with an issue as complex as this, as a complex in educational reform through a private member's bill. I will give way. Thank you very much. Um, the independent review of integrated education was published in 2017 and the Department of Education had the opportunity to take forward the recommendations from that. Now, some were taken forward, but the majority weren't, and my bill deals with that. I'm not sure if the member is saying that there shouldn't be private members' bills, but surely if a minister, and we wrote to the minister, then minister, um, who said that they weren't taken forward those recommendations, um, what other way can we get that for the integrated education movement if the department's not taking that forward? Okay. I thank the member for her intervention and, and indeed um, she has men mentioned the independent review of education. The independent review of education, which was announced by Minister Weir, is the way, is the way to review our entire education system within Northern Ireland. And I recollect, I, I, I'm, I, I'm pretty certain that the member has not been shy on a number of occasions and telling us that it was her party who put the review of education into the new decade, new approach. That it was the Alliance Party who put the independent review into the new decade, new approach. And now the member it seemingly cannot wait for an impartial report but instead wishes to bring uh, uh, inequity, certainly as I perceive it, inequity into our educational system through what has been described as potentially a bad, bad law. In, in terms of what has been, I mean, the, 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 the Education Committee took advice, took advice and uh, it was, uh, legal advice, and it came to us uh, on the 16th of November. I quote only just a couple of, uh, of remarks from it. It is uncommon, the legal advice, it is uncommon, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to deal with an issue as complex as education reform within the limited support available for policy research and drafting PMBs as compared with government legislation. It is perhaps more likely that drafting inconsistencies between a PMB and a complex existing statutory framework will arise. Point number uh, also made by legal advice, in addition to the high level nature of this bill, it would appear to be a deliberate choice by the draft person. It may be that the draft person has chosen to deal in the bill only with key principles and has conferred on the department a wide order making power to address inconsistencies. Now, I don't believe that is the case. 
The legal advice also states, however, this framework bill, this framework bill approach in this case is not without legal risk. So it would seem to me that we are creating a situation where other bodies representing our educational uh, sectors are likely, are likely, and it has been mentioned, I think, uh, to the committee, are actually likely to come forward and request judicial reviews. That's the situation we are creating for ourselves if we pass this education bill, uh, integrated education bill in its present format, even with the amendments that the member and other members are indeed proposing. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. I call Harry Harvey. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It has been evident throughout this debate and previous education debates that there is a clear and collective support for the concept of educating our young people together. The concept is not in dispute. The process towards achieving the concept, however, is, particularly when it requires us to harm other sectors and to, to achieve its aim. We can all appreciate the importance of educating our children and young people in a shared and integrated environment, both in terms of societal benefit for the future and also in relation to their personal development as individuals. This Assembly has made that aspiration clear in the past, and indeed the Executive has already begun work to bring this to the fore through the ongoing NDNA Educational Review. That, as far as the DUP is concerned, is a proper process through which we can effect change in education moving forward. As it stands, the PMB before us, though succinct, represents possibly the greatest shift in education policy in many years. Should such a piece of legislation receive approval, it would very much beg the question as to the rationale behind the ongoing review. I think we would do well to avoid placing the cart before the horse in that respect. Co-education is, of course, something we all support and signed up to. The DUP's objection to this private member's bill, as introduced and amended, is that it clearly prioritises and elevates one sector above all others. This is simply unfair and unequitable. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I call Dolores Kelly. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and uh, like others, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate. I congratulate the sponsor and her team for getting uh, this far. And as my colleague uh, Danny McCrossan said, the SDLP has a long history of supporting educating our children together and indeed uh, in, in enabling people to live together. Uh, and it was to that end that our former minister, Margaret Ritchie, had introduced the concept of shared housing, one of which schemes in Banbridge and Peggy's Lona uh, is quite a success. Um, when I speak to parents, um, they tell me that uh, given that we now have much more, um, particularly amongst the private house developments, people living uh, live cheek by jowl together, much more integrated than, than before with mixed marriages and mixed partnerships, they tell me about how their children play out on the street together, but come Monday morning they have to go to different schools or they go to different schools. And I know as a parent myself, and, and now a grandparent, that parents will make the choice in terms of where to send their children to go to, to, go to school is they want to get the best educational outcome. Uh, and we all know the importance of education and lifting all of us and everyone out of poverty and in, enabling uh, opportunities to be more equal. And some of the clauses in the bill, of course, uh, talk about the socioeconomic and the equality and diversity, and that's to be, uh, to be welcomed. Um, the, the, the difficulty I have from the opposite benches in talking about waiting until uh, a, a review is completed, an independent review. Well, over the last 15 years, we've had numerous reviews of health, education, the academic selection, and I'm sure the shelves down in Stormont House and some of the departments are quite full of unimplemented uh, reviews and action plans. Uh, and, and that's a matter of regret. So therefore, I can understand the impatience from the bill sponsor uh, about uh, uh, entabling this as a private member's bill, because I think like many 
people in the chamber has little confidence in, in, in others uh, to bring it forward in any uh, meaningful way. So the SDLP is very much behind uh, bringing this bill forward. But I'd have to say, if anyone were to suggest, and, and I know others across the way have recognised uh, that uh, the control sector and the maintained sector, uh, as Mr Sheehan outlined, were not the cause of division or uh, 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 of sectarianism. I certainly wasn't taught uh, to be sectarian in any shape or form uh, through the educational system. And I went to, um, it was at that time, Our Lady of Mercy School in Lurgan in a post-primary basis. So, uh, so I think uh, parents will make the choice. We have to, all of schools have to up their game in providing the best opportunities, but we have to up to our game in terms of giving them the resources, both financial uh, uh, and support, in terms of uh, providing the best opportunity for all our children and young people. Uh, the integrated uh, sector has been at a disadvantage over years in terms of uh, funding formula. I think uh, that's well documented. It's certainly something that uh, the integrated sector uh, principles in my constituency tell me. Uh, and hopefully this would uh, and will enable a level playing field without doing harm uh, to the maintained or the controlled sectors. Uh, because uh, I will pupils you have to have to form an integrated school in the primary and the post-primary? <laughs> I think, uh, uh, as the member will know, uh, there are uh, a number of schools who sought to transform over the years and find a difficulty uh, to get the exact change. And, you know, having a principle or ideology of integrated education is much different than uh, practicalities driving you to uh, look into be integrated. Of course, I don't serve in the education. I'm sure uh, others are more informed and better informed than I am and given exact numbers. But I think uh, there's a uh, isn't there 40, 20, 20 or 30, some sort of formula? I'm not really sure what it is, or 60, 40. Justin, do you want to uh, answer that particular question? Will the member agree with me that the SDLP has always been at the forefront of creating a more integrated society? In relation to a school which intentionally promotes, protects and improves an ethos of diversity, respect and understanding between those of different cultures and religious beliefs and none between those of different socioeconomic backgrounds and between those of different abilities, that's my old school. That's the Abbey. That's the Sacred Heart in Uri, that's where ladies in Uri. So the control and the maintained sectors, and that's Uri High. Those schools do provide that level of integration now. So or, order, order members, could, could I ask members to address the front of the assembly so it, uh, they are picked up with their microphone yeah. and everyone can hear them? Can Corla. Um, so there are those great control and maintained, and Irish medium schools are there at present. So it's not a question of the black market model, the current education system. Thank you for his intervention, but I don't believe any speaker yet has actually sought to denigrate the work of the controlled or maintained sector and I'm quite sure when we hear from the sponsor of the bill that is very clearly not her intent. It's actually about looking to how we can legislate for a better integrated society and to move society forward in terms of some of those building blocks towards reconciliation. Uh, thank you Deputy Speaker. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I deliberately probably didn't put my name down because uh, initially just in that normal running order because I'm really interested in listening to what all of the members have to say and especially those that have uh, put amendments forward. Um, at the second stage when this came, came through, um, we had a really good debate and I was very clear as to, to the position of the Ulster Unionist Party with regard to this, this bill. Um, our, our position hasn't changed. We want a single education system. Is integrated education a single education system? No, it is not. It is another sector, in a sec uh, and the bill sponsor will accept that, that it's just another sector, along with the controlled sector, the maintained sector, the Irish medium, and so on. Um, and we made a commitment at that time that we would work uh, with the bill, we would consult with those that we needed to consult with, and we would listen uh, with both ears open um, to see what could be done with regard to this bill, because in its original form, we couldn't have supported it, and there were many clauses in there uh, which today we, we, we still couldn't support if they weren't amended. But given the amendments that have been put in by um, both the, the committee uh, and welcome uh, amendments by the department, indeed a recognition by the bill sponsor, and you can see that there is a move from the bill sponsor there to amend some of those concerns that were indeed raised, um, that will be done. I don't propose, Mr um, Deputy Speaker, to go through all of those because of a sheet here and it would take me 
uh, quite a while to detail all of the, the voting intentions of my party, but I think it is um, it's, it's worth reiterating the words from, from Dolores Kelly with regard to the other sectors. I think sometimes the debate in the public debate um, seems to be that uh, some people would seek to put the caveat that the integrated sector is seeing itself as above an elite, and I, that is definitely not the case. Um, because, again, as a product of a controlled school, a bit like Daniel, from different ends of, uh, of, of the country, um, the, the, the product's the same and the intent is the same. It's the education of our children. The methodology is, 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 is important here. Um, and with regard to the amendments, we will be supporting the amendments that we see that uh, allow the integrated sector to come onto a, 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 an even uh, platform. But there is, uh, there's, there's, there's one in particular uh, I'll ask the... the the bill sponsor maybe to respond to in her time, and that is one with regard to, I think it's clause five, and it talks about uh, not allowing the religious demographics or the uh, empty desks or the, the, the spaces to be considered with regard to establishing demand. And I don't know how you can actually do that if you're going to be fiscally responsible, because one of the other intents of the bill is to be fiscally responsible. We do know that the, the Department of Education is under extreme financial pressure. Uh, it's £2.4 billion pounds out of our block grant annually, and we know projecting forward over this next five years that the pressure is going to increase. Um, and if we look at the, the amount of money spent per head on our pupils, it doesn't augur well when we look at other jurisdictions. So um, I spoke to the, the bill sponsor about this earlier on, and I know she is aware of it, and I hope that when she addresses that issue later on um, that we will get um, to that. So, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Dustin Unionist Party will work... Uh, positively with this bill and the amendments to see a bill which is fair and just. I call Christopher Stulford. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, firstly, from the outset, um, I wish to say that, uh, much like Mr Butler, um, I do believe that ultimately the goal that we should all be facing or toward is the development of a single education system for all of our children in Northern Ireland. I fundamentally believe that our children should be educated together um, in an atmosphere that respects culture, tradition, identity, in which we can all celebrate who we are and grow together to create uh, a shared and peaceful society. Unfortunately, I don't think that, that, bill, that this bill that we're considering will help us to achieve that objective, because the content of this bill, the net consequence of it, will be to raise the status of one particular sector of education delivery in this country to the active detriment of other sectors. So members arguing in favour of it can seek to assuage their own consciences or their own constituents who choose to educate their children in the non-integrated sectors by saying, this isn't an implied criticism of the controlled sector or the Catholic maintained sector or any other sector. Well, the member can chunter from a sedentary position. The member once tried to tell this House that he was against academic selection but also pro grammar school. He'd look square in that circle. The member can chunter all he likes. The fact of the matter is that the consequence of this bill will be the con. Can I continue? Thank you. The consequence of this bill will be to elevate one sector over others in delivering the education of our children. I think the Minister has already outlined why this is preemptive and unnecessary. Devolution was restored in Northern Ireland um, two years ago now on the basis of New Decade, New Approach. New Decade, New Approach committed all of us to an independent review. Indeed, I believe I'm on the record of this House, and if I'm not, I'm about to put myself on the record of it, saying that I believe that in education we actually need to have a Bengoa-style review. Because if we, were to, if we were to sit down today from scratch and design an education system for Northern Ireland, we would not arrive at the position where we are today. There are historical reasons why we are in the position that we are today, and I do not intend to rehearse those arguments here. But all parties who signed up 
to new decade, new approach, agreed to, and I certainly it was my belief at the time, a Bengoa style review of how we deliver education. I find it inconceivable that such a review would not come forward with a recommendation. Yes, certainly. Member to uh, given way, but in terms of new decade, new approach, I think we also committed to a culture and identity act. Where has that gone? So we can't cherry pick, you know, what parts of the new decade, new approach we seek to support. I stand for the full implementation of all agreements, not piecemeal. The full implementation of all agreements, but let's not go down that route uh, here today. Um, indeed, the party of the person who is bringing this legislation before us have been vociferous in claiming the credit for ensuring that the independent review was included in that agreement that allowed the restoration of devolution. So having claimed the credit for an independent review, we now seek to preempt it. To preempt to preempt no, to preempt its outcome. And I think that that is mistaken. I think that we should allow that review to publish, or to run its course, and to take that as our starting point. I am opposed to this, the measures being outlined because I have said before, and I still believe, that it prioritises one specific sector above all others. And I suppose I can. Lots of people have talked about their own personal um, experience of their education. I was educated in Nettlefield Primary School uh, at the bottom of the Woodstock and Wellington College uh, in Belfast. Um, but, and I had a very good experience there. But I'm also a father, and my eldest child has just completed um, the transfer process. She's actively considering, and looking at school options, we're going through the, the, the various things actively considering an integrated school, because it's a good school. I refer to Lagan College. It's a good school that delivers good education. And I heard some criticism, uh, I can't remember who it was in the debate earlier, but some criticism was levelled in their direction because they operate a policy of um, academic streaming uh, in that school. But that's a different argument for a different day. One of the problems in terms of getting us to this point, one of the problems, it should be quite apparent, Mr. Little, that I have no intention of giving way to you. Take the hint, man. It is quite apparent that um, the consultation process leading to this point has been uh, fundamentally flawed. You can't have a consultation or some of the findings are six years out of date. That's not a proper consultation. And as per the committee consultation, that is equally flawed, as has been outlined earlier in the debate. Can I make some progress? And I will give way to the member. That is equally flawed, as has been outlined earlier in the debate, uh, by the member from Upper Ban, Mrs Dodds. You can't have a situation where legal advice lands with a committee on a Wednesday and a decision is required on the Thursday. The definition that has been produced by the Office of Legislative Council, I think, is a better one. It allows for the evolution and development of the term integrated at a practical level. It allows a modicum of control to rest with bodies such as uh, NICE. And I want to just draw members back to some of the comments that were made uh, at an earlier stage in debates on this legislation. Uh, I refer to the, the other member for Upper Band, Mr O'Dowd. In a previous debate, Mr O'Dowd said, that is another way for the integrated sector to move forward and develop, which begs the question, why is there a necessity for the bill? Why indeed? Does the bill give further advantage to the integrated sector over other sectors? I think that it does. I support the current status of encouraging and facilitating that sector 
on a different plateau from other sectors, and that may be detrimental to those sectors. Indeed, reading through the bill, Mr Storey, who I presume is my colleague from North Antrim, pointed out a few things, though I don't wish to agree with Mr Storey much more throughout the debate. So, Mr O'Dowd acknowledges the fundamental point that I made at the commencement of my remarks, that this bill does advantage one sector over another. I'm happy to go away to the member from Strangford. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to clarify that as part of the committee pack, I had provided a letter from the Speaker who I sought permission from um, and asked, did I need to carry out another consultation? Um, in 2019, whenever this House was back and we were coming together, and the Speaker clearly says that the consultation completed in 2016 was perfectly valid for this legislation. And I acknowledge that and would never deem to question a ruling from uh, Mr Speaker. The Office of Legislative Counsel has raised concerns about the bill as being introduced and what it would mean should it be enacted. They have expressed strong views about how that risk should be handled, including that the starting point in respect of some clauses should be amending what was introduced rather than rewriting it with a full view to obtaining support on the floor of this House. I regret that it has not been possible uh, to achieve that uh, full support. I conclude, sir, by saying that I support the amendments moved by the Minister. And I would warn and caution colleagues that whilst everyone wants, everyone I would imagine, or an awful lot of people, are anxious not to be seen to be opposing integration, it is not a contradiction to oppose this bill and say that you support integration in education. I support our children being educated together. I support us taking the time to follow through the process that we all agreed to a new decade, new approach, as a starting point for a positive new education system, one that serves all of our children, one that tackles the problem of empty desks, one that deals with the uh, compartmentalisation, if such a word exists, of our education into various sectors. Our children should be educated together. And we should encourage mutual understanding, respect and tolerance. This bill is not the route to go to achieve those worthy aims, which I believe all of us have in common. Thank you, sir. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I rise to address a range of the amendments in uh, Group 1. Uh, there's a lot that can be said. In relation to this bill, a lot was said at, at second stage, and I think all of us stand by the remarks that we made at, at that point. But it strikes me that, that if we are evaluating the benefit of the amendments that are put before us, as indeed the original text of the bill, there are probably two overriding considerations uh, that should guide the opinion that we take um, on the various amendments. Because that, I suppose, in terms of consideration, um, is what we are asked to, to look at today, along with, I think, uh, amendments which in various places uh, clearly express opposition to the full content of the particular clause as moved, I think, in a number of occasions by both the Minister and Mr Alistair. And I think the two considerations that, that should be overriding is to what extent does this address the strategic uh, position of education? Because I think that um, if we move simply in a piecemeal fashion, which does not address where we aim to be at, uh, from a wider context, then I think we do ourselves a level of disservice. That is why I think the right thing to do, in line with the commitments that were there in NDNA, which has been taken forward both by myself and the current minister, was the establishment of the um, independent review. Now, mention has been made, I think Mrs Kelly talked about uh, various reports which previously been gathering dust. I think one of the key differences with the independent review, and it has been drawn very widely in terms of its terms of reference, has been, unlike perhaps some other occasions where various reports were produced, which in terms of the, a previous minister was maybe one that was brought forward simply by the minister without reference to anyone else. This is an executive-led, an executive-approved uh, approach in terms of a fundamental review of, of education. And therefore, effectively, to preempt this by bringing forward um, 
legislation which deals with only one aspect of education uh, from a structural point of view, I think is a fundamental mistake, and I think we should be awaiting the full report. But perhaps the most overriding element as we consider these various amendments must be the extent to which they actually deliver on the basis of equality. Because in terms of our families, in terms of our schools, in terms above all else of our children, the key litmus test is what, to what extent is it treating all these on a fair and equitable basis. No child should be either advantaged or disadvantaged because of the school gates that that child goes through. And therefore, whether that child is going through the, the gates of um, a controlled school, a maintained school, an integrated school, an Irish medium school, a school which embraces academic selection or doesn't embrace academic selection, a school that is based on special education and needs and makes a specific provision for it, they should have a quality of treatment and indeed those schools should be treated equally. And I think that is one of the fundamental flaws of this bill, which uh, I think at the very least I think is, is the flaws have been highlighted very well by the, the, the Minister. And indeed I think in terms of the amendments that she has brought forward today, um, seeks at least to try and ameliorate that situation, doesn't entirely address it, but at least seeks to, to reduce uh, the, the problems that are created potentially by uh, elements of this bill. And similarly, I think that parents are entitled to make choices when it comes to their education. And we should not take a, a view uh, that says that one choice is naturally better than any other choice. That indeed, to choose, for instance, an integrated school is something that is virtuous or indeed brings benefit to that particular parent to make a different choice is one to be in some way a secondary, secondary nature. And I know that those who are supporting this bill and supporting some of the amendments have been at pains to point out how they really don't see this as any form of slight on the controlled or maintained sector. But yet, from that perspective, Clearly, if advantage is being given, and indeed a presumption, for instance, that is there within the bill, it clearly gives an indication of integrated education, those choices being some way more virtuous than other choices made um, by other parents. I think that is something that we fundamentally need to guard against, and we should look at any um, amendment through the prism of whether it actually delivers equality or uh, makes a, a distinction within that. Now, I think Mr. Butler in his remarks um, said about, I think, part of the objective, certainly of the Ulster Unionist Party, I think one that would be shared is that we have a level playing field within that. And obviously he made specific reference. I note, um, and I'm trying to say this not in too much of a criticism of the, the member, uh, that he talked a little bit about the generalities. He, he mentioned, I think, one specific area of the bill in terms of the, the situation of the reflection of demographics, but perhaps did not address others. I assume, therefore, if, the, for instance, the member is taking a view that says that equality and a levelling up should be, and, and I'll be happy to give way. Can I make these bits of what's out? All right, okay. Sorry, I, I thought I was about to get some information from the member, but obviously uh, not in, in, in connection with it. On that basis, which is part of the Group 1 amendments, uh, Clause 12 makes specific reference, and I know it's qualified elsewhere, that, any, that there will be a presumption for any new school to be an integrated school, and the building of any new school to be an integrated school. I wonder, therefore, on the basis of what the member has said, that presumably means that the amendment brought forward, I think, by both Mr Alliston and the Minister, in terms of opposition to, to Clause 12, which makes that presumption we can therefore take it that the Ulsterians will be voting against that bill. One is assuming that, his, that all the details of that have been, been read. Yes, I'll give way. Um, the member giving way. In a previous discussion, an earlier stage, Mr Butler said, like the party opposite, the Ulster Unionist Party will support this stage of the bill, but with serious health warnings. We do not support the bill in its current form. I do not think that any party here would. However, as I said to the sponsor, the intent is good, and with certain tweaks, it could be transformed into a useful bill. Could my friend identify to me what appropriate tweaks have been made since that earlier stage? 
I'm not quite sure if that was perhaps more directed at, at uh, Mr. Butler than it was at, at myself. I don't know if, if I, but I'm happy to give way to Mr. Butler if he wishes to clarify, both in terms of Clause 12 and where he feels there have been sufficient changes within this bill to, to change it from it being not acceptable in the format that it was there earlier to what is there. If, if the member is saying that he believes that the amendments brought forward by the minister are of benefit, then I think that, that would be of, of worthy. But again, I'm happy to give way. One assumes that silence perhaps suggests that he's not in a position necessarily to answer that question, but I'm happy to give way. Well, I, I'm happy to give way to Mr Butler, first of all, if, he's, if he wishes to. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you. Um, member from Strangford, Mr Mayor. There's 71, and perhaps to address uh, the South Belfast uh, MLA, first of all, there's 71 amendments, so those are, those are the tweaks that have been offered by different members, and, and we have done the democratic thing, so we have looked at them all, uh, some were for, some were against. But the reality is, as people will see, the Ulster Unionist Party are pupil-centric, we're education-centred, and we will, we, will, we will do what is fair by, by everyone. And we will also do all we can to protect the other sectors. So this is not about, and I said this, it was quite clear, this is not about elevating one sector above the other, but neither are we afraid uh, to ensure that all sectors are represented and given uh, a, a fair crack of the whip, to use a, a Northern Irish um, term. With regard to the, the amendments and particular clauses, um, th that will become apparent as we go through. Some of them, and I've been speaking to uh, one of the clerks about this, there are a number of am uh, amendments in there which actually can be taken together. Um, so if the, if the Minister chooses, for instance, to move 7A, if 7 is still there, they will both be there, and we still have final consideration stage. So there's still work to do in this bill between now and final consideration stage. So I think uh, we, we're not in for necessary too long tonight, but there's still work to be done on this. And, and, and listen, uh, we're, we're, we will try and do our best to ensure that the bill, that, uh, if there's a bill and the bill that goes through uh, has the, serves the intention that we believe it should. Thank you, for clarification as far as it went. I still have to say a little bit. I'll bring in. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to give way in a minute if I can. If I can just address a little, a one point first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to give way to uh, the sponsor of the, the bill. Yet I hear, um, in terms of what the, the member has said, uh, first of all, I, you know, the member should, is clearly aware that the fundamental principles that are there, both in terms of the second stage and indeed the, the opportunity for major change, lies at consideration stage, and further consideration stage is only a very minor level of tweaking beyond that. So if we are saying that, there's, that even with whatever passes today there is further work to be done, it does seem that the opportunity is, is fast running out. But I'm still a little bit confused in terms of the, the member has said, oh, there's 71 amendments plus presumably then those that are opposition to particular clauses, and it will then become clear what position the Ulster Unions are taking on, on some of these. It, it does seem, I have to say, that the Ulster Unions have uh, at least from what he said so far, has not actually addressed many of the amendments, which is surely what the consideration stage should be about. I'm really none the clearer as to which of the 71 amendments he'll be backing and which ones he won't, even those within, within Group 1. But the member has, has made his position clear. Uh, the member from, the member from Strangford wanted to come in. Strangford, Amendment 27 and Amendment 29. I brought Amendment 27 and the Minister and the Department have actually brought forward Amendment 29 on uh, the presumption on a new school would be an integrated school. The amendments, my ears were open, as I said, throughout the whole process, and there have been amendments brought forward. I have to say, it, I think I've just about broken the Bill's office trying to get through one that would be in scope, but Amendment 27 and 29 should hopefully address those concerns. Unfortunately, they, they don't entirely, because it is still makes reference. Because uh, Amendment 29, which I think is a, a good amendment by uh, my colleague, and indeed Amendment uh, 27 deals specifically, I think, with uh, are both sort of a, a new clause, but it, it still leaves untouched what is there in Clause 12. And Clause 12 says that there is a presumption of any new school, a presumption of any order, new school, order, 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 school. Order. I would remind members we are talking about Group 1 amendments. We are straying into other groups. So I would ask members to address the Group 1 amendments uh, in this debate. Yes. Sorry. Point of order. Surely Clause 12 is in Group 1? I, I was referring to Clause 27, I think it was referred to. Uh, so, so I would ask members to ensure that when they do make comment, that they, they do comment on the amendments that are in this particular group. I know members have raised clauses, amendments 27 and 29, which rightly are part of the thing. I was referring to opposition to clause 12, which is part of the 
and indeed the reference within Clause 12, which is specifically part of the, the Group 1 amendments I've tried to keep my remarks, and there will be other opportunities within the, the later stages to deal with that. Can I deal with a few of the amendments that have been uh, put in place? So there's a number of amendments in the Minister's name, which then, in terms of the definitional side of things, uh, which seek to correct, um, particularly emerging from Amendment 2 and indeed a number of others which are, are later within the, the group, on the effectively definition of what constitutes integrated education. And I suppose the distinction between that, and I know an alternative amendment has been put forward by the mover of the, of the legislation at, at Amendment 9, the fundamental difference there, which is one which I think the member also diverges from the SDLP uh, amendment, which would remove parts B and C of that, of that clause, um, is that integrated education is not simply defined by, um, in terms of the original text, and also will be there still remain within clause 9, is not simply on the basis of community background, if we can put it that way, and uh, religious denomination, but then seems to introduce two other elements which are not simply um, alternatives, but actually are conjunctive within that, which are to uh, put in place that it has to be a mixture from a socioeconomic background and also of different abilities. And obviously the member is perfectly entitled to do that. But then one can draw only two conclusions from those particular proposals for both of them. There are two alternatives. Either it establishes with, within each of those a high bar which will actually prevent schools from becoming integrated schools, um, or alternatively, they are effectively a, a meaningless test which, which doesn't actually mean anything. Let me, let me take you to those in turn. If we take on the basis of the socioeconomic background, and there has got to be a mixture of those from socioeconomic deprived backgrounds and those that, that are not. Now, it, it seems to me that, that in terms of a natural catchment area, most post-primary schools will draw from a a relatively wide geographical area, which sometimes will mean a mixture of socioeconomic backgrounds. But approximately um, of mainstream schools in Northern Ireland, approximately 80% of them will be in the primary sector. They are quite often very much drilled into their local community. Uh, they, in many cases, will draw from a very geographically specific area, which may well reflect uh, specific socio-demographic uh, provisions that indeed if you're in a very strongly working class area of for whatever community, it would tend to be either sort of something that is, um, uh, that can be very working class or middle class. Sorry, the microphone is, is, uh, has gone a little bit awry again on that basis. So either we are saying that within those communities, a primary school of that nature cannot ever really be considered uh, an integrated school, or alternatively, we take a view that this is something to which lip service is effectively to be, pray, uh, to be uh, given to, and effectively it becomes meaningless. Similarly, I think, with regard to different abilities, uh, because there can be those of us who are of very different backgrounds. You know, there are members in this chamber I can only aspire to the high levels of ability that they, they will produce. We are all of different abilities. So either this is something which is very exclusive in its nature, and the point has been raised, I think, by a number of members of where does this leave, for example, if we take a post-primary school, does, for example, a school which uses academic selection and bases its intake on, on academic selection, uh, is that therefore excluded potentially from being an integrated school? Or does it mean that, that we take a very general approach which simply says if there's any level of differences in terms of abilities, and there is not that question. Sorry, I thought, I thought the, the minister was looking to me to give way there. Um, or alternatively, it becomes utterly meaningless. And, and how also with these are they to be judged? Are we going to do an audit within each individual school of where the socioeconomic background is, or indeed the, the different levels of ability to be able to make a judgment on this? Now, it, it seems to me that, that either that means a very stringent test or a loose test. And either way, it renders the thing of ministry. Yes, I'll give way. I'm just very conscious that you're a very recent ex-minister of the department as well. So, do schools not already do those audits or know the socio-economic backgrounds 
of their pupils or their levels of ability already? Or would that be a new thing for schools to do? From the point of view of the ability, for example, if we were to judge at a primary school level, how are we to judge, for instance, those who are coming into P1? Does that mean do we have a, a handle on what the academic ability or indeed the different qualities of that? The point is that, that that can either be, as a definition, either looked at very narrowly or very widely. Either way, it makes it fairly meaningless from the point of view of definition. And it does strike to me that if the, if the principal aim of this is to have, broadly speaking, a cross-community uh, type embracing, and, and I would very much support the formula that's been suggested by the, the minister, which refers, I suppose, really to the, the main communities, but also then uh, takes account of those who have different religions or none on that basis as being the, the proper test of integration. It does strike me that, that, that the current formula, which is one that the, the member would not, who's proposing this bill, would not see adjusted, is introducing various elements of this, which render it either meaningless or indeed uh, may act inadvertently, and I'm sure it's not our intention, towards a level of, um, of actually making it very difficult for some schools to actually be counted as being integrated. Turning, I think, to the amendments dealing with Clause 2, um, again, there is a fundamental problem with, with, with Clause 2. No one could disagree with any of those elements of being an ethos of a school. But it has been pointed out, I think, by a number of schools from control, maintain sector, from Irish medium sector and others, where is the school in the, in the country that would not seek to embrace any of those values? And the inference is, by having them as a pure definition of what is theirs, integrated education, you know, there are members who can support every jot and tittle of this, this bill and can make arguments that they are not in any way making any form of disparaging remarks in relation to controlled or maintained schools. But by definition, it is uh, making the inference that this is something that is uniquely shared by integrated education and I think is in many ways deeply insulting to those uh, who lie outside the integrated sector. Again, how are all these things to be judged? Are we going to do some sort of ethos audit of each school so there's a barrier that can be done? I, I see the member possibly uh, nodding her head. So we have the ethos police coming in to um, inspect every school to make sure that it is suitably meeting those. Again, at what cost? And how are we to, to, to judge that element of things? And as I said, from that point of view, that if we look at those as, as aspirations, there's not a school in the country which I think wouldn't aspire to any of those. And again, therefore, we have something that is both superfluous, but also potentially um, insulting. I've mentioned in terms of the, the test of equality. And while I think there is on the issue of new build, there are other aspects which will be in later groups, so I, I will not transgress into describing those. Still, it leaves untouched at, at clause 12, the issue of a presumption that any new school will be integrated and indeed therefore from again parents making a choice do they see a level playing field if this is an issue of trying to make sure that there is a level playing field um, then no one has any objections to creating that level playing field but it's difficult to say I'll, I'll give away in a moment it is difficult to make any sort of a case to say there is a presumption for one particular sector and then say that there is a quality within that I'll give way to the has read through the amendments, but in Group 1, um, Amendment 69, the Committee Amendment um, removes that section. I know I already met with the Department and explained what I was supporting and not supporting in this bill, so there already is an amendment coming up on that. I, I note that within that, it's not one that the, the members put forward in connection with that, and perhaps the best way to deal with that directly, as has been indicated, I think, by Mr. Allister and others, is actually to say that, that, that Clause 12, because it creates that presumption, should actually in its entirety uh, be removed. It is also, from the point of view, as been mentioned in terms of Clause 6, the issue of the lack of definition in terms of bodies. It is natural that NICE, for instance, I think quite correctly, will fight to defend and fight for the corner of integrated education. In the same way, in the same way uh, yes, I'll give away in a second, in the same way CCMS will fight for the, the position of, of maintained schools. But we then seem to place a duty on all education bodies without a level of definition that they are to support uh, and promote uh, that. But I'll give way to the member. I'm grateful to the member for giving way because we just had a very telling admission. 
the, the member asked a direct question and got a direct answer about ethos in schools and ensuring that the ethos in schools is correct. Does the member agree with me that it is fundamentally unfair to suggest the children that are being educated outside of the integrated sector are being subjected to an ethos that is either unhelpful or unproductive or unhealthy, and it is an insult to the education professionals in those sectors who have devoted their entire professional careers to educating our children to suggest that the ethos in the schools that I have mentioned is in some way askew. It is, and again, as part of this, the, the golden thread that should be running through any, any strategy that we adopt towards, um, uh, towards education should be equality for all and ensuring that, that uh, the opportunities are there for all. I don't believe that, that this bill does that. I think that the amendments that have been put forward, uh, particularly by the Minister and also Mr Alistair, at least uh, claw back some of the, the unfair advantages that are potentially uh, within this. Mention has been made about the, the broader strategic direction, and I know that the, um, the member raised the issue of the previous uh, proposals put forward in terms of the um, audit done of the, the integrated sector, which I have to say in terms of, and again with perfectly entitled, was indeed through a couple of appointments from people within the integrated sector drawing up that, that report. I think that's a matter of, of fact within that. But it is also the case that a number of the measures have been put in place by the Department of Education. There are some which are either impractical or indeed in a couple of occasions were actually did not even find favour with the integrated sector itself, that, that nicely felt were not actually something that was appropriate to be put in, in place within that. And a number of others need to be dealt with strategically. That is why, in terms of very wide ranging terms of, of reference, they were put in to the independent um, review of education. That independent review, in terms of its, of its remit, was one that was endorsed at the executive by every single party. Every single party came to the conclusion that the right place to deal with those strategically was within the independent uh, review. This bill and many of the clauses which have been dealt with um, under, uh, under the first group of amendments simply undermine that position. And I think we would be a lot better uh, if indeed, first of all, accepting the amendments that have been put forward by the Minister uh, and others, but also actually dealing with the structural issues of, of education with that, uh, with that independent uh, review, or alternatively we would deliver something which gives sectoral advantage rather than equality for our children. I I'll give way briefly, yes. Thank the member for giving way. It, just for clarity, is, is the member suggesting that we conduct no educational reform or intervention prior to the reporting of the independent review, particularly when most of the provisions in the bill are based off the previous independent review of integrated education published four years ago, almost five? The point I'm making in relation to that, and it was perfectly entitled, that review that was put forward was not truly independent in that the, the two authors of it were people who have direct links in with, it was effectively a wish list on behalf of integrated education, and it produced some good stuff, it produced some stuff which was not um, as valuable. But the point is that we could put forward sectional changes which benefit or impact on one particular sector or another, but there's been a position taken across the board in NDNA by the executive, by both ministers in, in uh, in this mandate, that the best way of dealing with the, the very important structural changes which need to be examined within education is through the independent review. That is the route which actually we can have with a strategic decision and also in which we can hopefully then begin to cherish our children equally rather than what is being... What's oh, that? Well, I, look, I, I think the members had this opportunity to... to say, I, I'm making the point. But I think that is the better route to which we can do. We can at least try to ameliorate this bill today by accepting the amendments, particularly in the name of the, the Minister, and we can cherish our children equally, or we can create 
disadvantage for some and advantage for others, which I think that nobody in this house should be embracing. And so therefore, I think it is important that people do read and consider the amendments put in front of them and actually make those changes. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Jim Allister. Mr. Speaker, I'm not one given to quoting Mr. John O'Dowd, certainly not approvingly, <laughs> but um, at the risk of some reputational damage to him, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm going to uh, start by referencing some things, as Mr. Stalford has alluded to, that he said in the second stage debate, because I think they, ri they rang unusually true. And he said this, he said this, does the bill give further advantage to the integrated sector over other sectors? I think that it does, said Mr. O'Dowd. I support the current status of encouraging and facilitating that status, that sector, and I'm not arguing about giving advantage to it, but the bill goes too far. It sets the integrated sector on a different plateau from other sectors, and that may be detrimental to other sectors. And he went on to say that the significant advantage that was given to the integrated sector, uh, that this legislation has mission creep written all over it. And that, I think, is a fair summary of this bill. This is a bill designed and intended to elevate the integrated sector above all other sectors into a special status special provision territory. Well, I will, but I would have liked to... Well, yeah, carry on. Thank the member for giving way. The express purpose of the bill, in, in my reading, is to uh, identify, assess and meet demand for integrated education. In, in what way is that, in any way, unfair? Well, let's just deal with that issue of meeting demand for integrated education. There's not another sector where there's a statutory duty to meet the demand on applications to particular schools. Take the voluntary grammar schools. Many people are disappointed when they apply. And that's tough. But under this bill, and I confess, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm drifting somewhat, if I could find my glasses, uh, into um, Clause 5. But Clause 5 does expressly provide that there's a statutory duty to provide sufficient places in integrated schools to meet the demand for integrated education. Take what in a moment, take what that means. Take Lagan College, very successful school. Many people disappointed year after year about getting into Lagan College. The same in my own constituency, the Swemish College. What this bill would provide is that you can't be disappointed. You must provide the places. Now, what does that do for the financial equilibrium? What does that do for cost? And yet one of the things I think I commented on in the second stage was the total absence of the costing implications of this bill. There's a staggering financial cost implication, but in the name of giving that special status to integrated education that if you ask, you must get then it creates that phenomenal burden on the public service. Yes? Thank the member, member for giving way. Obviously, there is a, a further amendment that adjusts 
the, f the language from meet demand to aim to meet demand. It may not make a difference in his opinion, um, but just for point of reference. Well, I'm well aware of that amendment, that we're going to tinker with meet demand to aim to meet. But the, the direction of travel and the expectation created, and therefore the expectation that will be looked for, is that of meeting the demand. Now, what other sector, what other sector has been afforded that privilege? None. And yet that is the premise of this bill. Yes, Mr Stone. Well, to the member for giving way in a previous debate, Mr McNulty um, said, uh, as I said, there are issues that need to be worked out. And for my part, I will fight to ensure that the good work of the schools across my constituency and beyond is held up as examples of best practice. To that end, I echo what my party, party colleague, Daniel McCrossan, said. I do not believe that abandoning our faith-based schools in our Irish medium sector serves any of our young people. But isn't the practical outworking of this legislation precisely that? That is, and the intended outcome, that there will be a special status for integrated education, which I remind this House already has the statutory protection of encouraging and facilitation. It's already in the law. And now we're going to, to uh, craft onto that the additional privilege of this bill. And Clause 12, part of this group, uh, as Mr Weir pointed out, very vividly illustrates that uh, in regard to 12.3. The sponsor, I didn't actually hear her response to Mr. Weir because she was speaking away from me, but she certainly hasn't tabled an amendment to that. Uh, and 12.3 creates in law a rebuttable presumption that all new, that new schools should be integrated. And interesting, interestingly, that clause tells us that that's the purpose of Section 8 may not appear exactly on the face of Section 8, but that clearly is the purpose of Section 8. So we are in the realms of privilege building for one sector and one sector only, when you create a presumption that new schools should be integrated, as if it's a novelty. You know, I think of a school, uh, many controlled schools, think of one in my constituency, in Balmamina, Harryville Primary School. It has got 11 or 12 different nationalities within it, multiple languages. And yet we're told that doesn't count. Controlled sector doesn't count. And of course, the real purpose of this bill in putting integrated sector to the top of the pile is to push others to the bottom, particularly the controlled sector. And the sector that is going to pay the price of this legislation is the controlled sector. Above all, a sector whose body that represents it wasn't even consulted about this bill. Such was the disregard and the disinterest in what the controlled sector might have to say. This is a bill of privilege, a bill of supremacy. And that is why I opposed at second reading and continue to oppose this bill. Some of these amendments, the minister's amendments, will try to make something of the best of a bad job, but it's still a bad job as far as this bill is concerned. And I do say that I find it astounding that when the five parties of government trumpet a new approach, new decade, new approach, that the first party out of the traps to supersede, to override the new approach on education is the Alliance Party. 
because the new approach in education was meant to be this independent review. And here we have a bill wanting, as I expressed earlier, to gazump that. Yes? Th thank the member for giving way. We need to come back into the realm of reality and accuracy here. The bill gives effect to an recommendations from an independent review of integrated education that reported in 2017, almost five years ago. How, how is anybody gazumping anything or, to implement something that was reported on five years ago? Sir, if the member thinks so much of that independent review of five years ago, why was it that it was his party, we are told, that wrote into New Decade New Approach a new independent review? So, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, didn't we do well? We got it into New Decade New Approach. There's going to be a new independent review of integrated education. And then out of the other side of your mouth say, but we're not prepared to wait for that. We want to create our privilege first. We want supremacy first. So we're going to bring a bill that gazumps that. And that's what this bill is about, gazumping the independent review and particularly obtaining supremacy over the other sectors. And that's why it's an unworthy bill in all its parts and why I would urge this House, yes, make the best of it that you can with these amendments, but even when you've made the best of it, it will still not be a worthy bill. It will still be a tawdry attempt at supremacy, and one which is about elitism to, in the worst possible sense. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, if we are to move away from a society that is entrenched in division and sectarianism, then surely one of the key pillars in that endeavour is to do away with the outdated practice that teaches people in separate and divided schools based on religion or perceived religion. And this bill attempts to do this, and for that reason has my party's broad support, even if there are elements that we think could be tweaked or strengthened. I think some of the opposition to the bill is based on parties being happy to keep people apart and separate. If people are brought up together, if they are taught together, then what place will there be for division? and divisive parties with divisive agendas. I heard some comments today to say we're for integration, just not now. As the old adage says, if not now, then when? Mr Speaker, Amendment number two um, from the Minister proposes to remove some of the key parts of the bill by removing reference to socio-economic backgrounds in the criteria. And I'm not clear on the rationale uh, for that. I wasn't here for the full debate, so a bit of clarity on that would be uh, important. Amendment number nine removes the reference originally made to efficiency, which is a welcome uh, change and a welcome amendment. And this is where the bill sponsor and I probably diverge. We believe integration is a good thing because it brings people together and breaks down division, and because segregation in 2022 is not only <coughs> wrong but completely baffling and belongs in the history books. The amendment obviously doesn't make these points, but talks about the promotion and appreciation of human rights, which is very important. In my view, though, you can't use neoliberal arguments to justify integration. Rather than saying everybody should come together with less, we should be saying and ensuring people come together uh, for more uh, and for a better way forward and a better education system for all. A number of amendments and speakers, Mr. Speaker, already have referred to cultural diversity in education and the need for it in education and integrated education specifically. I think this is important, but it's got to work beyond to go beyond just integrated education, cementing the division that exists in this building or in wider society. British and Irish culture was referred to being taught in schools, and of course that already happens in most, if not all, uh, of these schools, as I understand it. But we have to recognise in teaching educating these traditions to not copper fasten or to re-emphasise division, but as a way to educate, inspire and question and encourage people to do so, and crucially to allow people to develop their own views about the world, not just internally to hear. Rarely do we hear about the efforts to focus on the commonality of history and day-to-day -day experience, rarely gets a mention uh, uh, generally, but especially in regards to conversations about education. And also the other traditions, as is referred to here and el elsewhere, shouldn't, uh, should be front and centre of integrated education, 
Uh, this cannot and shouldn't be a token thing, but something running right through the heart of these education systems and debates around it. So, uh, in conclusion, of, uh, I'll not run through how I'm voting, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, because we'll be here all night. But uh, I still don't know why, uh, in the debate today and generally about education, why religious organisations should and still have such a grip on our schools to this day. Mr. Speaker, I went to a Catholic grammar school. The teachers were excellent. Uh, I think I got a as I see it, a, a very good education, but it was down to their teaching um, rather than uh, the ethos uh, of the school. It was down to the, the, the work done by teachers. The ethos in the school, and any school should be about education, personal development, teamwork, skills, extracurricular sports, drama, etc., not uh, on showing young teenage boys videos about anti-abortion propaganda, amongst other things. So uh, I'll support uh, the motions uh, and the amendments as they come up, Mr Speaker, but I'll leave my comments there for now. Thank you. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And thank you for allowing me in. And I hope I will make short comments at this stage. Um, I just want to again remind the House. I mean, my own children attended a primary school where, at one point, up to 27 different languages were spoken. But it wasn't an integrated school. So there's a difference, okay, about the diversity of the demographics and the pupils and the setup of the school. And I'm just listening to the debate. I mean, we had the second stage debate on this bill a while back where we talked about the general principles in it. Um, and here we are again. So, I mean, a lot's been said about the independent review that was given under the new decade, new approach. And of course, that's very welcome. But as has been mentioned, it's going to be a very long time before we see that report, never mind to see any actions coming out of that report. Um, and I think that you know that was very rightly um, brought up by uh, Dolores Kelly when she was speaking to um, that how many reviews and strategies have we seen from all departments um, that still remain undelivered. So this is not an either or. It's not an independent review or this bill. And we need to be reminded that Lagan College, which has also been mentioned, is 40 years old this year. So the time to deliver is really up. Okay, we're sitting waiting for more reviews is not mutually exclusive to supporting the aims and objectives in this bill. And the discussions around this bill being open to challenge, I just don't see that as a rationale for not supporting legislation. Challenges are okay to have. It's just not okay to use it as a reason for not supporting bills if you want to see them coming forward. And I think that it's still shocking that in 2022 we still have to declare statements such as, of course, we want to educate our children together. It's 2022. Then let's just start doing it. And even the Bengoa review, as was mentioned by Christopher Stelford, if he wants to go as far as a full Bengoa review on education, I mean, do members in this House really need to be reminded that that review was brought forward what, 2015, 2016? Still undelivered. Still the sector is crying out for the delivery of what was an absolutely excellent review in their opinion. So if we don't want to support led legislation, if we all want to educate our children together, if we do want to move forward in society, but yet we don't want this bill, but yet we don't want to take the actions, yet we don't want to support people who are trying to move the issue forward. We just want to stall and have a review and have a review. There's nothing to stop other legislation coming forward. But 40 years since this sector started, it was parental-led, it was parental choice, it is oversubscribed. We all have integrated schools in our constituencies. I think that it's time that we all start moving forward and supporting the sector. I supported the principles at second stage, and I'll be supporting the member in all our efforts to make the amendments to this bill in this Group 1 amendment stage. And I thank her for all the work done to date on that as well. Thank you. And I call the sponsor of the bill, Kelly Armstrong, to respond to the debate. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, 
It's been an interesting conversation so far, but I will start off by saying something that may well surprise some people. Minister, there are a number of your amendments that I will be supporting. Um, I told your department um, when I met them recently that after I saw your amendments, there were some that I could take forward because it does answer some of the issues that have been brought out. Um, as many of you will know, um, during this process, after second stage, I engaged with a number of you, quite a number of times, um, to make sure that I understood exactly what the issues were with the bill and where I could, I would bring forward amendments myself. I knew of other amendments that would be coming in. so. As I said earlier, I was always happy that we made good legislation. So while others have made me out to be the big bad demon who's trying to destroy all different types of sectors, that is so far from the truth. I was brought up in the maintained sector education. I had a fantastic education. I have absolutely no problem with Catholic education, CCMS. I am very disappointed by some of the commentary I've heard coming out of that sector that has demonized myself. Um, I find that extremely disingenuous. As far as the controlled sector is concerned, a huge amount of integrated schools are in the controlled sector. So why would I be criticizing the controlled sector? And the reason why this group won general definitions and purpose, um, why I was bringing that forward and changing it was to make sure that we understood that the widening of the definition was to try to bring in um, children of all faiths and none. The independent review of integrated education re recommended widening of the definition. My consultation that others have criticized, but I can just say very clearly for this house, I asked the speaker if I needed to go out to have further consultation, and he said no, he was content with the consultation that had been completed. So if anybody wants to um, criticise me, well, you'd need to direct your um, comments to the Speaker's office who provided me with that guidance, and I have provided that letter in the committee pack to the committee members for the Education Committee. Also to say the Committee of Education's own consultation confirmed the need for a widening of the definition. What I will say is my bill does not try to remove the Christian base approach to education or to make integrated education secular in any way. And I know that will upset people like, for instance, the Humanist Society. But to be honest, that's outside of this bill. I only wanted to talk about integrated education. Yes, certainly. I, I am grateful to the member for giving way. Uh, Mr. Carroll referenced the Catholic grammar school education that he had. I went to, uh, as I said earlier, Wellington College. Can I say to the member, any person that thinks going to a school like that, which I went to, would inculcate you with a faith? That just was not my experience in a, in a grammar school, uh, a non-maintained grammar school. The idea that there was a faith ethos in the school. We had a scripture union, and if children wanted to go to the scripture union, they could go to the scripture union. But the idea that you were inculcated with a sense of faith by the teaching you got there, that's just not the case. It's not been my lived experience at all. Thank you very much. Um, the reason why I mentioned about the removing the Christian base from schools is because in Northern Ireland the legislation is that all schools have to have a Christian base. That, that's just the way it is. I did go to a maintained school. I have a very strong Catholic faith, and I got that, to be honest, from the, from the heavy amounts of masses I attended on a regular basis through that school and enjoyed it. But the updated definition as introduced includes children of all faiths and none. It continues to require reasonable numbers of both the main religious traditions and cultures, namely a reasonable number of Protestants and Catholics. The introduced definition also added socio-economic and different abilities to reflect how integrated education has developed into more than just educating children of Protestant and Catholic backgrounds, but provides an education setting where children of different abilities, economic background, with faith, no matter what that faith is, and those who do not have faith, are in class learning about each other and celebrated for who they are every day. Some will claim, and this may answer Mr. McCrossan's issues, that socio-economic and different abilities are in all schools. I'm sure they are, but I'm increasing the definition of integrated education beyond simply religious background and to reflect the reality of the place we live in today and the wealth of diversity celebrated in integrated schools. 
I will not be supporting the Minister's amendment to the definition, and while I am absolutely delighted, Minister, that you have moved to include all faiths and none in your definition, um, it is restrictive and not fully reflective of the makeup of children attending an integrated education school. We should be celebrating all aspects of our children, and that respecting and learning about their religion and cultural background is important and profound, but it should not stop there. That is why I ask the House to support my amendment um, to include the socio-economic and um, sorry, different abilities. Yes, certainly. In terms of the, the, the member says she is not supporting the Minister's amendment because she regards it being, as being restrictive. But the current wording, and indeed the wording reflected in Amendment 9, which keeps these, is conjunctive in its nature. It would require, because it is those and that, for all three of those aspects to be met for it to be counted as being an integrated school. So it means that a school, for instance, that, that meets the, the test of reasonable numbers of a mixture from a religious point of view, but doesn't meet one of the other two tests, cannot be counted as being integrated. And consequently, rather than being restricted, the Minister's amendment actually ensures that it is focused in on the community background, whereas the proposal put forward by the member in her amendment actually restricts because it reduces the number of schools which could be regarded as being integrated. It, it of itself is more restricted than what the Minister's amendment is. Much, but what I can say is, from every single integrated school that I have met and discussed this with, all of them can meet to the definition that I have put forward. They all have free school meals, children who do not have free school meals, they all have different abilities, whether that is academic, vocational, or special education needs. So I am absolutely confident that this does not cause any problems whatsoever for any integrated school now or in the future. Children being ed educated together should be educated to the best of their abilities not because of what their religious background just is. I am also content to support Daniel McCrossan's Amendment 6 as it adds to the definition that I have put forward. As I have said, I cannot support the Minister's amendments to the definition. I can absolutely support her Amendment 24, as this will strengthen the requirement of the Department to take account of its duty under Article 64.1 of the Education Reform Northern Ireland Order 1989. With respect to Amendment 9, I appreciate the thinking behind Mr McCrossan's amendment, who would not support learning about human rights. This already happens in integrated schools as part of their holistic approach to respecting all. I am happy to support, but note that it is strange that he removed um, a requirement to be efficient with resources. But I have accepted his argument on that, and I have met with him about that, and, and I will be happy to accept that amendment. Um, just to go to now with some of the things that were mentioned from the floor during the debate, um, I've already dealt with the minister, so there's an amendment I can't deal with, and then 24 that I can certainly go forward with. Um, the minister seems to think that I have some sort of an issue with the independent review of education, and as others have mentioned, Alliance was at the forefront ensuring that was put into new decade, new approach. But the minister did confirm that that report, that um, examination, will go on for 18 months. It is into the next mandate. I do not know who has the crystal ball, but I do not know if I can predict what a minister will do in the next mandate. And as others have said, plenty of reviews have happened over the years, and the review of education could sit on the shelf for a further year, two years, three years. I do not know. New decade, new approach falls at the next election. So there is no guarantee that it will be taken forward. I wish it was. I wish it would be, because the reason why I am bringing this legislation forward for integrated education is because, as Ms Bailey has said, 40 years have gone past and there have not been significant improvements on how we help integrated education in Northern Ireland. Integrated education, actually later in the bill, there is another amendment I am going to be supporting of yours, Minister, where you actually put and create um, what I think is meant by your amendment at that stage, a planning authority for integrated education, which is something absolutely that we need, because you have to remember that integrated education does not have a planning authority. Um, and you see officials shaking their heads in the box. Unfortunately, you do not get to speak in this debate. Um, the definition in integra of integrated schools is deliberately limited to stop the ongoing misuse of the term integrated schools. And one of the things that I have brought forward later in the bill 
is that the ETI can inspect ethos, because to be quite frank, myself and the movement are sick, sore and tired of hearing politicians ask the question, is that school really integrated? So we're asking for an inspection. We're prepared to do that extra work. Those schools are prepared to be measured. They already go through different um, aspects of work through NICE to prove their integration status. And we're saying, yeah, we're happy enough to be measured on that. Mr Little, Chris Little came forward with the committee amendments. Who am I to argue against the examiner of statutory rules? The committee amendments have not a problem um, with any of those coming forward. I know that Mrs Dodds had talked or had complained about the committee process. That's not something that I'm in control of. I cannot change that process. And again, if there's an issue with that, then that needs to be taken up with um, other people within this house. It's not something I can, I can help with on that matter. Mr Shane um, confirmed there's still much to do. He talked about continued segregation. New Decade, New Approaches had a single education system brought forward. And he wanted a new society rooted in peace. And I agree with him that integrated education is not a panacea. It is not going to fix Northern Ireland. It is not going to be the solution to ongoing peace, but is one of the tools that we can use to have a shared society. Society is different now and welcomes the, inclus the inclusion, uh, and he said he welcomed the inclusion of socio-economic backgrounds and different abilities, and I thank him for that. He was critical of integrated education, and to be honest, if we can't take criticism, then what can we do? I aim through Clause 10i, where the inspection regime could measure how well integrated education is actually being inclusive. And Mrs Dodds um, complained that this bill was about integrated education. I don't make any apologies for that. It is what it says on the tin. It is the integrated education bill. She said all schools are diverse. I don't have a fight with her on that matter. I believe that schools are taking forward a fantastic wealth of opportunities for our young people to understand who they are and who others are. Schools do share facilities. Schools do take part in the extended school regime. Mrs Dodds is correct, as was Mr Sheehan. This bill will not end segregation. But she spoke about the bill in generalities and not the amendments, really. She did challenge the Speaker, who provided confirmation that the consultation I completed as part of this bill was there to be used. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I listened to Mrs Dodds's contribution throughout. At no point did she challenge the Speaker or his authority. Members, comments have been noted and answered. Member to continue. Thank you. Um, I'll just confirm again. I did provide to the committee a copy of the letter from the Speaker's office confirming that no further consultation was required. Anybody who wants to deal with that, certainly would be welcome to take that through to the Speaker. Um, I'm just a little disappointed that there have been some of the commentators who had decided already um, what I was planning to do, and at consideration stage, instead of paying attention to the amendments, kept on going back to the original bill. We have amendments in front of us today. We should all be speaking to those amendments. Daniel McCrossan confirmed that he supported integrated education. He talked about the SDLP having support for integrated education. Um, but what I say is parents, some parents don't have a choice for integrated education for their child. Daniel did confirm, or Ms McCrossan did confirm, that this bill does not undo parental choice for anyone who chooses one of the four sectors that we have in Northern Ireland, and I agree with him. He also said it was not the silver bullet, but as part of the way forward. He talked about the increase in the number of children in integrated education, and the increase in the number of children taking part in shared education. All of this is welcomed. And what I would say to those who are saying that I'm trying to destroy or take away from any other sectors, who do you think takes part in shared education? Shared education is shared education between maintained, controlled, integrated and Irish medium schools. I thank the SDLP for, be, for being supportive and I have listened to their concerns and I have brought amendments forward. When I said to those who I spoke to that I would bring amendments and I would share them in advance of the deadline, I did that. He did ask for clarification needed for 11B and for 11C, and that's I've already dealt with with the socio-economic and um, the different abilities for him. 
My consultation supported the widening of the definition. 88% of the consultation completed by the Education Committee supported the widening, widening of the definition to include my clause B and C. I was very sad to hear when Mr Newton um, stood up that he would be accused of being an educational or being educational apartheid. That's not fair, to be honest. We are all allowed to support the sectors and the schools that we prefer. It happens to be that integrated education is the one that I like. I also have a good shine for CCMS because of the schooling that I went through, but that's not something I have control over, unfortunately, Mr Newton. Um, Mr Newton did say that a private member's bill was not going to change the system. No, it's not. The independent review of education will change the system, I hope. But in the meantime, and there is quite some time to go before that independent review of education even comes forward with the report, in the meantime, I have integrated education where there are children unable to secure a first preference place in a post-primary school. I have parents who are currently trying to set up mid-down integrated college because Lagan College is filled to Boston and they're actually bringing other schools together and more places, hopefully, to provide integrated options for um, children in that area. The only thing I am trying to do with this bill is to enable integrated education. He asked why other sectors were not asked how they were promoting diversity. Ask them, I'm sorry, I have to say, CCMS, CSSC, NICE, CNAG, they all talk about diversity. When I was up with CSSC, they do have boards, display boards within their, their offices that confirm about the integrated education, because we do have to remember that a significant number of integrated schools are controlled integrated schools. Many schools do promote diversity, but that's not part of this bill. I talk about integrated education in this bill. I can't talk about any other sector in my bill because it's outside of scope. The IE sector, you said that they did a good job, and thank you for that, because they do in some extraordinary circumstances. Alliance did put the independent review of education into new decade, new approach. Um, and you said that this bill should not progress because that review was happening. I don't agree with you. I started this process in 20, in fact, I started this process before I was even elected in 2016, but I started this formal process in 2016. I didn't preempt new decade, new approach, and the assembly collapsing for three years and having to have a new decade, new approach. This has been going on for years. And I'm sorry you think that I'm, tr I'm undermining new decade, new approach. But to be honest, I'm not going to leave integrated education where it is currently until we find out what that report might say. And believe me, I would, I've spoken to the panel and I have said to them I would love them to be as innovative as possible. Mr Newton raised the legal advice that had been provided to the committee. I don't have access to that legal advice. It's privileged, so I don't see that legal advice. Um, but the suggestion that the drafter was somehow not correct, um, I have to say that's something that I have to distance myself from. The drafts person was provided by the Bill Office from the independent panel of drafts people, professional people who are provided by the Bill's Office to private members, Bill um, sponsors who are taking their Bill through the assembly process. Um, and I have to say the drafts person that I had is an ex was an extremely professional drafter. Um, so the criticism between whatever the legal advice was provided by the committee or by the minister, you'll need to take that up with the bill's office. Because I will indeed. Except that no matter how clever, how skilled the drafts person is, the drafts person actually takes instructions from the proposer of the bill. The bill is put through the Speaker's legal team in order to ensure that it is appropriate before it comes to the House. So it has been through a process, and I did follow completely the Assembly's Bill's Office process. What I would say to Mr Newton is, just because something is uncommon doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. Yes, I am pushing the boundaries of the PMB. It is a complex piece of legislation, but hey, why not? I do believe that the legislation with some of the amendments brought forward will make for good legislation that will support the integrated education and integrated, educate, and integrated schools. 
Mr Harvey admitted that integrated education is not in, in dispute, but he said that integrated education was harming other sectors. Really? So by having parental preference, we are harming other sectors. By enabling people to choose the type of school that their child can go to, we're harming other sectors. Um, I find that quite difficult. Um, Mr Harvey seemed to uh, wish that no pro process to enable integrated education should be processed until after the in independent review of education. Um, somewhat short-sighted, but again I will say um, perhaps it's worthwhile. We are both in the Strangford constituency. Perhaps you would like to speak to the 200, 250 parents of pupils. Point of order. Point of order. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I beg pardon, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, could you direct the member that all comments should be referred through you rather than to individuals? Fair enough point, and I'm sure the member notes that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. So I'll say to you um, that perhaps members would like to go and speak to the 200 to 250 parents that have pupils turned away from being able to get an integrated place in my constituency. Um, Dolores Kelly raised the number of independent reviews that sit on shelves. She confirmed that SDLP is in support. Um, she said that controlled and maintained schools are not the cause of sectarianism. I agree. I think that um, our sectors take children in and try to teach them to the best of their abilities. They're not in the game of creating sectarianism. Um, but she did say that integrated education has been at a disadvantage. The funding formula she mentioned, I'm not going to go into that because I'm trying to move things forward for integrated education, and she hoped that, uh, that this bill would move that forward. Robbie Butler, thank you very much, recognised that integrated education is one of the four education sectors. He talked about educating our children as the key priority of education. Robbie asked about Clause 5 not considering empty desks, and if I could deal with that. Clause 5 talks about sufficient places in integrated schools. In my constituency, there are schools in all different sectors. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, where there are empty school desks and an IE school, an integrated education school, is oversubscribed, parents are encouraged to fill those other sectors' places first. Many parents cannot access the integrated school place because there simply just aren't any because there's another school down the road that has empty school places. So while we have four sectors, children who are being turned away from the integrated education sector are being asked to go into a sector that their parents don't want them to be in. I don't think that's fair. Anyway? I will indeed. The member also accept that, there, that the same issue, same issue also applies to other, all other uh, pupils. I'm dealing with a constituency matter at the moment where a child is moving between schools uh, and the schools that have been offered are actually um, uh, Catholic maintained, uh, controlled and actually an integrated college. Um, this, the preference is for the controlled school in this instance, but the preference is there and it's open to all. Uh, however, the, the, the perceived buyers are not there and it's, 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 it's just one of those issues that all of the sectors have to deal with as opposed to just the integrated sector. And I don't deal with all of the sectors in this bill. I'm only dealing with the integrated education sector and I don't think that if you have a system as we have now where parental preference is provided that you should say no you can't go to the school sector of your choice because there's another different type of sector down the road that has empty places. If we're going to allow parental preference then we have to allow parents to have that preference. So I would just say that that's why the clause 5 has um, not considering empty desks. Now, what I will say is, in my discussions with SDLP, they had concerns about the religious demographics of an area. Um, it may well be that at further consideration stage, I did say to Daniel, I would say this publicly within the chamber, that I am quite happy to work with him to look at that religious demographics piece um, at further consideration stage, if, if that would help. Mr Stalford um, said that this bill raised the status of one particular sector against other sectors, and he talked about we needed a Bengoa-style review of education. I absolutely agree with you, Mr Stalford, and through the chair, apologies. Um, I do believe that we do need a Bengoa-style review. Does the independent review of education deal with that Bengoa-style review? I wish it did. I hope it does, but we have yet to see what the outcome will be. I know that the panel has been talking to a lot of people. Um, and he mentioned about he supported children being educated together. 
Mr. Weir um, talked about the original um, sections of the, the bill without referring to the amendments. Um, and I confirmed that Amendment 69, Clause 12, page 6, line 22, leaves out subsection 3, which is the presumption that all new schools would be integrated schools. That's a committee amendment that has been brought forward that I'm completely in support of. He asked, does this address the strategic direction for education? Um, as much as I would love my bill to do that, um, because I believe that if we have a single education system, that it should be schools where all children can attend schools together, all under one roof. But I can only deal with the independent um, review of integrated education and this integrated education bill. I cannot write up the strategic direction, and that would be preempting what the independent review of education would be doing. NDNA is an executive led approach. I don't believe that this bill does preempt the report because that panel can bring forward recommendations for new legislation that may change any legislation that would be on the books. He talked generally about education and complained about the bill's timing. Well, that was outside of my scope, I have to say. I started it in 2016. I had to stop it for a period of time, as you'll all understand. There was three years when I couldn't progress it, and as soon as we came back, I brought it back again. And I have to say, there has been an extraordinary amount of work. The committee spent more months than you have to, you know, or well, you wanted to spend more months on it. Um, so I can't see how I could have done this any quicker. Um, it, this is one of the the highest up the list of private members' bills, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, that's coming to the House in, in this current mandate. I do believe that Mr Weir is not right. Parents' choices are not being met. They're not being met. Um, he was critical of the authors of the Independent Review of Integrated Education. I actually thought that, that maybe Mr Weir, in, in a former um, role within this House, um, actually had him... Had, brought those people in to do the independent review of integrated education. Mr Allister, um, he says that he understands what my intention is behind the bill, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that, because it is about integrated education. He talked about how many people are disappointed when they cannot get into a grammar school. Well, I can say the same back about integrated education. There's a significant number of parents across Northern Ireland who cannot get their children into integrated schools. Um, the Good Relations report confirms that one in five children in 2018, I think it's 2018-19, um, confirmed that it was one in five children could not get a post-primary place in an integrated school in Northern Ireland. Their first preferences weren't met. And just to confirm again, he'd said about the timing of the bill, I brought this forward in 2016 and it's lodged in the Speaker's office Is about that. Yes, Is there another sector anywhere in education where there's a statutory obligation to provide places on demand? Um, I don't know, Mr um, Alistair. Um, I would say that special education needs would be one of those areas where they need to be provided with places. I would say that the fact that children need to be educated in Northern Ireland means that they're provided with a, with a school place. Um, but I am asking that integrated education, there will be an assessment of need and that demand will be considered through a strategy and an action plan. And biennial reporting will come forward for that. Jerry Carroll talked about doing away with an outdated practice, and I know we don't agree on every aspect of the bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, but um, I'm very grateful for him engaging with that, because I'm sure it took up quite a lot of your time. Thank you very much. And Claire Bailey again highlighted the number of reviews have that, that have not gone anywhere. Um, she highlighted that opponents claim the bill should not go forward for fear of challenge. Well, to be honest, how do we know those challenges are going to happen until they do? There are plenty of challenges taken against different aspects of, of education. Um, and I'm very grateful for her, from her experience, for raising confirmation that 40 years after the independent or the integrated education sector started. Yes, certainly. Could I ask the member to expand on what she's just said to Mr. Carroll? Uh, Mr. Carroll, in his remarks, made it very clear and I absolutely uh, respect uh, his view uh, that he wishes to see an entirely secular education system. Um, that was certainly my interpretation, and I'm happy to. Yep. Okay. The member has just said that she wishes to engage with that argument. Just to be clear, the member's not in favour of a secular education system, is she? 
and that's why I'm not dealing with it in this bill, but there were other issues that Mr Carroll had mentioned about that I haven't spoke to him about, and I will speak to him after this section, if that's okay, Mr Deputy Speaker. Okay. Um, but Ms Bailey did raise confirmation that 40 years after the integrated education sector um, started up, people are still delaying. And what I would say to all of you today is, we're only on Group 1. It's going to be a long night, um, and possibly running quite long into tomorrow, but um, in Group 1, um, just to confirm, I am more than happy to support um, the Minister's Amendment 24. I, that new, the Department's new Clause 6 I have new, no issue with. It places a duty on the Department. I'm very grateful for that. Um, I do agree with the Minister's Amendment 70 and 71 on the definition of education bodies for this Act or this Bill. Hopefully it will become an Act. It certainly will help um, allay a lot of those fears where CCMS or any other um, educational body um, does not want to support or, or does not feel it's within their remit to support integrated education. I cannot support the Minister's, uh, minister's Amendment to Amendment 2 uh, because it removes the socio-economic deprivation and different abilities from the definition. I do ask that you support my Amendment 5, Mr McCrossan's Amendment 6 I'm happy to support. I can't support um, the Minister's Amendment 7. Um, that takes out the new definition of what an integrated school is. Um, I support Amendment 9, and um, I think for now I'll sit down and let um, the Minister wind up. <laughs> Thank you. And on that point, I call upon the Minister of Education to wind. Mr Deputy Speaker, as members of this House, we enjoy the great privilege of bringing forward legislation to improve the lives of people that we serve. As a member of this Legislative Assembly for the last 15 years, I have never taken this for granted. I know, and I am sure you will all agree, that with this privilege comes tremendous responsibility to ensure that the laws that we make are clear, unambiguous and coherent. Uh, any functioning democracy is underpinned by a strong, solid legislative process, and the amendments that I seek to move today are un underpinned by my desire as Education Minister to prevent a situation where our children and young people and their parents are failed as a result of law that is unclear. And I am genuine in my endeavours in respect of this. The amendments that I bring forward today have been drafted by the drafting experts in the Office of the Legislative Council, and it is in this drafting that represents this House's best means of achieving a coherent and workable piece of legislation. We have heard throughout this debate about the importance of the intentional nature of an integrated ed school ethos, and I have rehearsed already the ETI's view on school ethos and the importance of flexibility in ethos in mirroring mirroring societal changes. We do not need to restrict the ethos of any school or sector in legislation and tie them to this. The evolution of our schools of sanctuary are reflective of the importance of agility of ethos in any school. We have heard about the need to enable those who do not wish to designate as Protestant or Roman Catholic to see themselves reflected in the admission process of an integrated school. The amendments which OLC have drafted to Clause 1 provide for those of other religious beliefs and those of no religious belief to be able to designate as such when they apply to integrated schools. The Bill is introduced and, and the Bill sponsors amendments to Clause 1 retain wording and provisions that are simply unnecessary. The law is not the place for vagueness which can open the floodgates to legal challenge and, and leave our public to pay the costs as a consequence taking vital and scarce public resources away from our education system. The amendments OLC has drafted to Clause 6 clarify that the duties here relating to the wording of the Bill as introduced are for the Department of Education and not for other education bodies. This enables other bodies to deliver the statutory responsibilities they were established and are funded to deliver without placing a conflicting statutory requirement in relation to integrated education on them. Placing the Clause 6 duty on the Department ensures that integrated education support can be provided appropriately without such impact on those bodies and sectors. What we must achieve is legal clarity and, and a bill that works in its entirety and also aligns with existing legislation. And while we have expressed various points, perhaps through different lenses, on the Group 1 amendments, we must collectively and with integrity take seriously our duty to make good, workable legislation. 
A number of points were made that I've been asked to give clarification on, and obviously the Chair of the Education Committee asked how the Department currently establishes parental preference. And the Chair will be aware of the school admissions process. Preferences of parents are established through an analysis of the schools they apply to. And, and I have tabled an amendment, number 23, in relation to Clause 5A, which will form part of the discussion at Group 2 and, and be voted on after in the Group 3 debate. And, it introduces a duty to ascertain parental preference, and clearly, as the, as the, Clare has show, uh, the chair has shown interest, I trust that he will um, support this at the relevant time in the debate. But DE does not assess the need in any sector, but what it does do is facilitate and go through a process of, of area planning. And this process has all sectors included and allows proposals to come forward to change the educational landscape to reflect uh, parental preferences. There's also reference to the independent review of integrated education, again raised by the Chair. Um, as mentioned at the second stage debate, the 39 recommendations relating to the review of integrated education were not all accepted. Fresh start capital funding, for example, cannot be provided to special schools, a recommendation which was in the report. But in the three years from 2017 to 2020, where there was no functioning executive, the Department progressed operational recommendations. There are 16 recommendations which relate to significant policy and legislation that are being formally considered as part of the independent review of education. And obviously it's not lost on us. This was a request by the Alliance Party. Mr Alistair asked if this bill gazumps the, that review and in short, yes it does. We have enough substantive business obviously to discuss today without revisiting how the Department of Education could have taken forward such recommendations without ministerial approval. But in relation to discharging the existing duty to integrated education, the Department funds NICE to encourage and promote integrated education. It reviews policies and adopts them from them for integrated uh, and apps them for integrated education in relation to transport, temporary variation. Um, um, DPs um, only consider places in the integrated sector. And, and I suppose just to give um, the, the proposer of the bill some clarification in relation to that, if an integrated education school comes forward for um, a TV, a temporary variation, then other sectors are not taken into consideration when the application is considered. Only integrated education places are considered at that point. With regards to funding, there's support for transformed schools, and this can be ac accessed. And Fresh Start Capital um, Funding Programme is also well underway, which the integrated sector is benefiting from. Um, in regards to Mr Alistair, he raised the point with regards to area planning. All sectors are represented in the structures. This bill, if passed as published, will elevate one sector above the others. And therefore, there is an impact on the trust and also the collaborative arrangements which have been built up over the last number of years. Um, the area, planning, area plans, which are being published tomorrow, represent months of engagement between all the sectors. All have signed up to this strategic plan as the way forward um, to delivering a high quality system that will provide access to a, a broad, um, balanced curriculum in viable and sustainable skills. Um, the bill is introduced includes unnecessary levels of, of duplication with regards to um, consultation by all. So there are issues as a consequence of this um, moving forward. Um, the, we have obviously gone through quite a considerable amount of this um, already, um, and I don't want to rehearse too much of it. But obviously, the, um, the OLC's um, uh, Clauses which have been amended do give clarity that the duties here relating to the wording of the bill as introduced are obviously for the Department of Education and not for other bodies. It enables bodies to deliver the statutory responsibilities that they have been, um, established, that have been established and are funded for. Um, whenever we're considering how we vote, we need to be very careful um, as there are consequences in the way that we do vote. And as a consequence of that, we may end up restricting our options further on in respect of this bill, and I would urge caution with regards to that. Um, what I will say is that if we vote for an amendment, we need to be aware that we may remove that, that option later on. So we may not be reminded of that until we get to that later amendment, 
So we all have a series of vital choices to make throughout the consideration stage. And while I understand the parties have already indicated their intentions throughout this, I once again will say that in relation to Clause 1, I urge you to vote for Amendment 2. Vote for Amendment 7, which, does not vote, which means not voting for Amendments 5 or 6. Vote for Amendment 8 and the associated Amendments 61 to 68. In relation to Clause 6, vote for Amendment 24. In relation to Clause 12, vote for Amendment 69 tabled by the Chair of the Education Committee. In relation to Clause 13, vote for Amendments 70 and 71. And again, I will say our job today is to piece together a legislative jigsaw that slots together to make workable legislation. And let us rely on the drafting expertise of OLC to ensure that we deliver that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, the issue is now that amendment proposed to clause 1, page 1, line 4, to leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that amendment to be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. Just try it again. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Well, well, okay, members. Um, clearly, there is quite a substantial division in this, so we clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come to the chamber. Thank you. Uh, order. Would members please resume their seats?
Okay. Uh, before I put the question, members, please resume their seats. Um, before I put the question, I again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. However, the question is that amendment to be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Aye. Okay, members. Okay. Do we have tellers? Order. Um, tellers have been appointed as follows. Uh, tellers for the eyes are Christopher Stalford and Harry Harvey. Tellers for the nose are Chris Little and Paula Bradshaw. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that, as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I remind all members again of the requirement for social distancing where the division takes place and I ask you to ensure that you retain at least a two metre gap between yourself and other people, please, when moving around in the chamber or the rotunda and particularly in the lobbies. Please be patient at all times, observe the signage and follow the instructions of the lo lobby clerks. Clear the lobbies, the assembly will divide, eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Thanks. Secure the doors, please. Thank you.
Okay, members, please resume your seats. Um, and Clark, could I ask you to read the result, please? 85 members voted, 37 members voted aye, 48 members voted no. The amendment is negative. The amendment is negative. And could we unfasten the doors, please? Uh, members, I pray. Propose by, and I know this has been quite a long day already, so I propose by leave of the Assembly to, to spend the sitting until 7.25. The sitting is by leave suspended. Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. The sitting is formally resumed and we will now move to the issues around Amendment 3, which has already been debated. I call Daniel, Daniel McCrossan to formally move Amendment 3. Not moved. Not moved. Okay. So, where do we go next? Right, members, then uh, we move to amendment number four, which has already been debated. I call Mr. Daniel McCrossan to formally move amendment four. Not moved. Okay. Amendment five and six. Um, 
<coughs> Amendments 5 and 6, which have already been debated. Amendment 5 has already been debated. In the interest of clarity, this is the amendment sponsored by Kelly Armstrong and listed as Amendment 5 in the reissued Marshall list. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong to formally move Amendment 5. Moved. Okay. Uh, amendment proposed clause one, page one, clause 1, page 1, line 11, to leave out and insert words as printed on the marshalled list. As Amendment 6 is an amendment to Amendment 5, we need to dispose of Amendment 6 before returning to Amendment 5. Amendment 6 has already been debated. I call Daniel McCrossan to formally move Amendment 6. Moved. Okay. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 5 to leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 6 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. 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 Aye. No. 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 Okay. Okay. Members, um, I have been advised by the party whips in accordance with Standing Order 113.5b that there is agreement that we can dispense with three minutes and move directly to the divisions. So I now call for tellers. Do we have tellers, please?
Okay, members, tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Daniel McCrossan and Nicola Brogan. Tellers for the nose are Diane Dodds and Robert New- Robin Newton. Again, I remind members of the requirement for social distancing while the division takes place. Please ensure that you retain at least a two metre gap between yourself and other people when moving around the chamber or the rotunda and especially in the lobbies. So, clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide eyes to my right and nose to my left. Thank you. Secure the doors, please.
Order if members would please resume their seats. And uh, Clark, could I ask you to read the result, please? 86 members voted, 49 members voted aye, 37 members voted no. The amendment is carried. So the amendment is carried. We now return to amendment number five. The question is that amendment five, as amended, be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. Here we go. Okay. As there is substantial division on this one as well, um, I have been advised by party whips that, in accordance with Standing Order 113.5b, um, that there is agreement that we can dispense with the three minutes and move straight to the division. So I now call for tellers. Do we have tellers, please? Okay. Um, tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Stuart Dixon and Paula Bradshaw. Tellers, order members, order. Um, tellers for the eyes are Stuart Dixon and Paula Bradshaw. Tellers for the nose are Robin Newton and Harry Harvey. Again, I remind all members of the requirement for social distancing while the division takes place. Please ensure that you retain at least a two metre gap between yourself and other people when moving around the chamber or the rotunda, and especially the lobbies. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Secure the doors, please.
Okay, members. Okay, members. Clerk, read the result, please. 86 members voted. 49 members voted aye. 37 members voted no. The amendment is carried. Amendment is carried, members, and I, I move on now. Unfasten the doors, please. If you want. Okay, I will not call Amendment 7 as it is mutually exclusive with Amendments 1 and 5, one of which has been made. Amendment 8 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Education to move formally. Amendment 8. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 1, page 1, line 17, leave out words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 8 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The question is that Amendment 8 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The question will be put in three minutes. Do we have tellers?
Okay, members. Members, the tellers for the ayes are Diane Dodds and Harry Harvey. The tellers for the noes are Stuart Dixon and Paula Bradshaw. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Secure the doors, please.
Okay, members, resu please resume your seats, please. Okay, members, resume your seats, please. Okay, clerk, could please read the result? 86 members voted, 37 members voted aye, 49 members voted no. The amendment is negatived. The amendment is negative. Uh, unfasten the doors, please. Yeah. Is it as an amendment? Okay, members. The question is that Clause 1, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Country no. 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 Do we have tellers? Again, I've been advised by the party whips in accordance with standing order 1135B that there is agreement that we can dispense with the three minutes and move straight to the division. So I now call for tellers. Do we have tellers? Behave, 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 behave. Okay, members. Tellers for the eyes are Pat Catney and Daniel McCrossan. Tellers for the nose, Robin Newton and Harry Harvey. Clear lobbies. Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Mr. Kerr, doors, please.
Okay, members, resume your seats, please. Clerk, please read the result. 86 members voted. 49 members voted aye. 37 members voted no. The motion is carried. Motion is carried. Thank you. Amendment 9 has already been debated, and I call Daniel McCrossan to move formally Amendment 9. Move. Amendment proposed to Clause 2, Page 2, Line 4, leave out and insert as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 9 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can't we know? Do we have tellers? Been advised by the party whips in accordance with standing order at 113.5b that there is agreement that we can dispense with the three minutes and move straight to the division. So I now call for tellers. Do we have tellers? Okay, members. Order, members. Tellers for the eyes are Pat Cadney and Daniel McCrossan. Tellers for the noes, Diane Dodds and Harry Harvey. Clear lobbies, the Sammy will divide. Eyes to my right, noes to my left.
Secure the doors, please. Okay, members. Clerk, please read the result. 86 members voted. 
49 members voted aye, 37 members voted no. The motion is carried. Motion is carried. Thank you. The question is that Clause 2, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. Do we have tellers? I've been advised by the party whips in accordance with Standing Order 113.5b that there is agreement that we can dispense with the three minutes and move straight to the division. So I now call for tellers. Do we have tellers? Okay, members. Tellers for the aye. Tellers for the aye. Stuart Dixon and John Blair. Tellers for the noes. Robin Newton and Harry Harvey. Clear lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right. Noes to my left.
Okay. Secure doors, please.
Okay, members, order, members. Clerk, please read the result. 86 members voted, 49 members voted aye, 37 members voted no. The motion is carried. The motion is carried, members. The motion is carried. Thank you very much. The suspension of standing orders 10 brackets 2 to 10 brackets 4 this morning allows today's sitting to extend indefinitely. However, the business committee has agreed not to sit much beyond 9 o'clock and that any business not concluded on today's order paper would be considered at the start of tomorrow's sitting at 10.30. This would seem to be a convenient moment. I think you will all agree it was to adjourn. Uh, tomorrow's sitting will commence with consideration stage of the Integrated Education Bill at 10.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, and I propose to pick up the speaking list as it stands. And I made on the order paper the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound.